everyone. Good afternoon. I want to welcome you all and say thank you for joining us this evening, joining us whether you're in person in the Charlotte Chamber, Council Chambers, or if you're watching on Facebook Live or the city's um, TV channel. Um, we call this meeting to order. It is our April 17th zoning meeting, and I'd like to begin with introductions, and we'll start with our assistant city attorney. Terry Hagler-Grace, senior assistant city attorney. Good evening. I'm Victoria Watlington, your Charlotte City Council member representing District 3. Two, Braxton Winston, mayor pro tem. Vi Lyle, serving as mayor. Liz Babson, assistant city manager. Good evening, Renee Johnson, District 4. Good evening, Marjorie Molina, District 5. Billy Tons, deputy city clerk. All right, thank you. Um, the city council begins our meeting with an expression of inspiration followed by the Pledge of Allegiance. We do this to solemnize our proceedings so that we recognize that we represent you in a way that you can be proud of us. So we celebrate um, the, idea, the idea that we would have this um, moment together to start this meeting, and I'm going to ask Council Member Driggs to give us his remarks this evening. Good evening, everybody. Please join me. <laughs> Heavenly Father, help us to be better servants to our community, to work together to further the interests of everyone in the community, those who are unfortunate as well as those who have a better life. Help us to recognize that our foes deserve to be treated with respect and dignity, and that we must reconcile our differences of opinion in a manner that reflects well on the entire community we serve. Amen. Amen. If you feel that, if you would like to stand, please do so for our Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, everyone. So um, as we begin this meeting, I'd like to begin with an explanation of our zoning process. Our process begins with applications that are submitted to the planning staff, and you can see a number of our staff members sitting down close to where they're able to move up and address questions and issues. Um, there are two types of cases on our agenda. There are decisions as well as public hearings, and those decisions cases are where we've already held a public hearing, and there will be no further comments. So with decisions, we do not have sign up to speak towards the, um, that is time for the council to debate and make a decision. On our hearings, any of you that wish to speak is asked to um, sign up with the clerk. Um, we'd like to do that before the start of the hearing. Um, and then we have the staff do a presentation and they have the ability to um, work with us on what the staff's review of the petition of the request is. Um, we have a petitioner who gets three minutes to present the case unless there are opponents signed up to speak or if the staff has is in opposition to it. In that case, the petitioner gets 10 minutes and the opponent gets 10 minutes combined and the petitioner gets a two minute rebuttal. If no one is opposed or signed up to speak, the staff will give us a sh brief presentation. We will close the public hearing and move on to the next item. But let's talk about after we have these petitions, the petitions then go to the Zoning Committee of the Planning Commission for review and recommendation. And now I'd like to introduce Phil um, Gutsman, who is the chair of the Zoning Committee of our Planning Commission for the introductions of his team as well as remarks that are necessary for us taking the next step. Excellent. Thank you, Mayor, and thank you, Council. Hi, I'm Philip Gusman, Chairman of the Zoning Committee of the Planning Commission. Allow me to introduce my fellow committee members, Douglas Welton, Ronnie Harvey, Courtney Rhodes, Melissa Gaston, and Terry Lans Will Russell and Terry Lansdell. The Zoning Committee will meet Tuesday, May 2nd at 5.30 p.m. here at the Government Center, Conference Room 280. At that meeting, the committee will meet to discuss and make recommendations on the petitions that have hearings tonight. 
The public is welcome at that meeting, but it is not a continuation of this public hearing. That it, prior to that meeting, you're welcome to contact us and provide input. You can reach and find, you can reach all of us and find our contact information on each petition and information about each petition on the city's website at charlotteplanning.org. Thank you, Mayor. All right, thank you. They get the hard work to do. They give us recommendations that we will follow up as, as needed. So um, the other thing that I would like to recognize is that as people have filed petitions, there are often some changes that have to be made. And so we do have deferrals and withdrawals. And I'm going to ask Dave Patton to um, go through the deferrals and withdrawals and counsel to, at the end of his presentation of these petitions, to have a motion to approve those withdrawals and deferrals. All right. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, we've got several uh, decisions to be deferred. First is item number 12, 2021-209, Coastal Acquisition Entity, LLC. Uh, item number 13, Goldberg Companies, Inc. That's petition 2021-213. Item 14, 2022-078 by Siri Ventures, LLC. Item 15, 2022-084 by Mission Properties. Item 16, uh, 2022087 by Appaloosa Real Estate Partners. Item 17, 133 Paramount Development, LLC. Item 18, the F.A. Bartlett Tree Expert Company. That's 140 Item 19, uh, 198 by Nest Home Communities, LLC. Item 21, which is an uh, uh, addition just in the last uh, few minutes, that is item uh, 2022-091, uh, which is, I believe, by Tim Pratt and Copper Builders, LLC. And then we've got uh, item number 22, Steel Trojan Properties, LLC. That's petition 2022-134. And then the last decision we have a deferral request on is item 23, and that's petition 2022-152 by uh, Vinroy Reed. Again, all those are decisions requesting a deferral till May 15th. Uh, we do have five hearings that are requesting, or excuse me, four requesting deferral and one requesting a withdrawal. The first item 24, 2019-007 by Leblon Franchise Holdings, LLC. That's a withdrawal request. Item 25 is 2022-066 by Wood Partners. Item 26, 2022-119, Blackburn Communities, LLC. And item 27 is 2022-076 by Sam's Mart. And also item 28, 2022-092, also by Sam's Mart. Uh, all of those are hearings uh, requesting a deferral till May 15th, uh, with the exception of item 24, which is just a withdrawal of the petition entirely that's all we've got do I have a motion to um, accept the staff's list of deferrals and withdrawals so moved. Second. Second. we have a motion and a second is there any discussion hearing no discussion all in favor of the motion please raise your hand all right that passes unanimously all right, the next item that we have, we are going to begin with our decisions. And these, um, the City Council has adopted a consent agenda items for rezoning petition items number 3 through 11, which may be considered in one motion, except if there is an exception requested by a council member. So may I know, if, is there any exception to those that are between 3 and 11 from the council? Any exceptions? Hearing no exceptions, please note that these petitions meet the following criteria, that they had no public opposition to the petition at the hearing, that the zoning committee recommended approval, and that there were no changes after the zoning committee's recommendation, and staff as well recommends approval. So without having any separate vote, uh, may I have a motion to approve the following petitions to adopt the Zoning Committee Statement of Consistency for each of these petitions as they appear in our agenda as the Council's own. Petition number 2022-079 by Carter Acquisitions. Petition 2022-123 by Mungo Homes. Petition 2022-125 by Blue Hill Development. Petition 2022-137 by the Maintenance Team. Petition 2022-139 by Canvas Residential. Petition 2022-153 by Catalyst Investment. Petition 2022-155 by Mungo Homes. Petition 2022-158 by Fall Investments. Petition 2022-215 by Shorewood Development Group. Do we have a motion? To uh, approve all Second. Those. 
Do I, and we have a motion and a second on the floor to accept the consent agenda and the statement of consistency is our own. Is there any discussion? Madam Mayor, just point of clarification. Did, did you include 2022-070? Oh, okay, cool. No. No, no, it was not on our list. It's on the first okay. one. Wait, it was 79. Yeah, it that's a, looks like a typo on the, the screen. It should be 070. My apologies. Oh, I'm sorry. It was 79 on my Yeah, yeah, that's my okay. mistake. Thank you. So it's 170 with that correction to the motion. Everybody accepting that? The maker yes. and the motion and the second person? All right. So with that, any discussion? Okay. Hearing none, all in favor of the consent agenda, please raise your hands. All right, thank you everyone. The next item um, is that there are items that are coming with changes after the zoning committee recommendation and I am in to ask Mr. Patton to do this for item 20, which is petition 2022-086 by P. Dan Holdings for development of up to 19 attached family unit, residential units on a parcel of land currently developed with a single family home and a barn. It's nice to know we still have a place for cows in our city. <laughs> the petitioner um, has added some notes. I'll ask Mr. Petten to do that. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so 2022086 did have some changes just to clean up some of the site plan and outstanding issues uh, following the zoning committee meeting. Uh, they did modify the plan and they're just showing building envelopes rather than building footprints. Uh, they do identify a fire truck turnaround and hammerhead alternative. Uh, they did adjust the internal drive and class C buffer along the eastern property line added a note stating final building orientation and plan multifamily designation will determine setbacks associated uh, with the parcel through the land development review process and does remove references to duplexes and quadruplexes and just specifies them as attached uh, multifamily residential units. Staff didn't have any concerns with the changes. They do believe they are minor, uh, address the outstanding issues and does not warrant any additional review by the zoning committee. All right, do we have a m motion to not send this back to the zoning committee for further review? So moved. So moved. Second. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Hearing none, we will go ahead and have a vote. Miss, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm All in yes. favor of not sending it back to the zoning <laughs> committee, please raise your hand. All right, that, that passes. We will come back and do approval of the petition, but I just wanted to make sure we carried through all of the modifications that are necessary before we dive into all of our petitions. So with that, um, we now will go to our first. That's it, yeah. Item okay. 20, which is our first one. I think that's the only decision we have now after deferrals. The only one left. All one right, left. so with that, for this petition, um, Rezoning petition 2022-086 by P. Dan Holdings. Is there a motion to approve this petition, adopt the zoning committee's statement of consistency as our own? So moved. Second. We have a motion and a second. Is there any discussion? Hearing no discussion, all in favor, please raise your hand. All right, and that is unanimous. All right, the next items are deferred for the we are now going we have in. 21, too, right? That's, yep, that was it. It's deferred. Wait a minute, I'm, I thought 21 oh. was deferred. It was, yeah. Okay, yeah, it was, right, a, just, it was a last minute ad. Yeah, yeah. all right, thank you. Yep. All right, so the next item that we are going to will be our zoning hearings. And you've seen the deferrals, and if I believe, Mr. Patton? Yes, we've, we've addressed those. Our first one is item 30. Is 29. 29. 29. All right, we're going <laughs> to have a presentation. Um, are you going to do this at the beginning of your presentation? Yeah, I can, I can kind of give us an update so of where we are. Earlier, as we were reviewing this agenda, many of you know that we have adopted a UDO that requires a number of our, um, amendments with the text so that we can appropriately work through the issues that we're going to have as we continue to implement the UDO. So we're, at this time, Mr. Patton is going to address the um, text amendments to that were included in the document that each council member got or received. 
All right, thank you, Madam Mayor. So we do have four items uh, that are upcoming here, the next four items on the agenda. The first will be uh, a public hearing on the text amendment to the tree ordinance. Uh, Tim Porter uh, will give a presentation uh, on that item. And then we've got three text amendments related to the UDO, uh, items 30, 31, and 32. Uh, all of those are separate uh, rezoning petitions, uh, and uh, Laura Harmon and the UDO team will be uh, providing a presentation on each of those individually. So uh, we'll treat those as any rezoning hearing uh, and we'll turn it over to the folks that are going to be going forward with that. So Tim uh, will be the first down to talk about the tree ordinance and then yeah, and then we'll have the uh, Laura Harmon and the UDO team on items 31, 30, 31, and 32. Good evening, Madam Mayor, Council Members. Uh, very brief presentation on the proposed changes to the tree ordinance. They're very minor. Um, we're correcting some sequencing errors. We skipped uh, a letter in our order of um, outline. Uh, we also are adding language that clarifies the city's um, authority and intent to use any fine dollars collected during the enforcement of the tree ordinance. The tree ordinance no longer has development regulations in it. Um, all of the development regulations for tree canopy issues are now in the Unified Development Ordinance. Those are the changes that are proposed. That's, that's it. Ms. Watlington. I got a question in regards to this first proposed amendment where it says adds new requirements for collected civil penalties to only be used to further the purpose, intent, enforcement, spirit, and requirements of the Charlotte Tree Ordinance with regard to the use of collected funds. What exactly does that mean? What's true today and what will be true if this is approved? Um, there's no additional change. This language actually was in the tree ordinance. It was inadvertently removed at the time that it was amended with the UDO adoption. Um, it, it's, it simply states the city has the ability to, to use any fine dollars collected through the enforcement of the tree ordinance. Previously, for many years, um, general statutes, state law, um, prevented the use of this funding because there was a criminal component to the tree ordinance. Um, that changed in the summer of 2021 when um, General Statute 160D was revised. So now the city does have the ability to use this funding. We're proposing to add the language back into the tree ordinance. Um, so examples of how it could be used would be to um, print signage, let's say tree protection area that directly align with a tree protection requirement that we could provide to property owners or developers. Hopefully that answers your question. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? I'll make a motion to uh, close the public hearing. Second. Second. All in favor of that motion, <clears throat> raise your hand. Any opposed? Um, it's unanimous. We'll move on to item number 30. Um, uh, agenda item number 30. Um, is rezoning petition 2023-056 by the Charlotte Planning Design and Development um, Team, and it is a text amendment. Uh, the, this text amendment proposes to amend the Unified Development Ordinance for the use, landfill, land clearing, and insert debris, or LCID, by one, deleting it as a use permitted with prescribed conditions in all zoning districts except ML2, it modifies the use of the ML2 zoning district as a use requiring a conditional zoning that complies with the prescribed conditions. Three, it increases the distance between an operational portion of an LCID landfill to 50 feet from any property line. Four, it uh, adds a requirement that the actual fill area shall be located at least 300 feet from a neighbor, any neighborhood one or neighborhood two place type or an existing residential structure in, in any other place type. Five, it deletes, uh, deleting collector streets as a permitted primary vehicular access. Six, adding limited hours and days of operation for the use. Seven, adding a requirement for a uh, geomembrane liner and uh, leach leachate collection system subject to the state standards that is equal to or exceeds the state criteria for municipal solid waste landfill units and eight, adding a requirement that the use shall comply with the state groundwater well and surface water requirements for a municipal solid waste landfill and nine, deleting the requirement for a zoning permit for the use. Um, 
guess now you have three minutes. <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank all. you. As Dave mentioned, this is the first of three UDO text amendments we are presenting tonight for public hearing. We um, introduced these to council, TPD committee, and the planning commission previously, as well as um, talking with our UDO advisory group, particularly on this text amendment and the following one on commercial place types that I'll be presenting in a minute. Um, this one again is focused on land clearing and inert debris landfills, LCID landfills. These are a facility for land disposal of inert debris, land clearing debris, yard waste, untreated and unpainted wood. This is a use that we have found is rarely used, but we have had one in advance of the UDO proposed in the northwest part um, of the county, and we did hear a lot of concern, and I'm sure a number of council members heard a lot of concern about that facility, um, both its environmental and land use impacts. Um, and we, as this is currently allowed in all UDO districts with prescribed conditions, we saw the opportunity to go back and look at this uh, use again and where it is allowed and what the conditions are. So um, we worked on adjusting the allowances for this use and we worked closely uh, not only with other um, departmental staff but with city and Mecklenburg County solid waste in developing updated uh, standards. Recommendation is that these only be allowed in the manufacturing and logistics to ML2 zoning district. We think it's the most appropriate zoning district that there be a conditional rezoning required and approval by council through the conditional rezoning process. Before this use would be allowed, this allows the community to input on the appropriate location. And then we did modify prescribed conditions um, for the operational conditions, liner and leachate collection systems, compliance with state groundwater and surface water requirements for solid waste facilities. And we believe this strengthens the standards for uh, this type of use for better protection of the environment and the surrounding community. So staff is recommending approval uh, of this text amendment. We believe it's consistent with the 2040 comprehensive plan. Uh, we think the text amendment directly addresses community concerns we have heard about the environmental and land use impacts on LCIDs by limiting where these are allowed and it enhances the required environmental protection standards for LCID landfills. Thank you. Ms. Watlington. Right. Thank you. I've got two questions. Um, the first one is I want to make sure I understand what you're saying in regards to the conditional rezoning. Can you help me marry up this item number nine, deleting the requirement for a zoning permit for the use with the conditional uh, rezoning requirement? Certainly. So. Virtually any development requires a zoning permit or some type of zoning review, but this is above and beyond. You would not be able to put this use in without going through a conditional rezoning process and coming before council. A zoning permit, on the other hand, as long as you meet the requirements, the, the developer or the person submitting for the use meets the requirements, it will not come to council for review. So this covers both the council side and the administrative side. So the deletion of the requirement for a zoning permit for use yes, should not it, be construed as you don't need to take an action. No, uh, what, what, what that actually, the reason we took that out is because it will re require a full land development review. And so a zoning permit just for that use isn't necessary. So usually we're only doing zoning permits when it's a use that is not going to go through a land development review. But they accomplish the same thing and so we don't think we're losing anything with that. Okay, and so then a conditional rezoning is only required if you're actually trying to rezone the property in order to do this? No, actually, to have this use at all, okay, you would be required to have a conditional rezoning approval come before council for approval for this use. Right, right. Okay, got it. And then my second question is, I know that this is a change that would be effective after um, it's approved. Uh, have you seen the text amendments on our agenda tonight? <laughs> 
Okay, thanks. Okay. Excuse me. <clears throat> what does this mean for the neighbors in the northwest area of Charlotte right now? This does not change what can be done on that site because it's, because it's already come in under the current regulations. So it does not create a change for that, society, that site that's already proposed. And so is there any recourse for those um, communities at this point? My understanding is that they have met all of the local requirements. They have to meet state requirements as well. Okay. And so that's where, as far as I understand, where, where we are with that site. Thank you. Are there any other questions from council? All right, hearing none, um, we'll go to our last item. Motion to close the public hearing. It's done. So we have, I, I do want to note that we're closing the public hearing, but we did not have speakers signed up. But I understand, I think while I was out of the room, that the planning team talked about the opportunities that will go forward for continued review of the text amendments as recommended. Okay, with that, we have a motion to close the public hearing on items 30, 31, 32? Just, Just on 31? Just 30. Just 30. 30. 30. Oh, we're just on 30. I was hopeful, guys. I really was trying. <laughs> okay, so let's go to the next one. Item 31. Second. Adam, may I vote? Oh, I'm have sorry. Vote. We have to vote. All in favor of closing the public hearing, please raise your hand. <laughs> I don't have enough people. Yeah, yeah they're, they're stuck. Oh. They're stuck. There are yes. yeses and yeses. Okay, yes. All right, our next Adam item. Mayor? Yes. Uh, if you don't mind, I just briefly would like to welcome Mike Wilson and the members of the UNC Charlotte MBA class who are in attendance tonight. Welcome to you all. I gather you're taking a land use class, so I hope you will be enlightened by what you see tonight. <laughs> so those of you that are in class, please let us know who you are. Raise your hands again. Thank you. We think that university is one of the very best in this country, so we're grateful that you're attending. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Our next item is item 31, which is a text amendment on planning, design, and development text amendment. This text amendment amends the unified development ordinance to allow multifamily attached and multifamily stacked developments in the CG and CR zoning districts under certain conditions. All right. Who's going to lead us off on that? All right. Ms. Harvey. <laughs> um, a little bit of context before getting into the specifics of the text amendment uh, to remind you that we have 10 place types and zoning districts that go um, ideally go with those place types or align with those place types. So um, in this case, we are looking at the commercial place type um, or the, I'm sorry, the commercial zoning districts and where there's a misalignment and those are apply in places that are a center's place type. You go to the next slide. Um, the commercial uh, places, place types are more auto-oriented destinations for retail and so forth. And then we have a series of centers that are more walkable and have a greater mix of uses. We have neighborhood, community activity, and regional activity centers. And so there is a difference in those place types. And if we go to the next slide, explain why we have a little bit of a challenge. Um, we have CG, well, what's currently B1 and B2 zoning that will translate to CG zoning, which is the commercial zoning on June 1st. And a lot of that zoning is located in a center's place type. That zoning is much more auto-oriented, doesn't align with the goals of the center's place type in certain um, circumstances. The CG and CR zoning, for example, will allow drive-throughs, doesn't allow the mix of uses we'd like, including multifamily, and really the CG and CR zoning doesn't support the goals of our center's place types. Um, so we are proposing a text amendment that will help us in the meantime, we will eventually be coming back and aligning the zoning so that if you are in one of those centers, you probably will not in the long term after alignment zoning have the CG zoning districts, you'll go to one of the centers 
zoning districts. But in the near term, we thought some changes for CG zoning when you're in a center's place type were necessary. So for accessory drive-through, drive-through windows, this would be a use if you are in a center's place type and zoned CG or CR that you would be required to get a conditional zoning to be allowed to have this use and that if you were approved for conditional zoning, you would use the standards of neighborhood center. So again, that is making that use more aligned with the center's place type. Similarly, we would allow multifamily using the standards of neighborhood center if you have CG or CR zoning but are in a center's place type. Again, better aligning the uses and the standards with the uh, center's place types and the eventual, um, what we think will be the eventual zoning in those areas. And then drive-through establishments, which is where all transactions only occur by vehicle, would not be allowed in a CG or CR if in a center's place type. So we're trying to get ahead. This is really a stopgap until we can go back and align the zoning and probably make zoning changes that to, for the centers that would eliminate CG and CR and centers. But in the meantime, we think this is a way across the board to approach this, this challenge. Next slide. Um, so staff is recommending approval of this. We believe this is consistent with the 2040 comprehensive plan. Um, again, our rationale is some center's place type will have parcels that translate to the CG, general commercial zoning district. Um, those are really not aligned with the desired pedestrian environment and mix of uses. And so what this will do is either allow uses or disallow uses in a manner that would be aligned with the center's place type. That concludes my presentation. All right, are there questions, Ms. Watlington? Yes, forgive me, I'm trying to follow, but I would really benefit from a repeat of, or if you could give me an example of a place right now. Yes. Let me go backwards on the slides. So this is 7th Street, um, and you can see the CG zoning. This is in, in Elizabeth. This is a center, a neighborhood center place type. Walkable mix of uses is the vision that we have. The CG zoning, which is what some of the B1 and, well, what the B1 and B2, and particularly the site you can see here will translate to, is not going to give us a walkable mix of, of uses. We um, ideally, in this area, we would have NC, the neighborhood center zoning district. That is likely what we will propose when we come back to you all with alignments rezoning um, in the next couple of years. But in the meantime, we can make changes to the CG zoning district to ensure that what is developed is better aligned with the neighborhood center place type. And then can you go to that slide where you talked about what was allowed and what was not? Sure. Um, actually, is it, are you looking at this, the CG and CR? Or well, no, let me it was with the, the drive this one. Okay. okay, sure. So if you are in a center's place type, like what we saw on, um, Elizabeth Avenue or South Park, I'm sorry, not Elizabeth Avenue, 7th Street in Elizabeth or South Park, for example, um, Prosperity Village, those are center's place types. If you have CG zoning in those and you want to have a drive-through window, you will need to come through the rezoning process that comes in front of council to ask for a conditional rezoning. Okay. Um, right now, you cannot, in those zoning districts, have multifamily. Um, this change would allow multifamily to be developed in there, consistent with the intent of the center's place types. I gotcha. And then down here where I see drive-through establishment, I see this clutch would not be allowed, but would a not be allowed. would be. 
It would not be allowed if this change takes place if you're in a center's place type because it is a very auto-oriented use and center's place types are intended to be more walkable mix of uses. This just wouldn't fit into the vision for those areas. But a cookout, for instance, because you've got a walk-up window would be? Uh, a cookout, if it has a drive-through, it would still even, if it just had a walk-up window, would be allowed. If it had a drive-through in addition, then... Requires a conditional rezoning? Yes. Got it. Okay, thank you. Any other questions regarding item thir text amendment 31? I, I just want to... Can I... Yes, Ms. Ashmira. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Oh. First, I just want to highlight um, a significant change that is in this text amendment is the landfill sites would not be allowed near residential. Is that correct? It's a previous, it's a previous, ah. it's a previous one. That we've I'm done. sorry. There's a previous. Previous item. Previous item. Yeah, I just wanted to make sure that I'm... Are we talking specifically about just the drive-through, or can we go back to the one? We've already covered the first uh, Covered one. the yes. one with landfill near residential sites? Yes. Yeah, that was the first one presented. I'd be glad to talk about it further I think offline. the staff can meet with you. We can, it was well, I, uh, I had a meeting with Allison, and uh, really my concern was around where there was permit request filed for landfill site near the residential area. And I know there was a lot of opposition about that, but it looks like that was already grandfathered in, but moving forward, it will not be an issue. We'll, I just wanted to make sure that was... We'll, we'll get Tim to order. meet with you about that because he did the presentation on the first one. Yeah, so it's closed. if you would, if you would um, meet with Ms. Sashimira. Okay. Okay. Thank you. But other than that, I don't have specific questions on the drive throughs I understand. Um, okay. Yeah. All right, so um, do I have a motion to close the public hearing on item 31? So moved. Second. Any, uh, any discussion? Hearing none. All in favor of the closure of public hearing, please raise your hand. All right. Um, and now the last item that we have is text amendment 2023-058 by planning and design development. The text amendment proposes to make minor changes that will result in better functionality of the UDO prior to the effective date of June 1, 2023. There are proposed changes in most articles of the adopted UDO, and these changes include updated, lang updated language to provide greater clarity, new and updated graphics, language adjustments to provide better consistency with 160D updated terminology definition reference con 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 corrections and error corrections. And so with that, um, we'll go to item number 33, which is, um, Ms. Harmon, are you still, 32, are you still up? Yes, ma'am. Right, and I, thank I think you very that much. is a summary of the text amendment. This is something I, that we even talked about before the UDO was adopted. It is, um, I think without fail that any time a community has a new ordinance, there are simply things that you find after it's been adopted that need to be adjusted, corrected, um, revised. So we, have, we brought you a couple of bigger items. We'll be bringing you more in the future. Um, but we also had what we had considered a cleanup where we didn't, these are not major substantive items. and. Um, we are asking for your approval on this. Um, we believe it is consistent with the, the 2040 plan um, because we do not make substantive changes. We, um, uh, again, knew that we would be doing this based on all of um, we, what we've heard from other communities that had new ordinances, particularly those of the, the size and complexity of the UDO. And we do think that these proposed changes will make the UDO a more user-friendly ordinance and more functional. Um, you did get in your packet um, what may have looked like a whole new ordinance. The changes in there are additions are red underline and deletions are strike throughs in the UDO and um, we'd be glad to answer any questions now or as you review this, 
um, meet with anyone that's interested if you have any questions about any of the changes. Right. Any questions of, to, for Ms. Harmon? The public hearing. Do I have a motion to close and a, do I have a second? Second. Is there any discussion? Hearing no discussion. All in favor of closing the public hearing, please raise your hand. All right, so we will go, um, go on to the next item and go into our hearings. Our rezoning petition 2023-055 by the Charlotte Fire Department for approximately seven acres located on the east side of Dixie River Road, west of Garrison. It's in, it's closest to District 3 and it's in the County Commission ETJ. The current zoning is MUD, O Air, LLWCA, which means mixed-use development optional, the airport noise overlay, lower Lake Wiley critical area. The proposed zoning is mixed-use development optional, site plan amendment, airport noise overlay, lower Lake Wiley critical area. Staff recommends approval of this petition, and so Mr. Patton will go through um, their review. All right. Thank you, Madam Mayor. 2023-055. Uh, it's a piece of about six and a half acres. Uh, it was part of the original uh, River District rezoning done back in 2016. The site uh, is currently zoned mud uh, They are looking to do a site plan amendment to a, just a portion uh, of that just to affect this uh, particular spot, uh, just to give you some background. So the policy map does call for community activity center on this one. Uh, the reason for this uh, rezoning request is the 2016 River District approval had always envisioned uh, civic uses, fire station, other things. Uh, as the fire station began to move forward with getting into design and permitting for uh, their site, some of the standards that were intended for uh, the type of development uh, in the River District uh, just didn't quite match up with some of the needs and uh, items that the fire station would have to uh, have on their site in order to accommodate uh, uh, public parking, trucks, turnarounds, uh, things like that. So this proposal, if we can go to the next slide, is really just a modification of some notes. Uh, essentially, we're taking, uh, one more slide, please. Uh, we're taking the uh, notes for this and kind of superimposing them over the 2016 River District rezoning. So essentially, all the 2016 uh, 056 development standards will uh, continue to apply uh, to this parcel and all the parcels in River District, but we've added just four additional notes that give the fire station a little bit more flexibility to get through the permitting process so they can get the station uh, located and sited in this area to continue to uh, you know, be prepared to serve this uh, development as it, as it moves forward. So essentially there's four items and that's the modification of the setback uh, to a 50 foot uh, minimum and then a maximum of no more than 100 feet and that's from the future back of curb of Dixie River Road. Uh, also would eliminate the requirement for minimum ground floor activation. Uh, does modify the ground floor transparency requirements to a minimum of 10%. 6% of that can be uh, met through opaque glass. And then there's also an optional provision that would allow, if needed, public parking uh, between the building and the street. And again, all other standards uh, would apply to, from the 2016 056 original rezoning. But this is really kind of dialed in uh, based on some of the specifications that are needed, particularly for this project at this location. So that's the nature of the proposal. Uh, staff is supportive. Uh, we do recommend approval of the petition. It would be consistent with the policy map recommendation for a community activity center. Doesn't change the overall nature and intended outcomes of the River District, just allows this project to function within the River District with some standards that are better suited for it. So with that, we'll be happy to take any questions. I do believe we have uh, staff from uh, our fire station, fire department here, if they have any questions specifically for them, but happy to answer any you may have also. All right, thank you. We have no speakers signed up, so we'll open this for council discussion or questions. Any from the council? We'll close the public hearing. Second. Okay, if you have a motion to close the public hearing, here. any discussion? All in favor, say aye. Raise your aye. hand. All right, and so we'll now go to the next item, item 34. Petition 2022-037 by Suncap Property for approximately two Point, point two eight acres located on the northeast intersection of East Boulevard and Scott Avenue. It's in District 1. The current zoning is Neighborhood Services Pedestrian Overlay. The proposed zoning is Neighborhood Business Pedestrian Overlay. Staff recommends approval of this petition. We do have speakers signed up for this. Mr. Brown, will you organize the speakers for? And then Mr. Clason, Clayson, did I say that correctly? Clason. 
Klassen, thank you. Um, you will have 10 minutes to speak in opposition to the petition. So we'll go ahead and start with the staff presentation. All right, thank you. 2022-037, uh, it's just 0.28 acres. It's at the corner of Scott Ave and East Boulevard. Uh, it is currently zoned uh, neighborhood services, does have a pet overlay uh, with that. The proposed zoning is a conventional. Uh, it's B1 uh, with that pet overlay also maintained. Adopted place type uh, from the 2040 map does call for neighborhood center. I want to stay on this slide for just, just a moment. Uh, the parcels that are just kind of down from this between Scott Ave and Fountain View are also uh, zoned conventionally B1, which is the request for this particular parcel. On June 1st, we just talked a little bit about neighborhood centers uh, in our last uh, couple of uh, hearings when we were talking about text amendments. This actually, these parcels along uh, East Boulevard that are conventionally zoned B1, O2, uh, some other districts will translate on June 1st to the neighborhood center that, that we'd like to see out here. Uh, so we're not going to run into some of the challenges that we just went through with the text amendment. This was some of the conversation we had that kind of led up to some of that text amendment part, but not to get on too far down to that, but this petition would take this property to be one PED, which on June 1st, as I mentioned, would translate to the neighborhood center district, which this entire block uh, there between Scott Ave and Fountain View along that East Boulevard frontage will also translate to that neighborhood center district. So. This petition essentially is going to make that block a little bit more uniform as of June 1. Again, this will be a B1 PED should it be approved on June 1st. That will translate with all these other parcels to neighborhood center. So we'll have one unified zoning district to work under. Uh, and those properties can be developed by right uh, under that neighborhood center district, which is uh, an outcome that does align with the 2040 policy map. So. Uh, with this particular petition, as I mentioned, it is conventional, so we don't have any outstanding issues. We don't have a site plan to go through. Uh, staff does recommend approval of it. As I mentioned, it is consistent with that policy map recommendation for neighborhood center because, as I mentioned on June 1st, this will change over automatically to neighborhood center without the need for another rezoning. So everything will end up being in, in really good alignment uh, along that corridor, which is an outcome that I think is something that, as a staff, we want to see that plan implementation carried forward. So again, we do recommend approval. It is consistent. We'll take questions after petitioner's presentation and uh, presentation by members of the public. Thank you. All right, Mr. Brown. Good evening, Madam Mayor, uh, Council Member Zoning Committees. Uh, Colin Brown on behalf of the petitioner. Uh, Suncap, as Dave mentioned, this is a conventional petition, which is usually pretty simple, but th there's some background, so I'll bring you up to speed. Uh, this is essentially main, what I call Maine and Maine of Dilworth, uh, and the property we're talking about, uh, I call the Starbucks building. So if you know it, there's a small Starbucks, but uh, a majority of the site is a surface parking lot. Uh, so we have a surface parking lot kind of at the corner of Maine and Maine, of a, one of the most walkable areas of the city. There is the existing building. Um, Suncap has been working on this deal for over a year. Uh, Councilmember Anderson has, has, has kind of followed this as, as it evolved. And so the background, uh, as Dave mentioned, tonight we are only talking about this, you know, less than a quarter acre parcel that is the Starbucks. However, when we filed this rezoning petition, we were talking about a two acre assemblage, all of the properties that you see highlighted now. Uh, we filed that under the old ordinance. This is a look at that prior request. We had community engagement basically for over a year to talk about this development. There were a lot of concerns. You know, as we talk about, we were filing this under the old mud, as you know. We had some requests for height. There was some consternation of, oh, well, are we getting more height than we would have under the new ordinance? Is this consistent with where we want to be under the UDO? And as we worked through it, as we educated ourselves, you know, at that time, frankly, at the time we filed, the UDO was not adopted. Uh, after it became adopted, we looked at it and, and we basically figured out uh, that the SUNCAP team was happy or enable to develop uh, under the new ordinance. The, uh, zoning that will be applied by right, it's going to happen automatically on June 1, that works. That works for the rest of the site. So there was no longer any need for us to rezone uh, essentially the rest of the two acres. So we're not moving forward with that. That does leave the piece on the corner. The Starbucks parcel has an old z conditional zoning plan uh, that was put on it probably 20 years ago to allow it to have that kind of parking lot and that building. So therefore, the Starbucks parcel on June 1, nothing will happen and it can only be that little building in a surface parking lot. So we need that to go away. So now, the only purpose of our rezoning is to rezone away from the small building and 
and surface parking lot to the, um, to the B1, which will become neighborhood center. So this is the 2040 plan. It'll bring that little parcel into conformity with the 2040 plan and be consistent with the rest of the block. Uh, as Dave said, that is kind of the city's goal. I think if we did not, if Suncap were not doing this now, you'd probably have city staff doing this in a year or so to bring it into compliance. Uh, but we're doing that now. So this has been a major change. And I think, you know, if you're some folks in the community, essentially for a year, we were talking about a two acre rezoning and we were talking about all these details. And now we said, we're not moving forward with that we're going to default to the zoning that the city is providing. Um, I think a lot of conversation in the area has been about building height. Um, I think that might be what you hear about tonight. So in the NC district, essentially, which on June 1 will apply to that most of that East Boulevard frontage, uh, the base max height is 65 feet. If a petitioner earns bonuses, a building could go to 80 feet. Again, that's gonna happen automatically uh, on most of the East Boulevard corridor, this would be bringing this piece into that also. So the same standards would apply. <laughs> this is the uh, zoning alignment map. So this is what will happen automatically. You see all of this uh, purple, we'll get that zoning. You see the one little outlier being the Starbucks parcel. So this zoning again, will take it to B1 PED and then on June 1, it'll convert. Uh, so sorry for all that. Here is a list of the community coordination that uh, we've done. Again, spent a long time with the neighborhood really about the prior plan. And the entire point tonight is to essentially, this is that old conditional plan for the Starbucks again with mostly surface parking for that to go away. Thank you. Happy to take questions after the other speakers. Mr. Brown, I had one person that was not on my speaker's list. Nate Doodle. Uh, Nate, Nate is with Land Design and okay, happy to so ask. Okay, so we don't have to, all right. So. Um, is that the end of your remarks? Yes, ma'am. All right, thank you very much for that. All right, so now, um, Mr. Clayson. Thank you. Hi, my name is Gary Clayson. I live at uh, 1315 East Boulevard. I'm president of our 1315 East Condo Association. And I'm here because uh, we do oppose the 80 foot height of the parcel at the northeast corner of East Boulevard and Scott. The owners of our resident, the owners and residents of our 142 condos are not against planned reasonable growth. Um, we've consistently been on record during Suncap's public hearings, even with a board resolution, asking for a building height consistent with our 60 foot height along East Boulevard. We asked and still haven't received any kind of commitment to that. At Suncap's first public hearing, they talked about how important it was to be a good neighbor. We don't feel this is a good a way to be a good neighbor. An 80 foot height on this and any future parcels, and there could be future parcels, is inconsistent with the character of our distinctive neighborhood. Um, the, one of the pictures that you saw of a building across the street um, is our building across the street from the Suncap site. I understand that not, it's not just 80 feet, Suncap could also add another five feet as a parapet. So at 85 feet, the structure that would go there would be 40% higher than our building right there on East Boulevard. And again, this is just the first building. So we really have two major concerns. One is about trends and the other is about traffic. An 80 foot height for this one building sets a trend for all future parcels leading to increased density, significant congestion, and potentially lower property values. We don't want this to automatically happen all along East Boulevard. Regarding traffic, uh, Scott Avenue at East Boulevard is already a parking lot in the morning rush hour. Kenilworth is much, much worse in the evening, uh, all the way backing up close to Moorhead. Adding large numbers of residents, businesses, and their customers are gonna make things even worse. Uh, simply put, big buildings need a big street, and East Boulevard is not a big street. We're not Moorhead. South Boulevard or Tryon. Our residents deserve the same level of attention 
as the new residential parcel that's down the street from us on East Boulevard in Euclid. That fits really nicely in that neighborhood. Uh, at 65 feet, Suncap could still fulfill its promise of being a good neighbor. They could still offer electric vehicle charging. They could, they could meet green building standards and they'd also meet several of the 2040 comprehensive plan goals that are, not, are included in your materials. So if you think you're in favor of this proposal, we, we ask you to go stop and go look at that huge eight-story building apartment at the corner of Kenilworth and Moorhead and transplant that into our area. Um, because that's why we ask how in good conscience can you approve an 80-foot high building in our neighborhood. Um, for reasons of density, future trends, neighborhood character, and traffic congestion, we would like you to limit Suncap's building height to 65 feet in this area. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Clausen. Um, Mr. Brown, you have two minute rebuttal. Um, you know, just to reiterate, um, the city has adopted um, the UDO. The zoning that will go in place for the corridor will allow that 80 feet of height. Suncap, um, you know, we did have a conditional rezoning that was asking for some things over and above, had some buildings in some different places. And so uh, I think the Suncap team is, it ha it has been a good neighbor, essentially uh, removing every request uh, to go beyond the ordinance or anything over and above, and is simply bringing this outlier parcel that can only be a surface parking lot into the zoning that will be shared by the rest of that corridor, uh, which is uh, the city's plan for that and the zoning that will be implemented on June 1. All right. Thank you very much. Um, we will begin discussion or questions from council. Ms. Anderson. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, and Colin, thank you for the work that has been done on this and the engagement in the community. Um, there has been lots of conversation feedback from the DCA and other residents um, within Dilworth. So I'm glad that we have that two-way communication going. Mr. Klassen does bring up a, a really good point um, as that's a recurring theme that we've been talking about. And um, Colin, I'm not sure if you can pull up that slide that you had that showed all of the balance of East Boulevard turning to pink, which is the neighborhood, or maybe, Dave, you had that? Sorry. We're, we're gonna get to the petitioner presentation no, in just a second. No worries. But this is um, an issue, as, as was just mentioned, um, along East Boulevard and the Dilworth corridor with traffic being a major, major impediment now. And if you see where that star is in all of the buildings that are effectively um, to the right of that will be classified as um, NC. Many of those buildings today are single family homes that are used as office buildings and they've been, um, they've been zoned that way. But very small one, two, possibly three story buildings along this corridor here. And with the change in the UDO, um, with that base height of 65 um, feet, it's gonna add a tremendous amount of congestion to a street that can't really flex out or fan out very well. So the, the traffic, uh, the issue with traffic and adding density, not only to this particular um, site, but just along this corridor will will be a major a major challenge that we'll have to address and hopefully get out in front of um, because that will bring a significant amount of trips to this area. So yeah. I just want to keep that top of mind for us as we think about this pivot and transition to the UDO. Colin, I think that you know, as we're both, we're all learning about the UDO and so realizing that this, um, not rezoning it to a mud O um, was the right way to go. Um, so I, I do believe that this should be aligned with the balance of this parcel here. However, I just want us to think about the density on a go forward basis. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you. Ms. Ashmira. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I, I share 
some of the concerns that Ms. Anderson raised around density and traffic. Uh, in terms of the height, can you go back to the slide where you had height comparison, where there was a bonus uh, height? And this is, um, again, this is the district, the NC district, uh, which will apply for most of that corridor and a lot of our centers. Um, this is from the ordinance. So, and again, this will apply to Suncap and the other uh, properties on the street. The base max height is 65 feet. Uh, bonuses can be earned to go to 80 feet. Those can be things like um, affordable housing, additional open space. Uh, Suncap, we're, we're kind of reworking things now as we've dropped the rezoning. We, you know, some, some parcels are no longer involved. So they're working through that. Uh, we don't know what their building height will be. It'll obviously uh, be consistent with uh, the UDO, NC district, and the rest of the block. So what bonus option? I know there are multiple options as to uh, housing or green space. What bonus option is that uh, being considered here? Uh, probably all, all of them. Um, I think they, I, we're still in design, so it's unknown, frankly, how many bonus points you'd need because they don't know what height they're getting to. Um, but uh, all of them are on the table. Okay. Well, I, <laughs> um, I, I share concerns that's been raised by Mr. Klassen around, uh, can we get a, can we get a slide where it shows how does this structure will look compared to the neighboring sites? Do we have that? Um, I don't know. You can see there, um, I think this is Mr. Klassen's building and uh, a portion, and I don't know how these interrelate, but a portion of that building I believe is taller than ours would be. Um, the, the real discussion has been the corner, um, and I think they're closer, maybe he said, to 65 feet. The back of that structure do, does uh, go up higher, probably higher than the sun cap structure would be. Okay, so I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not following you here with the height here. So where, you, where I see blue arrow is, that's the site. Where is 80 feet, uh, is that that brick building in the corner, is that, is that 80 feet we are talking about? Um, I, I don't know for sure. Uh, this is the existing building where Mr. Klassen lives. That's is that? I, we this, can't hear you, Ms. Klassen. He said uh, that's 65 feet. Yeah, I appreciate him giving me the answer. Okay. Uh, he says their current building on the corner is 65 feet, uh, or sorry, 60 feet, and then the, re the rear of that structure does step up uh, to about 80 feet. Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I just don't know how that fits into this site right here, uh, where you got sites nearby that are much lower in terms of height. Um, well, and, and this site right next to it, is that residential condos? Yeah. So, so that you know, this corner here that is empty is zoned for 85 feet of height, and everything else going down the East Boulevard corridor, again, automatically uh, on June 1. So everything, so every corner of this intersection this will be. This is allowed for 85 feet. This will be allowed for 80 feet. This will be allowed for 80 feet here. Here. Now that's 80 feet with bonuses, with right? Bonuses. The, the base height is 65 feet. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's all I have. Thank you. All right. Any other questions, Mr. Driggs? Uh, I just want to comment briefly without starting a policy conversation. I have a concern about resisting something that's consistent with our policy, on the grounds of unspecified reasons or uh, on the grounds of undefined concerns about traffic. I mean, at some point we have to get to a stage where we are interpreting things according to the rules we just made. That's all. Thank you. All right. Any other questions? Hearing none. Do I have a motion to close the public hearing? So moved. Second. We have a motion and a second. All in any discussion? All in favor, raise your hand. All right. Thank you very much. Our next item is item 35 for tr petition 2022-048 by Tribute Companies for approximately 182 acres located on the south side of Interstate 485 South Ex Interchange, east of John Adams, north of North Tryon, it's in District 4. The current zoning is single family residential. The proposed zoning is mixed use with five year vested rights. Staff does not recommend approval of this petition as current form. And so the speaker 
speakers that we would have on this are um, Mr. Brown, um, you again will lead this discussion, and I believe that we, we will have 10 minutes, um, be, even though everyone is four, because the staff has not approved of the petition in its current form. We do have a speaker that's not on the list, and I don't know, Mr. Brown, is um, Dennis Lakari. Is he working with you? Uh, Dennis Lakari. is with CMS, and we hope he's here as a resource if you have questions. Oh, there, he's up there he here. All right, so um, he will be. <laughs> It's good to see, I know. So um, we will see if, however, you want to do your four list. Okay. All, All right. right. Thank you, Madam Mayor. 2022-048. That's a little over 182 acres. Uh, it is <clears throat> located off of, uh, on the south side of Interstate 45, uh, just east of John Adams Road, north of North Tryon Street, really off of that uh, area between Mallard Creek Church Road um, and I-485. Uh, existing zoning is R3, <clears throat> and the proposed zoning is for MX2, and the adopted place type from the 2040 policy map does recommend neighborhood one. You can see we've got quite a bit of uh, recommendations in the area. We've got some N2 just adjacent to all of this, campus, uh, commercial, community activity center. There's some industrial manufacturing logistics just on the south side of Mallard Creek Church. So. Uh, quite a diverse mix of, of uses and recommendations uh, from the policy map on this one uh, in that general area. The proposal itself uh, is for up to 1,950 units. That could be in any combination of single family detached and or attached uh, or multifamily residential units. There are some development areas throughout the site that do further re restrict and define some of those uses. So we'll go through those uh, on this side or slide, excuse me, development area P1 which you can see is uh, just next to where it says 150 foot power easement. You can see P1 there. That is predominantly devoted to park and, and outdoor recreation uses. Uh, development area S1, which is just on the south side of uh, where P1 is there, that's uh, predominantly devoted to institutional uses. Elementary school is, is one of the things that's being considered in that area. Uh, then we get into the development area A's, which is A1 through A7. Uh, those would be residential uses. Uh, there are a few, area A2.1, 3.1, 4.1, 5, 6, and 7 would all be lower density residential options, so things like single family detached uh, or townhome units, so no multifamily in those areas. And those are the areas that are predominantly up against some existing uh, single family attached townhomes, uh, just to try to keep some land use consistency between those general areas. Again, it does provide a minimum of 16 acres for a uh, publicly accessible park. Nine of those acres would be dedicated uh, to Mecklenburg County for a future neighborhood park. Um, does provide a pedestrian friendly focal point for neighborhood activity, and that would include potentially things like temporary events for food trucks, pop-up retail, uh, seasonal neighborhood festivals like pumpkin patches, uh, music, artwork, crafts, or other community engagement activities. Uh, also would provide for architectural standards for things like building materials and building uh, siding on, uh, along each uh, development area. And also a TIS was required for this petition. Uh, there were quite a few transportation improvements, as you can imagine, for a site this large and, and with this many units. Uh, there were quite a few off-site improvements, uh, things like turn lanes, addition of storage, restriping of pavement, uh, traffic signs, coordinated single timing, et cetera. Uh, we do have some slides uh, after this one from CDOT just to talk through uh, some of those uh, transportation items specifically. So Jake, if you wanna walk us through that, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks, Dave. Uh, just wanted to go over a quick summary of some of the transportation items that came out of the traffic study. Uh, the consultant performed a traffic study. Uh, 13 existing intersections were studied in the vicinity of the site. Um, we did, as we do with all studies, um, include account for growth in the future. So uh, adjacent developments that have approved traffic studies, uh, as well as a growth rate for existing traffic of 2% per year uh, was included. Um, the, the traffic study was reviewed by CDOT as well as our third party uh, consultant for verification. Uh, and they have committed to improvements in the study area to uh, mitigate their traffic. The next slide, please. Uh, as you can see, the, the study area uh, surrounded the entire site on North Tryon Street as well as Mallard Creek Church Road, including uh, the interchange with I-85 and the interchange with I-485. Next slide. 
Uh, some of the traffic study improvements that came out of the traffic study included significant upgrades to the Mallard Creek Church and I-85 interchange, including uh, restriping additional lanes, uh, as well as turn lane improvements. Uh, there were two new tra uh, traffic signals proposed as part of the development, uh, one on North Tryon and at the US-29 service road, as well as a new traffic signal on Mallard Creek Church Road uh, and Mallard Glen Drive. Uh, that, is, that is a new traffic signal that would also serve uh, some existing development along Mallard Glen Drive. Uh, there are a number of other intersection improvements, uh, turn lanes and traffic signal upgrades uh, in the area, uh, as well as additional improvements to the existing uh, network of streets. Uh, there are uh, a new network of public streets included as part of the petition, uh, upgrades to existing uh, adjacent roads such as Revolution Court, uh, Galloway Road, Mallard Glen Drive, uh, and Heritage Lake Drive, uh, and also upgrades to existing private streets uh, such as Heritage Lake Drive and North Bend Drive that would potentially allow uh, the city to accept those streets for maintenance uh, in the future uh, as, the, as this new development is adding uh, connectivity to those roadways. And that's it. I'll pass it on back to Dave. All right, thank you. So as mentioned earlier, staff does have some uh, concerns overall with the petition. Uh, we are not recommending approval in our current form. Uh, staff would like to see a little bit more uh, clarity on uh, some of the different housing types, get a little bit better idea of what that actual count may end up being. Again, there, there are some restrictions on things where only townhomes or single family detached can go, but we'd like a little bit more clarity on the breakdown of some of that. We also would like some consideration of some non-residential uh, that could provide some neighborhood supportive uses for this amount of units uh, that would also help to promote more of a 10 minute neighborhood within this project and also help uh, with some internal capture from a uh, trip generation standpoint. So just again, trying to get a little bit of clarity on housing types, unit counts, uh, and then consider some of those non-residential uses that could be supportive for the neighborhood. Uh, overall, there are some benefits, the, the uh, addition of the public park, obviously land set aside for a future school. Uh, those are all things that, that we do see as, as positive, but we'd like to continue to work with this petitioner uh, to see if we can get some uh, uh, other items addressed and cleared up before we consider a, a change in our recommendation at this point. So with that, uh, I'll turn it over to the petitioner team and we'll take any questions following their presentation. Thank you. Mr. Brown, you have 10 minutes. Good evening, Madam Mayor, uh, Zenning Committee members, Colin Brown on behalf of the petitioner uh, tribute companies. Mark Maynard from Tribute is here. Uh, this is a large piece of land. Uh, this is a, a significant rezoning. Uh, tribute already owns the property, um, so they're invested uh, in this piece. Uh, we've been working at this for some time. And if you don't mind, if we could start with the earlier slides, I'll, I'll talk through them. Uh, as you all know, uh, as we're talking about rezonings um, within this district, and especially any area that has the name Mallard in it, uh, we talk about infrastructure. And uh, Councilmember Johnson is consistently asking, you know, what is being done to, to compensate for the development coming in? So when we embarked on this large of a rezoning, um, the first thing that we did was contact CMS because by infrastructure, we're usually talking about schools, parks, and transportation. Uh, so we engaged with CMS about this site. Uh, they indicated uh, that this is very much a, a great piece of land they would like an opportunity to be at. Uh, and so as you'll see when I get to the site plan, they were involved early on. This is not an afterthought of, of five acres to the back. This school would be a central part of this development. Accompanying that, uh, parkland to Mecklenburg County Parks and Rec, uh, which kind of complements the school, really becomes a community place that centers this and provides a sense of place. Uh, so the team tonight, I've mentioned Mark Maynard is here. Uh, Dennis Lacaria from CM, uh, not from CMS, but working with CMS uh, is here if you have questions. Land design has done the site design work, which I'll show you in a moment. Uh, and the, the real heavy lifting on this has come to our uh, traffic consultant, uh, Davenport. John Davenport is here tonight. Uh, I know that CDOT went through some. John's got a pretty interactive um, presentation of the things they're doing, so I want to save a few minutes for him to do that. Uh, again, large piece of property at the, at the elbow of essentially two interstates. Uh, the current uh, 2040 plan calls for low-density residential. The 
prior plan had called for uh, multifamily and office here, so a heavier use at those interstates. Dave has done a good job of kind of laying out for you what is proposed. Uh, as Dave indicated, we've kind of been dealing with the, the, the heavy lifting, the big parts. Uh, staff has indicated that they'd like a little more information on the uh, housing types. Can we incorporate uh, some commercial uses to complement this? This is uh, Land Design's plan, which is a little more uh, user friendly. I'll kind of go to the smaller version where I can see it a little better. This would be the school site. So again, kind of the center of the community. Uh, this would be the public park acreage, uh, 16 acres uh, at least total there, at least nine that could go to Mecklenburg County Parks and Rec, uh, still incorporating a lot of other green spaces and open spaces throughout the site. Uh, we do have lower density areas here, kind of townhome style product adjacent to the adjacent townhome product. So there's a nice transition to those. And then this would be more traditional multifamily housing uh, closer to the interstates and a little bit further away from those single family homes. Um, again, we spent a lot of time coordinating with multiple entities. I think this is a very good example uh, of a development team. Uh, again, I, I think hearing uh, from the feedback we've gotten from council about the need for things, I think there is uh, some excitement uh, about the opportunity for the schools, the parks, uh, and those things that it brings along. So we will continue working uh, with planning staff uh, on this plan, try to get them a little more detail on the things that they're looking at. Um, I do want to pause here because uh, as we talk in the Mallard area all the time. We talk about transportation. We've done a lot on that. So I'm going to turn it over to John Davenport. Uh, Emma, if you don't mind, I think he'll start with the video. If y'all have questions about specific intersections, please ask and we can pull up our slides and go to those. All right. Thank you. Good evening, Madam Mayor, City Council. My name is John Davenport with Davenport, John Davenport Engineering. Address 119 Brookstown Avenue, Winston-Salem. I'm from the corporate office, and I have some of my associates here to talk about the details if you have questions. Uh, we're going to try to roll this video in just a second here. I wanted to, to show you the improvements. Could you pause just one second, please? Uh, the extents of the improvements, because there is quite a bit. Um, we're going to start here at Mallard and Fort, and uh, excuse me, I-85. So we're going to be adding some lanes there, and essentially the turn lanes are going to make significant improvements. So if you'll hit the roll the, roll the video, I think all of that's in there. So there, we're going to achieve a 55% delay reduction. So just to give you an idea, that's that's over half the reduction there. So as we continue eastward and we get to the northbound ramps, we will be adding a second, uh, and you can pause right there. We'll be adding a second um, eastbound turn lane to get on to I-85, and with that intersection, we'll be getting significant improvements as well. So the entire interchange will be reconfigured through the bridge and the ramp terminals to provide significant uh, improvements. And it's rare to get a developer that's going to do those type of improvements, but with this project and the number of uh, trips we're going to generate, this project is going to be doing that. So it's, it's really exciting to be able to work with someone who's got the capacity to do these type of improvements. If you'll roll the video, we'll go down to the main entrance. And when we get down to Mallard Glen, you'll see that we are installing a traffic signal there. Uh, there's turn lanes, there's lots of improvements currently. Uh, obviously, trying to make a left out of there is a level of service F. When we put the traffic signal in, we're going to go to a B, so there's a 96% reduction in delay there. So that's a significant improvement along that corridor, so people coming in and out of the area will see a significant improvement. If you'll let the video keep rolling, <clears throat> we'll get on down the Tryon. Now, this intersection is a little bit more complex, because there's a lot of turn lanes out there already. You'll see that there are some improvements being put in from other developers. Uh, from the uh, eastbound direction and southbound direction. We will be installing dual rights and extending the northbound left turn lanes, and we'll be able to keep the level of service and the delays about where they are now. So we're able to mitigate our traffic. We can't make that one better, but we can mitigate our traffic. As CDOT mentioned, we go up here to uh, US 29 Service Road. What we had proposed was a signalized intersection there, providing left turns in and rights. Could you pause just one second? Thank you and uh, dual rights out. We are going to be working with CDOT to extend uh, Heritage Ridge to perhaps get a full signal there. That'll be working with NCDOT and, and breaking the control access break, which is currently in that location. So that's something we're working on with them now. If you'll continue the video. And then when we get to 485, uh, we will also, uh, we've also recommended a second right turn lane to go on to 485. Uh, and so that would be one on the southbound try-on that we'd be adding as well. And that would also uh, mitigate our traffic. So again, I'm going to be here to answer any questions. I tried to fly you through that. 
to show you what's going on because there is a lot to say here. And um, so I'll be available after we finish the presentation for any questions you may have. Thank you so much for your time. That video, they say a picture <laughs> says a thousand words. I don't know what that video does, I but think I, said a thousand. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I can look at the stick drawings and that just says it so clearly. So uh, I hope you'll see, and, and just to restate, it's most of the time when we're doing these traffic studies, we're just trying to hold, you know, and, and say, hey, we'll do this development, it won't get worse. Uh, here's an opportunity to make several of those intersections significantly better. Uh, and that includes the impact coming from the new school. Um, so I'm uh, happy to answer any questions. Uh, as Dave mentioned, staff does have some outstanding uh, concerns they'd like us to address, so we'll work on those and hopefully uh, have some of the, make a step forward in our next submission. Happy to take any questions you may have. All right. Any questions for um, the petitioner? Ms. Ajmira, followed by Mayor Pro Tem, and then Mr. Driggs. Thank you, Madam Mayor. This is a huge development. Um, there's a lot to unpack here, but, um, it, you know, I was just going through some of the comments why staff does not recommend approval of this petition, but they are looking for specifics on number of units. Uh, that will be part of this uh, neighborhood two place. Um, could you comment on that? And also, uh, if you could comment on green space, I know as part of um, the UDO, we are, um, we, staff has worked with county to allow more green space, especially for parks and recreation. And I don't see that being part of this uh, significantly large development. Oh, I think if, if I could have our slides up, uh, Mecklenburg County Parks and Rec has been a part of this conversation. Our hope is that we provide land for the public parks um, in conjunction with this. Let me make sure I got the right slide. Um, so Council Member Ajmira, we're talking about, these are actually, we're showing ball fields uh, that would hopefully be operated by Mecklenburg County Parks and Rec. Um, certainly would be contributed to them, and we think that will function well with the school facility here. So as you can see, there's a great amount of green space. Uh, we do have some wetlands through the site. Uh, I'll have to get back to you on the percentage. Uh, it's significant, but as you can see here, and even trying to use this kind of power line corridor to, to activate that, uh, this will have substantial open spaces. Um, so I'm happy to, I'll coordinate with land design, our, our lead designers on spring break this week, but I'll get you some information about that, and I think we've got a very good answer uh, on Parks and Rec, that's that's one of the real infrastructure needs that's being provided here. Uh, as far as product type, there's probably more shown on this than we've shown staff, uh, than we've committed to in our zoning document. I think that's what staff is looking for, some more commitment about the single family housing types. And another thing, the, the, the challenge for us here, uh, staff has, has asked for some kind of commercial uses, like neighborhood service retail to support this community. It's just hard because as, as large as this site is, it is buried away from the kind of major thoroughfare. So it's not getting the type of traffic to support the type of retail I think they'd like to see. So we're, we're, we're thinking through what could be done to have a little bit of a different mixed use component. So to follow up on that, uh, going back to park space, how many acres are we talking about here? Uh, we've got at least, let me get my notes, uh, 16 acre uh, of public park, uh, none of that dedicated to Mecklenburg County Parks and Rec, uh, but that is just, that's essentially the kind of active areas. There would be acres and acres more, and I could get back to you with that number of green spaces, tree save areas that would be preserved and hopefully have a trail network within those. Yeah, if you could get back to me on uh, also what is required versus um under the UDO. Okay. okay. And second, I uh, I know you touched on number of units and that would be part of the ongoing conversations with staff. Uh, so all that information would be provided to us before. On, we're, we're, before we, we've decision. kind of got this high level number, yes. Um, staff has asked us for a little more. This is what we got to them you know, about six weeks ago. Uh, so we're expecting we'll have an updated plan uh, into staff with a little more, more detail on that subject this week. Well, I will have some questions on infrastructure. I, you know, there, uh, that was a really good video, by the way. Uh, but I'll have to watch over and over again. <laughs> um, so I'll have follow-up questions for you. But uh, certainly, this is a significant development. Uh, we got to get this right. Um, 
to make sure that we are addressing infrastructure needs as, as well as park, green space, schools, um, to get this right. Thank you. All right, Mayor Pro Tem. Uh, thank you, um, Mr. Davenport and uh, Mr. Brown. Um, that, that was an impressive video. Um, but they, uh, uh, forgive me if I'm wrong, but um, on the video I saw a lot of auto-centric improvements. I did see some bike lanes there, but I didn't hear any mention of any type of protected bike lanes. Um, I know that this part of town, um, you know, is pretty auto-centric um, right now. But I think that there are some arguments that, especially with developments like this, um, these are opportunities to change modes. Um, it is relatively close to a college um, where there's, and, and it's in an area where, it's, if I'm not mistaken, there is more multifamily go, going going in um, and around uh, your site. Uh, I believe the school that you mentioned is not necessarily going to be one where the, the, the age of the kids are going to be driving to school. Um, uh, North Tryon Street, um, although it does might not seem um, very walkable right now, um, if I, again, if I'm remembering correctly, we have had some pedestrian fatalities um, there, especially um, at night, as there are um, uh, multifamily that is relatively more affordable than a lot of places in Charlotte that exists. Um, north of 45, I think right where you have that uh, additional turn lane, again, a more in auto intense use. Um, and there are jobs down south, <laughs> but there's not a lot of pedestrian infrastructure to get folks down, down um, from where folks are living um, down to where the jobs and where the schools are. So I certainly have some concerns about that. This seems like if, if I'm looking at that correctly, there are some missed opportunities, perhaps. Um, um, and again, just thinking um, on either side of 85, again, there's growth happening. So we want to take opportunities to be able to connect those in multimodal ways, not just auto-centric ways. So um, am I, was I missing something um, in, in, in that video? Um, and I think if, you're right. Yeah. Well, one, one thing I would say, there are bike lanes on Mallory Creek Church Road now. And so we're protected. Yeah, they're they're striped. Yeah. The typical CDOT standard for that type of facility. So we would we're gonna whatever we put in is gonna maintain that. We're not gonna get rid of those bike lanes. But you wouldn't have right now there aren't bike lanes through the interchange. That's and I'm a cyclist, by the way. I, I you know, I love riding, so I te I'm definitely feel you on what you're saying with that. Um, we can certainly, as we work with CDOT, whatever improvements as far as at the intersection in particular, if there's pedestrian things that, are, that they feel like we need to add, I'm certainly yeah. sure we could do that. The oh. study was just focused, you know, with, with your traffic studies, you know, there's a lot of traffic we're generating, and obviously we had to show that through the standards we were, we were addressing that. But your I'm comments are, and, are welcome. And, and your comment about multi mobile, to be honest with you, we've kind of focused that on internal to our site, right? Trail network, walking network to get folks to the new school. Uh, for the externals, because we're also working with the NCDOT, that has been very vehicular focused. Yeah. Uh, so well, we're happy that's not see. surprising. Yeah, yeah. That's the, yeah. But here in Charlotte, right, um, hopefully there are, there are a lot of folks that are moving internally. Hopefully there's some bikers there and there are places to get. And it looks like the design that we have right now makes it much more treacherous uh, to get across the 85 um, interchange across um, Mallard Creek Church Road. and. I, I certainly have some concerns about that. I, I, maybe we talk about that offline and see. Uh, sure. Um, sure. We can talk about that. I understand there are state level standards here yeah, versus yeah. city priorities. So. Thank you. Mr. Driggs. Thank you, Mayor. Um, so, Mr. Patton, I'm interested that you say do not recommend approval and not recommend subject to outstanding items. So, uh, how do you, big is the gap? I mean, uh, do, is this something you feel is going to get closed, or does this require substantial additional work? I don't. I don't think there's substantial additional work necessarily. I, I do 
understand the concerns and constraints about adding potentially some non-residential neighborhood serving retail this far off of Mallard Creek Church, but yeah, I think we'd like it to continue to be explored and have that conversation. You have almost 2,000 units. There's a lot of built-in you know, need for that without having to circle back out to Mallard Creek Church or some other. So it'd be interesting to see what maybe some of the solutions could be for that. But you know, we do understand the constraints of location, uh, but I think we'd still like to see something like that considered just to, you know, like I said, better capture some internal uh, activities on the site without having to go out to, to Mallard Creek Church. But I think some better definition for us and understanding a, a plan like this could certainly help. I think just kind of seeing it a project this large and just more of a bubble format in some ways is, is reasonable, but in some ways like this, where it's this far off the road and impacting a bunch of different, uh, you know, existing streets, we'd like to see some of that form and function of the site, which I think this helps us. So hopefully we'll see some more of this moving forward. So I don't think we're too far apart. I, I do think we see some benefits of the project. You know, certainly it's it's not consistent with the plan, but I don't think the plan ever envisioned a kind of comprehensive, large scale project of, of this size in, in this area along uh, the area of the interchange. So I, I think we've we've got some work to do, but I don't think it's insurmountable at this point. It's. Uh... It's a pretty glaring example of a difference between what the plan says and uh, yeah. what's being proposed. Mm -hmm. um, so, Mr. Brown, I'm sorry if I was processing and missed this, but could you describe again CMS's involvement? Um, I might defer that to we, our my understanding of the involvement is we had been talking about the need in this area for schools. So when we had a project of this side, we, we reached out to CMS and asked if they would be interested in the site. Um, so from my client's perspective, uh, our rezoning proposal um, will accommodate a school. Essentially, an institutional use would be all that is allowed in that area. Um, I'll let Mr. Clary, if you have questions about CMS's intentions, respond to those. Is that okay? Uh, all right. Go ahead, Mr. Clary. So I think my question is, uh, would this be a sale of a portion of the land to CMS, or is it a uh, dedication of land, or what are the terms on which the area that where the school is going to be is being acquired by CMS? This would this would be essentially a dedication of land, a contribution. Okay, and uh, is there a timeline for the school, like a situation that we once experienced, where the differences that we still haven't worked out are suddenly going to have to be resolved under time pressure, or else the school is not going to get finished on a certain well, schedule. Uh, opposite of the one we talked about last time, we're resenting this ahead of time, right? So that the school can accommodate and we're not racing against a bond deadline. All right. I mean, th that's essentially it. So thank you, Mr. Vicaria. But uh, uh, dedication of land is appreciated. We're always in support of the school. We just don't want to get into a tight spot where we have pretty significant unresolved issues and it all has to be done quickly. We're, we're, we're on the other side of that. We're trying to hurry up and say, can we get a bond? It's very important for us. We want the school there. We've kind of made it the center of this development, so that's going to be an important selling point for this development. So we're hoping CMS is going to advance that along and, and have this coming along. And this larger development, so you know, we're, this isn't getting developed in a year. I mean, this is a 10 or 15 year development project uh, for tribute. And so we feel like with CMS's timeline, that's going to come together nicely. So we have as much time as we need to work on these issues. Well, <laughs> we'll, we'll have a minute on Thursday. <laughs> All right, thank you. Any other questions? Ms. Johnson? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Brown, um, and thank you, Mr. Davenport, for the uh, presentation again. I do have a question regarding the schools, and I want to thank you for the development. You, you all know that I've been talking about the infrastructure and the, and the growth in District 4 for over a year, and I actually sent uh, the map that was sent to me to Dave Petten. So, Dave, if you, if you could show that. Um, I'm a, it, I think we've got staff up in the booth that will bring it up for us. Okay. Thank you. So if my colleagues can see, this is a map of District 4 <laughs> petitions that are pending, approved, and by right. And you can see this Mallard Creek area, Here's how our inundated it is with growth. Um, I actually had a meeting with staff the other day to ask about schools because we talk about upward mobility, yet are we really looking at the impact of all of this development on our schools? And I was told that, we, that we're not counting uh, approved petitions in the school count because they're not built yet. 
So I appreciate uh, the petition that, that addresses schools and traffic and parks. And I think we should all, as council members, have these expectations for our districts and our public. But if you look at this, we have to do something. So again, I appreciate the, the, the attention to schools. I, because if you look at the number, the impact on schools for this petition, I believe that it says um, Stony Creek Elementary would increase from 123% to 144. Um, I think it was, let me see. 121. 121. Well, we approved a petition in May of 2021 that said the school would increase to 123%. So it just goes to show that we are approving things without um, calculating or considering the impact of growth. And Mayor, I had the, I wasn't at uh, last Monday's council meeting due to a family emergency, but when the hotel was, was um, approved, one of the things you said, and I thought was so important, you said by governmental action, uh, we neglected and left to fail um, uh, certain conditions, and we said that's okay. And it's not okay. And I agree, it's not okay to continue to approve growth without looking at the impact on traffic and, and sewer and schools. You also said we have to start somewhere, and let's start with this vote. So, I, I you know, I asked my colleagues, let's start with this petition, you know, to start requiring this type of improvement to, um, on our infrastructure and our schools, and we should just really, really push for that in development. So, um, I did want to ask um, the gentleman from CMS about the the school count, um, if you. If you're familiar with how the, the school capacity is calculated as the city is approving um, the rezonings, um, and, I've, and I've mentioned that the numbers aren't changing. So can you tell me why that is? So good evening, Madam Mayor, members of council. So the, uh, the, the way that we respond to petitions at CMS, they are presented to us on a petition by petition basis not cumulative, not against any other background, simply how will this particular petition, if approved, impact a school based on its current situation. So we are, we are constantly analyzing the current condition versus the outcome if this petition is approved and it's built out at some future date. We don't always know when those dates are. It's very hard to track those things sort of cumulatively other than by counting mobiles at a particular school because that's the way that we typically have to address those sorts of situations. So they really are one-offs based on each petitioner's impacts and the current situation at the school and what we would project based on the outcome of that approval. Thank you so much. So one of the, the terms that I think we need to avoid is um, unintended consequences. Um, I don't want to look back 10 years from now and, and say, oh, that, you know, it's an unintended consequence that our, that our, that our schools are grossly overcrowded or that our uh, sewer water capacity um, is, not, is not sufficient. We have the chance to really look at things, um, as, as you always say, from a 30,000 foot level. You can't look at a puzzle by, piece by piece. You need to look at the big picture. And we really need to do that from a city perspective if we want to say that we are strategically and responsibly considering these for our voters and our residents. So again, I, I will be supporting this. I hope that you do. we do get uh, to the point where city staff will recommend it. But this checks the box. This answers the need. And we need to see more of these from a city perspective. We also need to look, and this is for my colleagues, to take a look at our policy and start considering cumulative growth in the city. Thank you. Motion to close. May I, may I comment first? Yes. Um, Ms. Brown, remind me again how many residential units this development will have? Up to 1,950. Okay. In the past, uh, we've talked about how our schools work, and I'm not, you know, by any means a school board member or school board planner, and that's thank goodness for that because it's a hard job. 
But I do want to say that as we've been seeing this growth and we want this growth and opportunity to exist, this is a jobs corridor. And I haven't seen anything on affordable housing in it. And so I'm not quite sure what that means, but I think that we really ought to um, be thinking about 1,950 units if we're going to put a school there. How do we make sure that that school flourishes, that it has the diversity of um, thought and actions that we can have, and how do we actually look at this in terms of where our teachers can live? So when teachers are making, what is it, 31,000 a year? And you want them to come out and teach, we have to do something that allows them to be able to eat as well as sleep at night. So I hope that we will have some ideas around how we actually create the opportunity for people that can do this work and be on the site so that they can have the opportunities of upward mobility and their children can have the opportunity of a great school. So with that, I think the um, fair lady from District 4 said option to close. Second. So public hearing, we have a second. Any further comment? Having no further comment. All in favor of the closing the public hearing. All right, thank you very much. The next petition is rezoning petition 2022-099 um, by Levine Properties, location of approximately nine-tenths of an acre, located at the southeast intersection of Commonwealth and the Plaza, nor north of East Independence Boulevard. It's in District 1. The current zoning is office pedestrian overlay. And, mixed use and proposed zoning is mixed-use development district optional pedestrian overlay. Staff does not recommend approval of this and this petition. And so the staff will have um, 10 minutes. And Mr. Brown, I guess you're the 10-minute man. Maybe we should have <laughs> 10 minute neighborhood, 10 minute lawyers, I guess. So. Uh, can we have that All stricken right. from the record, please? <laughs> 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 All right. Okay. Make so the T-shirt. Let's, let's go ahead and hear from Mr. Patton. <laughs> I really did not mean that that way. <laughs> uh, it's too late now. <laughs> <laughs> and scene. Right. Okay. Bruno, um, you got that? <laughs> All right, 2022-099, uh, it's just under an acre of Commonwealth Avenue in the plaza, uh, located in the uh, Plaza Midwood neighborhood, currently zoned O2 PED. Uh, proposed zoning is for Mud O uh, with that pedestrian overlay as well. Adopted place type does recommend a community activity center uh, in this location. You can see that's the predominant land use recommendation here. Uh, the proposal uh, is for a maximum of 175 multifamily residential units, uh, up to 12,000 square feet of commercial, uh, non-residential uses, a minimum of 6,000 of those square feet uh, would be located on the ground floor. Uh, does prohibit things like car washes, uh, except for those that might be associated with the residential use. Uh, auto service stations, EDEs with accessory drive through windows and commercial self-storage facilities. We do have some conversion rights, which would allow the project to shift to some market demand. So unused multifamily residential units, if those are left out there, they could be converted to a commercial space at a use of one unit to 1,000 square feet of additional commercial. Uh, the max for that would be adding up to 10,000 new commercial square feet on top of the 12,000. Uh, in, in the inverse, if they don't use commercial space, they could convert that to uh, hotel rooms at a rate of 1,000 square feet of commercial to two hotel rooms. And if also if there's unused multifamily, uh, that may also go to uh, hotel rooms at a rate of one to two uh, for up to 46, and then a rate of one to one for up to 45. That would amount to a total of uh, not exceeding 91. Uh, does request some optional provisions for an accessory drive-through that would be uh, primarily intended just to serve the financial institution. For some of those uh, that may remember, this used to be the site of the old uh, fire credit union uh, building that did have an accessory drive-through uh, along the back of it that was closer to where the apartment building is there just on plan right. Uh, so they are requesting an optional provision to reestablish that uh, within this project. Also request an optional provision to exceed the maximum height in the mud district. That The height is 120. They're requesting a maximum of 150. Uh, they would provide community benefits consistent with uh, bonus provisions set forth in the UDO for any building height beyond 120. Uh, would provide full access on Commonwealth Avenue and the plaza. Also would commit to update ADA ramps at the corner of the plaza and Commonwealth Avenue. Uh, does provide architectural design guidelines related to things like building materials, uh, 
screen parking decks, internally oriented drive through uh, with screen maneuvering areas, blank wall limitations, et cetera. Uh, and so again, staff does not recommend approval of this petition in current form. Uh, it's because of the drive through component technically inconsistent with the community activity center, those aren't uh, established in new activity centers unless there was an existing use there that had, had been in operation uh, and didn't cease to uh, be in use for more than six months. So this one obviously is beyond that six month limitation. So uh, this would be an activity center area where new drive-throughs wouldn't be uh, encouraged or allowed under that uh, new district. Uh, staff does have some concerns with the 150 foot building height, the context in that general area uh, for Plaza Midwood is is really a little bit smaller scale. We would feel a little more comfortable with a height around that 90 to 100 foot mark. Uh, I, I know that's uh, there's some conversation between uh, staff and the petitioner about the activity center. There are two types of activity centers that allow heights to go up to 120, and then another activity center that would allow it up to 200. So. And there are some conversations about what intensity of activity center should this be, and that's where our concern comes in mainly is, is because of that 150. Staff feels that that's a little bit more than, than is really appropriate in this location. Really the core of this activity center is a little bit further out uh, in, in that area where we've seen some redevelopment along uh, right over here, excuse me, off of Pecan, uh, Commonwealth, Central Avenue is right up here. We've got a lot of redevelopment. This is kind of the core of the activity center. so. Typically when you see that core, which would allow some different heights upwards of 200 and even a TOD that could get even beyond that, those heights typically transition down uh, outside right at the edge of the activity center. This is the end of where that activity center is really next to the apartment building, which is already entitled for a, about, I think, 85 feet, maybe even less. Uh, so again, staff feels like that 150 is a little much in this corner. Uh, I know the petitioner and their team feel a little bit differently, so I'm sure they'll uh, share some of that with you, but that's uh, primarily one of our main reasons uh, that we've got concerns and we're not currently uh, in support. We'd also like a little bit more information about the design of the drive-through. Uh, certainly understand the need for it and the, and the desire to have that to serve that credit union that used to have one. Uh, and I think we would just like a little bit more clarification to understand how that's gonna operate and function. We'd also like to understand a little bit more of uh, some of the potential uh, bonus provisions they would like to potentially use to get from 120 to 150, just still some things that we need clarification on. So that's where staff is. Again, we don't recommend approval in its current form. We'll continue to work with the petitioner as they go through the process and uh, hopefully get to a, an outcome where we can all uh, look at this project in a different, uh, a different view. So uh, with that, I'll turn it over to the petitioner. I think we've got some public speakers as well, so we'll take any questions following uh, uh, their time at the podium. Thank you. Mr. Brown, after, um, as you complete your four minutes, Ms. It's Alan Nelson and Tanya Wilson will be speaking against the petition. Sorry, Madam Mayor, how many minutes? 10 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> that, that was on purpose. Uh, <laughs> you did that on purpose. <laughs> 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 nice try. So nice try. I love it. I love it. I'm telling you. Alan Wilson and Tony Wilson also have 10 minutes. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, Colin Brown on behalf of the petitioner, Levine Properties. Uh, Thank you for hearing us tonight. Uh, as you may know, uh, Plaza Midwood is really an area where uh, Mr. Levine's father and his uncles established their retail businesses uh, that grew into national businesses. So this is an area that is very important to the Levine family. I think Daniel has been out, frankly, more than I have, uh, engaging with the neighborhood, having conversations about this site. Uh, I know we're, we, we don't seem to be fully aligned with the community, uh, but we think we are aligned uh, with what the council has adopted as plans for this area and are aligned with the investments that we are making in all sorts of transit and mobility in this area and why it is important to support intensity and density in these areas um, to support our transit and multimodal options. Uh, so again, this is the site, uh, as, as Dave has talked about, uh, and I'll show you some maps in a moment, uh, one of the pauses, we've been struggling the last couple months of, we have all these petitions that are not consistent with the 2040 plan. Well, here we are consistent. Uh, the, the plan says this is a community activity center. As Dave mentioned, there, there are two flavors of community activity center, and we've talked about which flavor should this be. Uh, in our opinion, what we talked about staff with staff earlier is 
some of those important things about Plaza Midwood are kind of the main street there, and maybe that's where the lesser intensity should be. Uh, our site here backs up to Independence and the future Silver Line corridor. So we think this is the site. It, it is not kind of in the central business district. It is on the fringe against Independence and the future light rail. Uh, so we think it is an important and a good fit for this location. Uh, there it is, is adjacent to the Julian development, uh, which the Levine companies developed uh, several years ago. Here's a look at it. And this is the, we have a funny request for a drive-through. You know, I'll, I'll just say that it, it does seem a little awkward. There's a unique reason for this. Um, the Charlotte Firefighters Credit Union is a single uh, member credit union uh, that serves our fi firefighters. Uh, this was their location. Uh, they were one of the anchors that really kind of anchored the revitalization of the Plaza Midwood neighborhood. They're currently in a different property uh, owned by Levine, but they want to come back to this corner. Uh, you'll hear from Debbie Trotter. I'll try to give her a few minutes uh, to speak and talk about why it is so important. You'll also hear there are very few, that although they need a drive-through, there is very, very low usage. I mean, maybe 250 visits a month. Uh, so it is not a traffic driver, but it is something important to bring them back to the neighborhood and be in this building. So the current zoning is O2 PED. As we talked about in the first petition tonight, on June 1, this will convert to NC. And NC would allow 80 feet of height. So I know we're gonna talk about character and we're gonna talk about what Plaza Midwood looks like now and what it should look like in the future. And I know there's a lot of thinking of, yay, we should have two and three story buildings there. Uh, that, pardon the pun, that, that train has left the station. Uh, there is going to be intense development here. Uh, this site could be developed at 80 feet uh, with probably a similar, similar number of units. Uh, what Mr. Levine is proposing is kind of a higher standard of building going away from, and I'll show you in a moment, kind of a picture of everything we see in Plaza Midwood, and I hear this lament a lot. You know, we just see the five to six story beige apartment building, stick built that looks like everything else. Uh, if we are limited to the height, um, of 80 feet under the current zoning, that's what we'll get again. Uh, to have more dynamic transit-oriented development, we need greater flexibility, and we believe that's consistent. Here's the 2040 plant, though you automatically apply NC in June. The plan here is Community Activity Center. Community Activity Center is to provide places that have a concentration of primarily commercial and residential activity, well-connected, this is one I hit, we talk about this a lot, well-connected, walkable place located with a 10-minute walk, bike, or transit trip of surrounding neighborhoods. This site, of the many we've talked about, kind of has the magic. We've got a future silver line here, we have gold line, we have bus transit, we have signed bike lanes, uh, as well as a kind of future greenway connection. So as we talk, this kind of checks all the boxes for different mobility and transit types that are connected to this site. So I think it's the right place for density. Um, as, as Dave mentioned, the request here is for 175 units. So it's not incredibly dense uh, on this one acre site. Would have ground floor commercial, hopefully anchored by the Charlotte Firefighter Credit Union, which that drive through would be totally internal screen from the site, you would not see it. Uh, so that is why we really had to be in under the old mud zone to give us the option for that internal drive and the 150 feet of height, which I'm sure will be discussed. The Community Activity Center, which we've said in the 2040 plan, this should be, uh, and there are two flavors of that, and, and Dave said staff would be comfortable at 90 feet. Well, if we had the base, uh, that could go to 120 feet in the kind of more dense flavor, which we think is appropriate next to Independence, that would allow heights up to 200 feet. So we think our request of 150 feet is, is consistent. We think it is the right place with all the infrastructure that is in place for that. Uh, and, and Dave also mentioned we're under the old ordinance. If we were getting this heights under the new ordinance, we'd want, some, we'd want to know what the community benefits are. Uh, Mr. Levine has, has talked about that with the neighborhood. Uh, we're, well, we're on our um, a revised submission going to make some of those, which will include uh, an amount of contribution for uh, an improvement. Really, it's kind of we kind of hope this can be a rail trail, uh, but behind the silver line, behind this development. So a contribution towards that. 
Uh, the Levine team is committed to, we're installing some very urban sidewalk conditions on this property as part of our zoning. We can also bring those improvements down to cover this full block because Levine controls uh, the St. Julian. So having those uh, pedestrian infrastructure uh, completing the entire block down to St. Julian, commitments to electric vehicle parking in the new building, a contribution to the Plaza Midwood Association, uh, and DRG, our traffic consultant, uh, is working and will continue to work with CDOT on the um, uh, comprehensive transportation review to identify other multimodal improvements in, this, in, the, in the immediate area that could be improved. Uh, so we expect we will, um, th this is what we presented prior to the hearing. Uh, after we get your feedback here from the neighbors, uh, we think we will memorialize some of those commitments. I don't know how much time I have left, but I'd like to give Ms. Trotter a few minutes just to talk about uh, the need for the Charlotte Fire Credit Union. How many minutes do we have, Ms. Madam Mayor? Two Three. minutes. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for having me speak tonight. I just wanted to address the fact that we moved into the neighborhood in the late 1990s. In fact, we occupied the building in 1998 for the first time. And at that time, we had a little two-story building with three drive-through lanes. And we have done studies on our drive-throughs. We're averaging between 13 to 15 cars a day, Monday through Friday. It does not generate any weekend traffic because we're closed. Um, we love our neighborhood. We were very saddened when we had to um, tear the building down and um, we're looking very forward to coming back to this site if everything is approved. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Ms. Trotter. Mm -hmm. All right. Brown? Uh, I think that's it. We'll All be right. having to take questions after the others speak. So, um, Alan Nelson, Tanya Wilson, and Jason Michael um, will speak in opposition. You as a group have 10 minutes. Good evening, Madam Mayor, Council Members, and Zoning Committee Members. My name is Alan Nelson. I'm the past president of the Commonwealth Morningside Neighborhood Association. So we're act it is, this is actually in the Commonwealth Morningside neighborhood, not the Plaza Midwood neighborhood, where the small little neighborhood that often gets mistaken for Plaza Midwood. That's not really a bad thing. But, um, we also are joined tonight by representatives from the Plaza Midwood Neighborhood Association and the Plaza Midwood Merchants Association. Um, our current new president was unable to be here tonight. She's traveling. So with limited time tonight, um, we're going to run through uh, our presentation pretty quickly, and then we'll take any questions afterward um, if there's uh, questions on this. Uh, we do appreciate the petitioner coming to us very early in this process, well before the, the public meeting to talk about this. Um, and you know, as Mr. Brown has mentioned, there are lots of discussion, and a lot of it has to do, of course, with the new UDO versus the, the existing ordinance. Uh, our decision to oppose this uh, was not arrived at lightly, and we definitely, you know, full, fully aware that we're, you know, backing up to or actually between two, you know, lines of future mass transit between the gold line and the silver line. So we understand that density makes sense, um, and more density will be coming. Our main concerns are are the scale of the proposal. It's really it is quite drastically different from anything nearby. Uh, both single-family residential and the uh, and the, the businesses or the buildings in the business district, <clears throat> um, and it is this proposal is very close to the single-family residential. It's essentially half a block from the single-family R5, so that is one of the the concerns about the scale versus the proximity to the future uh, light rail station a little bit further away, roughly a quarter mile away. Uh, the requested height is also well beyond the UDO classification. So again talking about being a sort of a planning city going forward versus a deal making city going forward right now we are kind of you know it's, it's basically exceeding whichever plan you look at it it's, it's exceeding those right now so that's the other concern and then gen generally you know setting a precedent of with all the future development that this area will see are we going to kind of ignore the UDO or are we going to you know stay within the guardrails that are that are spelled out in that so um, were we able to get our presentation loaded Sent that in yesterday. If not, I can just keep. There we are. Okay, so this is most of what I've talked about now. If we could move on, or I got the next slide. So on the UDO translation map, 
Um, this site, as mentioned, this does translate uh, because of the existing pedestrian overlay. This naturally translates to neighborhood center. So you would have a max height of 65 without bonus or 80 feet with bonus. Uh, and then the single family portion of the neighborhood essentially is sort of a U shape on the right side of the image. And then the, the left portion of our neighborhood, the western end of the neighborhood, is um, shown here as mostly neighborhood center. And then, of course, the 2040 policy map. This is where a lot of the, you know, a lot more meat here to the discussion. So this is interesting because the, the western portion of the neighborhood is primarily the, the business district is shown on the 2040 policy map, all in the blue color representing community activity center. And the real questions here, and, and Mr. Brown mentioned it too, there are two flavors of community activity centers, CAC1 and CAC2. Now that's not shown on the 2040 policy map. Um, and kind of stepping back, one of our, you know, our bigger concerns is not, if, you know, if you're familiar with this area, it's a you know, very special, vibrant, unique area. It's, while it is close to the future mass transit, it can't be looked at like the South Boulevard, you know, warehouse corridor prior to the Blue Line. It's just a, it's a very, very different beast. Um, so we certainly feel that it, at most CAC1 would be the appropriate designation for this area. Um, and so again, just to kind of conclude there, I mean, we, it's, you have, you know, with the 2040 policy map, it's showing both the lowest density of neighborhood one directly next to the second highest density of <clears throat> uh, community activity center. So the context and the nuance of the existing built environment are really, really important here. And just, you know, with our business district, um, that's a big part of what makes the neighborhood special. Some of the images on the, the bottom left there, just, you know, the nice tree light streets. So you have everything from small original bungalows to much bigger McMansions now. And then the second picture in the lower left there is uh, some nicer quadplexes that were approved. We supported those um, several years ago. So we have, you know, a mixture of the single family stepping up just a little bit more moderate density and then on to, you know, even bigger density. Um, this one here, uh, again, kind of shows the Julian there with the white rooftop that the petitioner did. It's a very, very nice project that was well received several years ago. That's directly next to single family R5. The height of that is four stories, so roughly you know, 48 feet. Uh, we had many discussions over the years that the thing that was built on the other side of it was assumed to be bigger and taller. So it really just becomes like, where do you, where do you draw the line? Um, and as the petitioner mentioned earlier, one of the things that we all are very supportive of is this idea of um, you know, some potential green space there. It's, you know, what level, it, there haven't been you know, a lot of firm commitments and it's, there'd be a lot of players here, frankly. It's NCDOT land is a lot of that. So to be a more substantial community benefit, um, it would probably need to incorporate some of the NCDOT land. I know in Councilman Graham's district, there's been some really cool work going on to reclaim some of the space there. So that was encouraged to hear that NCDOT was receptive to that. So there may be, could be encouraging for um, some future work here. Uh, this image really, kind of gets into the context. This is a rooftop view from the heart of the Plaza Midwood business district. So as mentioned before, we, I mean, if you're familiar with this area, it is a lot of lower buildings right now. Um, and one of the earliest meetings that did come up that, you know, as an example, because a lot of people have just said like, what, what's 150 feet, you know? Uh, there's a cell phone tower there that is roughly 150 feet. And so if we move on to the next one, um, you know, at scale, this, this block on the left side of this image would roughly represent what that looks like in the context of, of the community at 150 feet, again, a half a block from single family residential. And as another good comparison, the, uh, in another very big and frankly transformative project that's going on in the community a little bit further away, but as on the Carlson Southeast project, uh, phase one there, uh, again, very, very dense, large project itself, but phase one there is only 100 feet. So much closer to single family residential, we're looking at 150, and so that's you know, one of the okay. big concerns. So you have about three and a half minutes left. And we'll pass, pass the mic on, thank you. Um, hi, my name is Tanya Wilson. I'm here to represent the Plaza Midwood Neighborhood Association. I'm not going to re reiterate anything that Alan has said. He's made really good points. Um, I just want to point out that we're here uh, in support of the Commonwealth neighborhood um, and their stance around the Levine property. Um, our goal certainly as a neighborhood to ensure that we continue to have growth and we evolve, but we want to do that in preserving and protecting um, the character and the environment that we have in our neighborhood. Um, we're concerned about the impact of the proposed development of Levine properties on the corner of Plaza and Commonwealth. Um, we agree that the neighborhood should continue to grow, but we also don't agree at the height that it's at. Um, again, we want to support Commonwealth um, with what they've said thus far. I think Alan has um, outlined the, um, the points uh, very well, and um, we'd just like to point out that we would like to reject that and encourage the council to say so. 
All right, Mr. Michael, you want to finish it up? Good evening, Mayor Lyles, Council Members. My name is Jason Michael, Executive Director of Plaza Midwood Merchants Association. I'm honored to be here representing our board and members comprised of 60 plus independent small businesses that serve our beloved surrounding communities and beyond. We are actively working with all involved in and affected by this petition and feel that all parties are working in good faith toward the best possible outcome for all stakeholders. But as the conversation currently stands, we cannot support approval at this time. As you know, we like many areas of Charlotte are navigating exponential growth and the many opportunities and challenges this growth brings especially to historically diverse multicultural working class communities like ours. In general, we absolutely want to work with anyone who sees the long-term value of sustainable, responsible, reparative growth with a yes in my backyard mentality when it comes to cultivating a thriving commercial and residential district that is accessible and desirable to the widest socioeconomic spectrum possible. Those individuals and organizations that add value by expanding inclusivity and opportunity by serving and connecting the wonderfully diverse communities that intersect in our neighborhood, not entities looking only to extract value, displace communities, and serve a very narrow socioeconomic demographic. It is imperative that anyone who wants to build or do business in our community understand this. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you. Mr. Brown, you have two minutes for a rebuttal. Thank you. Uh, and I'll say that obviously there's, uh, we're, we're not on the same page, but this has been a very, this is certainly not an adversarial discussion with the neighborhood. We expect these conversations will, uh, will continue. Uh, I would say as we talk about planning city and deal making city, the plan uh, is for this to be a community activity center. The maximum heights in the community activity center with bonuses are 120 feet at the lowest or 200 at the highest. Uh, so I don't think at 150, we're out of bounds of the plan. Uh, the, again, if you were to apply community ac activity center, the lowest flavor, uh, we would still be talking about 120 feet of height. Um, so I think that that is good context for the plan that you have adopted. There's a reason for that. Uh, if you look at the transit and mobility infrastructure that you have in place, this is the right location. Uh, I mentioned showing you a drawing. This is, this is Plaza Midwood, and this is the development we've seen over the last 10 years. It all looks the same. How many conversations have, have you heard and I heard of like, why does everything look the same? This is why everything looks the same, because uh, it's hard to get above that. And construction types, uh, when you're limited to that, um, the type of construction that you do in stick, once you go above that level, you move to glass and steel, a different construction type. And to do that, the economics of it, you've just got to go a bit taller to make it work. We think that gets a more sophisticated, higher quality building. Uh, we think that can bring a lot of amenities. And so we want to keep this conversation going uh, with the neighborhood. And I will point out, we just found this very interesting. Uh, we did find this plan. This was the Commonwealth project uh, developed in the center of the Commonwealth Park, probably approved about 18 years ago. Uh, and that had a building height of 145 feet. We talked with the neighbors. The neighbors said, yeah, that's really low, though. It's kind of in a valley, so it doesn't appear that high. Uh, but we thought it was pretty interesting that, uh, that the city council, you know, pre-transit, were talking at heights in the 150 realm. Uh, it did not develop like that. Thank you very much. All right, Ms. Anderson. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, Colin. First, thank you for working with the community. I know the community has had several meetings in uh, charrette designs um, to really work with the petitioner to ensure that whatever occurs on this property is in line with the, the charm, the look and feel and aesthetic of, <clears throat> of uh, Commonwealth Morningside as well as Plaza Midwood. I, I, I want, I, Dave, I would like for you to address this, the difference between CAC 1 versus CAC 2 and shed some light on um, the nuances between those two. The nuances are, are really mainly just one of, I would say there's use differences, but overall the main difference is going to be some of the height and intensity of the difference between those two uh, districts, as, as Mr. Brown alluded to, 
the CAC district has two tiers. One gets you up to potentially 120 feet in height. Uh, the other gets you up to 200. Again, that's all through kind of bonus provisions. Keep in mind, a lot of this area will stay as a neighborhood center because it's in the pet overlay, similar to what we talked about in, in Dilworth and Elizabeth. Uh, this one will convert to that neighborhood center automatically, which really only gets us up to that 65 to 80 foot range. So this request, even as a CAC one, again, it would be 80 to 120. CAC two is 120 to 200. The bonus tiers are, are you know, built in the same to get you beyond those those base heights to those max heights. So it's things, as mentioned earlier, about EV charging, affordable housing, uh, publicly accessible open space, et cetera. So those would be the same. Again, the big difference is just going to be the intensity and the size of the buildings. Uh, there may be some minor use uh, differences, but overall it's it's really that height difference. So, but when you talk about heights like 120 and 150, those are with bonuses, correct? Yeah, so the base height in CAC 1 is 80, the max height is 120, the base height in CAC 2 is 120, and then that goes up to 200 uh, as a max with bonuses. So I, I think there are a couple challenges with this project as it sits now and um, that it's reflective in, in the voice of the community coming out with having uh, Commonwealth Morningside neighborhood and be in opposition as well as the Plaza Midwood Merchants Association and the Neighborhood Association. So uh, when you're talking about a CAC that starts out uh, a place type that starts out with 80 um, feet and the proposed height for this building is will literally be 50% um, higher higher than the tallest building in that community now, um, which is the one that's being developed, um, Crosland Southeast, um, which caused great consternation for the neighborhood as well. And so to then go from a 100 foot building in this, in a neighborhood like Plaza Midwood that is mixed with bungalows and duplexes and a variety of of different housing types, um, it's it's a shock to the system there. Not only from a look and feel and aesthetic per, uh, perception, but an infrastructure percep uh, perspective, and um, and how the neighborhood comes together um, for uh, the walkability. So this, and I think that slide that was shown is to show you how tall 150 feet would actually look within these two neighborhoods, um, it, it really is out of, out of proportion on a variety of different levels. And I, I believe that what I've heard from the community is, you know, if there's an opportunity to, to get to a height with bonuses, then the community wants to have some insight into what do those bonuses really mean and how they would materialize. And so without any sort of level of clarity or even a, 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 a one a one level double click or specificity around what those bonuses would provide, that is create, creating a lot of consternation for the surrounding neighborhoods. And um, so I just want to be clear with that. I think staff was aligned with that recommendation as well. And the current state of what we see is incongruent with um, both neighborhoods, um, both from a residential and a commercial perspective. And I really love the history of the fire department credit union and having that history there within um, Plaza Midwood. Um, and within um, Commonwealth Warning side, but I think we have to also just be very clear about what a, an internal drive through, what that would create, and how that would even fit with aesthetically within the neighborhood. So, I have a couple of concerns here as it relates to height, as it relates to what, how those bonuses would materialize to um, substantiate placing a building here that is 50% higher than the tallest building in the community. And that's only within the last year to two years that um, you know this Crosland building has, has come about. Prior to that, we, you, you'd have to jump down significantly to get to a height level <laughs> for both of these neighborhoods that are historical neighborhoods within District 1. 
So I, I, I definitely want to hear, um, I, I, want, I want someone to come back with um, sharpening pencils around what will materialize for the neighborhood. Um, I also just want to call out that this space here, which is currently vacant and doesn't have any trips associated with it on a per day basis, will jump to zero trips per day effectively to um, a little less than 2,000. Um, 1,776 trips per day. And so that is a pretty significant push. And I think we also need to be mindful of the overall planning of how a, a vehicular movement within this area will match up and marry with the multimodal um, plans that we um, have right now that we're working on for this area. So. Those are my main concerns. I think the, the neighbors um, in both um, Commonwealth Morningside and Plaza Midwood, they, they have a positionality of, of wanting to say yes and working with developers. You know, they want to be neighborhoods that welcome everyone um, along the AMI level and embrace workforce housing. Um, but they also just want to have some understanding around what does, does this development or any other development, what would that look like and impact the community in the future? So, um, Colin, I don't know if you have, uh, I don't know if I've asked any questions that you have some answers to. I've got notes. Excellent. So we'll, um, we'll, we will continue to work with you and the neighbors uh, as we kind of refine our plan and staff and uh, hope we can get to a point where we've got at least a comfort level. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you. Ms. Watlington. Thank you. I've just got a real quick question. I'm thinking about the text amendment that staff submitted earlier in the evening and its conversation around centers and uh, drive-throughs as a secondary use. Can you talk a little bit about how, if that is approved, how this might impact this particular? It won't have any particular impact on this one because this would translate to that neighborhood center regardless. So okay. we'd be in that district that, that would, we wouldn't have that issue we talked about earlier with that text amendment. So it wouldn't have any impact on gotcha. this. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, Mayor Pro Tem. Um, uh, Mr. Brown, uh, can, do you know where the front door to uh, the credit union would be? Uh, I think the plan is that it would, it would be on the corner. It'd be kind of the, the view. Okay. Um, Mr. Petten, do, do you know if um, it would be a viable option to put a condition to provide um, maybe an on-street parking space close to the front door that would be limited to um, bank usage during bank hours? I mean, that's certainly something we can consider. I know things in the right of way like that. I guess CDOT, if there maybe need to be some coordination with them, but you know, certainly they can consider that and we can work through it with them. If that's an option, we'll certainly explore it. Uh, I don't have any initial concerns about it, but again, I'd have to make sure our colleagues in CDOT and others are, are good with something like that. So. I would like to explore that option to see if it's a possibility. Thank you. All right, Mr. Bakari. Thank you. A um, couple of things. One, it was uh, excellent to see the, the, the fire department credit union backstory and hear from you. Thank you. And I, I would just comment that um, this is not one of the normal drive through kind of scenarios we're in right now. Normally, this is very unique. And it sounds to me like there was some very creative uh, deal making behind the scenes in order to preserve something that's been around for a long time and doing good stuff. So. Uh, props to that. Um, you know, the UDO is, has given us a lot of great treats over the last couple of years, and we're seeing more tonight. And, and a couple of things I draw our attention to. One, uh, just one month ago, I was sitting here after the massive South Park redevelopment, and in this same scenario, staff cited what should have been N2 as community activity center and at 185 feet at its max supported that. So we're talking about, I mean, the, the, we, we've, we're gonna, and I don't blame you, you guys, obviously, it's just we don't have that rubric right now in order to provide consistency. So if that was N2 and we kind of halfway cited community activity center of why 185 feet at its center site was okay, I think looking at 150 feet 
and calling this CAC is something we have to absolutely understand uh, and get a little more consistent on. Um, the other thing I think will come as a huge shock, and I said this countless times over the last couple years that we were battling the, the nuts and bolts of the UDO, uh, was when the community finds out exactly how this is gonna roll out, and we're starting to see it tonight and in the last couple months, they won't realize it until the things are proposed that are by right and gonna happen. And all hell is gonna break loose after June 1st. I mean, it, then all of a sudden this by right stuff, we don't know exactly how it's gonna work is gonna happen. I think one thing that people are gonna realize very quickly, we've said it many times, is um, these, uh, these bonuses and these heights, uh, to my colleague's point a minute ago, yeah, people are gonna be frustrated when they realize there's no specificity and designing of that. It's a very simple uh, process by which if you understand how to put elect electric car charging ports and get some affordable housing or uh, the ver variety of pick lists of items that are there, it is very doable. So I think we need to consider 120 feet as the absolute baseline of what could be achieved even at its lowest level here and more likely 200, um, given that we don't have the specificity of that. So. Uh, it just as a gut reaction and hearing this for the first time right now, I think 150 uh, sounds pretty reasonable, but just understand these, these bonuses and these things, they're designed this way. They are not designed to be nimble in a community. They're designed very much to be uh, exploited by developers. And that's just how we designed it. And we fought and no one listened. So, um, so I think there's that. And then I think this is another a, a great, I love the history and the background of, of the Levine story and all of this. And I know him personally, and I know that there's no scenario this dude is looking at a part of land that is the origin story of his family and not deeply, deeply caring about that. Uh, so um, I look forward to seeing how this evolves over the next month, but also back to our infrastructure conversations. As we enter this next phase of planning for the next two years, we have to put the level of emphasis we put into the UDO discussion into the infrastructure investment uh, discussion as we get into the com community area planning process because we are woefully behind and we do not even know how far behind we are and that's the city's job so we've got to get that done miss johnson thank you madam mayor speaking of the city's job when the udo was approved and the uh, 2040 plan was approved we know that there was uh, minimal uh, uh, community input so one of the things that, and, and I know there was a lot of outreach, and we talked about this, there was a lot of outreach and touching the community, but as far as getting the community feedback and the changes. And like Council Member Bakari said, now the community's starting to see how that applies to them. Uh, we heard tonight about the height, the concern with the height. We heard it on this petition. We heard it a couple petitions before, the 037. We heard it last month with uh, Council Member Bakari's petition, and we've heard it some more. So I would ask this, the staff, or maybe Council, is that something that that should be revisited? If we if we hear from the public that this is not something that they want to see, maybe this is a policy that we should take a look at and revisit it. We were. Um, I, I would like to recommend that and, and, and perhaps if the council, if that's our desire to have that done, because when these concerns are brought up, and I've heard Mr. Brown say twice, um, the city has requested it. They're an the developers, when there's concern, that's the response. They're answering the, our call. So if our residents are saying this is not what they want now that they understand the impact of the 2040 plan and the UDA, <coughs> perhaps it, it's up to us as their representatives to take a look at this policy. So I would ask, um, if I can ask um, Allison, um, what would be that process? Is there opportunity uh, for revisions in these, uh, in these policies or provisions uh, to hear from the public if it's not um, what we're finding the public wants? Um, thank you, uh, Councilmember Johnson, for that question. So, I mean, we will continue to look at our policies and our regulations through the area planning process and the alignment rezoning process. We've already brought forward um, three amendments to the UDO tonight, so Council can make recommendations. Um, on this particular site, though, you know, keep in mind that we haven't determined at this point 
which one of those community activity center zoning designations would be appropriate for that, um, that site. And so that's part of the alignment rezoning process is that we meet with the community members and assess which one of those zoning districts is appropriate for that area. And it would probably be likely that it would be on the lower side. Um, so we're constantly uh, evaluating this. This is uh, intended, um, the 2040 plan, the comprehensive plan, the uh, unified development ordinance are all documents <coughs> that are setting forward a vision and values that we've heard from the community. And we did talk to a lot of um, community members during those, both of those um, initiatives, but we still have more planning ahead of us. And so there's an opportunity for residents to weigh in. Thank you. And I remember you saying that, you know, back then that this was, there would be opportunity to make changes. So I think this is um, an area, if we as council decide as we're, if this is an area we want, we want to take a look at, or maybe some type of survey, but we have heard from residents regarding the heights um, on numerous petitions. So I would just, again, say that to my colleagues, uh, maybe that's something we consider, should consider, instead of just, um, looking at these, these, you know, one by one, we, we need to take a look at our policies um, and perhaps make those changes. Thank you. Ms. Ashmira. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Well, some of my questions were already uh, asked. <laughs> um, certainly, uh, I appreciate the family history here, how the Levine family is very invested uh, in this area, it's very admirable, uh, and how they have worked yeah. and will continue to work with the community uh, and our neighborhood associations. Uh, you know, I was just looking at the site. Um, Plaza Midwood is just one of our most charming neighborhoods in our city, um, and it's got uh, unique. Uh, uh, very transitional space where you will see residential and then mixed use and commercial and retail. So, uh, I, and when I talk about this uh, sort of transitional space, um, we have yeah. we have a responsibility to ensure that we continue to maintain and preserve that charm and the character of the neighborhood that Ms. Anderson alluded to earlier. Um, and when I see drive-through, I understand this is gonna generate very less trips, especially because this will be used for our, uh, for, uh, this will be used for our uh, fire union, credit union. Um, but when we continue to make uh, deals such as those, what's the point of having a policy in place? And that's, um, and if we continue to make an exception such as that, um, then I, I often hear from our residents that we provided inputs along the way and uh, you're making an exception on a case-by-case -case basis. And that worries me because um, we just recently approved the UDO and uh, if you're gonna already make an exception to that policy, um, I see more exceptions coming down the pipe. Um, so for drive-through option that was um, what was proposed, is that limited to just that specific use? Or let's say if they decide to not use that space and it uh, would drive-through still be allowed? And that might be a question for Mr. Petten. Currently, the note is generally for the drive-through. The intention is to be for the Firefighters Credit Union. Uh, it could be narrowed to that. Okay. Uh, yeah, I, I worry what happens if the space is not, uh, or in future, if it does not get used by the credit union, what happens? So um, we gotta look at that. Because um, I, I think the, uh, if the drive-throughs are allowed on that site, um, I wonder if, if it would create an option for fast food drive-through. Uh, so we gotta look at that. Um, in terms of uh, height, I think this was already the point that was already addressed by Ms. Anderson, where we got, because of this um, 
transitional space, we got to be very sensitive to uh, shifts in intensity that really make, preserves the neighborhood character. But other than that, I'm, I mean, that's a lot, but <laughs> for, for less than one acre site. <laughs> that's all I have, thank you. All right, Mr. Driggs. Thank you, Mayor. Um, it looks to me like the staff is not recommending things that aren't consistent, perhaps uh, <laughs> taking a harder line on that, which I appreciate. I commend you for that. If there's any question of approving something that's not consistent with our plan, that's on us. Uh, and therefore, if you see an inconsistency, you don't recommend it. Uh, and, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not sure what your thinking was, but I'm just saying it to me, that's kind of how it should work. Uh, and if something comes to us that is inconsistent and we are tempted to pass it, then we need to think about uh, do we have to change the rule or why would we pass it? Uh, this meeting is intended to make a determination about whether or not a petition is in accordance with our rules. And we have to resist the temptation to debate the rules on this occasion. Uh, what we're here for right now is just to say, okay, we made these rules, and is this thing consistent with those rules or not? And if it looks as a result of that, as if the rules are not doing what we thought they were going to do or should do, then I think we have to have a separate policy conversation. So uh, I, I'm not happy with this. Uh, I, I think the objections to the height uh, make a lot of sense to me. And I think the logic that suggests that somehow this is consistent, even though it's not, doesn't really cut it. Um, but we're going to have a lot of these. I, I agree with Mr. Bakari. I think we're, we're headed into kind of a situation where uh, it, get, it becomes kind of arbitrary and case to case. Uh, but, but really the one thing I would like to stress is this meeting is not the time. So I, I just hope we can stick to the issue of looking at it, saying, okay, these are what our rules are. Is, does that conform to that? In this case, it doesn't. Uh, and let's try to live by those rules as best we can. Thank you. Mr. Driggs, do you have a motion to close the public hearing? I do. I absolutely second. do. We have a yeah. motion and a second. Any discussion? All in favor, raise your hands. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to turn this over to Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you very much. We'll move on to uh, agenda item number 37, rezoning petition 2022-109 by Urban Trends Real Estate Incorporated, located on approximately 2.09 acres on the northeast side of the plaza, south of Bridgeport Drive and west of Barrington Drive in Council District 5, Miss Molina's District. Can uh, we congratulate Mr. Levine on his casino project uptown as well? The current zoning is is B1 <laughs> neighborhood business and R4 single family residential. It's totally out of order. The proposed zoning is UR2 CD urban residential conditional. Uh, staff recommends approval of this petition upon resolution of outstanding issues related to transportation. Um, and environment. <clears throat> we do have uh, speakers in opposition from the community. So after staff's presentation, the petitioner will have 10 minutes. Thank you, Mr. Patton. All right, thank you. Yep, I guess it's on 2022-109. That's just over two acres at the end of Plainfield Drive, uh, just off Bridgeport Drive and the plaza. Uh, it is currently zoned R4, and we do have some B1 uh, existing on the site, that area in red. Uh, and the proposed zoning is UR2, which is urban residential conditional. Policy map does show this is neighborhood one. You can see some neighborhood two just to the uh, rear of the site as well as neighborhood center adjacent. Uh, the proposal is for up to 26 townhomes. That comes in just over 12 units per acre. Uh, does limit building height to 45 feet. Would extend Plainfield Drive uh, through the site to extend that uh, street and create an internal network of uh, alleys off of that to, for access to the proposed units along with some guest parking. Does provide an eight foot planning strip and eight foot sidewalk on the south side of Plainfield <clears throat> and along a portion of the north side of the proposed street. Uh, does propose architectural details as well as a 10 foot landscape area along the southeast and northeast property boundary to allow evergreen plantings and a screening fence. Uh, also proposes a 10 foot class C buffer along the western property line and does illustrate possible tree save areas and a post construction buffer. Uh, staff does recommend approval of this petition. Uh, we do have some outstanding issues to work through. Uh, as we looked at the map, it did show this as neighborhood one. We, this, this would be more akin to a neighborhood two project. 
However, given that proximity next to the neighborhood center and that neighborhood two adjacent, uh, we did feel it was a, a reasonable request for some infill in this area. Uh, and understand their concerns from uh, members of the community who have signed up as well. So uh, we all look forward to hearing from them and we will take any questions that you may have following their presentation as well as a presentation by the petitioner. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Chris Ogarundi and uh, Matt Langston, you have 10 minutes combined. Good evening. Mayor Pro Tem, members of the city council, members of the zoning committee. Um, my name is Chris Ogun Rinde. I'm with Urban Trends Real Estate Inc. Uh, thank you for uh, the opportunity to present this project to you. Um, we uh, filed this petition uh, sometime last year and uh, we had a public hearing that was scheduled for uh, February. And we've had to basically uh, postpone it a couple of times just so we can work out some uh, issues with the community as well as staff. And so tonight we kind of go through some of the um, outcome of those uh, conversations that we've had with staff. Next slide, please. Oh, okay, great. Um, so showing examples of some of the townhome projects that we've, we've been uh, involved in uh, within the Charlotte area, because this site is strictly about townhomes and uh, although we have some uh, uh, conversations that we've had with the community that's opposing this uh, product, but uh, uh, we'll kind of show, uh, take you through some of the uh, different ones that we've been involved. To the left is one in uh, Third Ward, uh, this, uh, this uh, uh, Fremont West area, Belmont, and there's uh, one uh, Swans Run Road uh, in South Charlotte. It shows different characters. It shows that we basically adapt our design to the communities that within which we work in. So we don't just bring cookie cutter type products to the neighborhood. So, uh, yeah. And then some of the other projects that we are currently involved in in the Charlotte area, affordable housing and, um, and such. Uh, the, pro the property, as it was mentioned by David earlier, is, it's, is unique in that it, it has two zoning classifications, R4 and B1. Uh, by right, if we were to develop as this, we could put in about 25 units there. Uh, we are proposing 26. So B1, can, uh, by right, you can do 22 units to the acre. We have about 0.88 acres there. That's about 19 units in R4. We have about one point some odd acres there, and we can do six. So combined, we could do 25 units. So uh, we probably will we'll have conversation about traffic uh, uh, in a few minutes, but we're really not increasing more than what we are currently allowed to build here. Uh, as was mentioned earlier, a little bit over two acres. This was our original plan. Uh, side yard, five feet. Uh, we're proposing 14.35 acres originally, uh, three-story townhomes, um, and um, a typical UR2 zoning requirements, uh, 14 foot from back of curb and all extending playing field through the site uh, for connectivity. Uh, 12, uh, initially, we, we were proposing 30 units, and uh, upon conversations with the community and, and staff, we, we uh, went to the next uh, slide, which is basically uh, providing additional buffers between our site and the community, uh, from five feet sides to 10 foot. Uh, the rear now has from 10 feet to about 20 feet, uh, which includes the buffer, I went from 30 units to 26 units. And, um, and so, uh, but the one thing that we were not able to do uh, in the conversations that we were trying to have with the community, we, we reached out many times to, to have additional conversations. We wanted to tour the community uh, around some of the projects that we, we've done so that it can at least get a feel of what, what they look like and how how they fit within the community that, that we are developing. But uh, the neighborhood didn't want to talk to us. Uh, we, we reached out on occasions. We actually spoke with one of the uh, neighborhood leaders. Uh, so the challenge is that the younger folks want townhomes like Noda, like Belmont. The, the older generation wants uh, the single family product. So 
we're always trying to find the happy medium and it's just as we're growing as a community we we, we tend to kind of uh, build what the market was we, we want and uh, so this this is what uh, some of the folks that uh, that wants to buy in this area are looking for uh, and then the neighborhood wants more retail which to get more retail you need more rooftops and uh, so those kind of things that uh, that kind of address those. Uh, Matt is here as a civil engineer. I think uh, he can address some of the engineering issues that uh, we, we faced in there. Thank you, Chris. Uh, good evening, Mayor Pro Tem. So this site is pretty heavily driven by the existing uh, road stub that we had to extend through the site, Plainfield Drive. There's also an existing sewer line that runs kind of near that dark green line that runs through the site. That's that's actually a stormwater channel that cuts through the site as well. So sort of the, the juicy center of the site was taken up by things that we couldn't control. And so it left us working to establish a fairly compact site plan in the in the remnant parcels and as Chris mentioned when we had initial neighborhood outreach um, part of the outgrowth of that was increasing the buffers on both sides of the property we reduced the unit count we also pushed tree save to the back edge up adjacent to the single family in order to provide more existing buffer um, I'm here to answer any other technical questions you may have thank you Any questions for us? Um, we'll save that till after we have some speakers in opposition and, and you'll have your rebuttal. All right, um, we do have four speakers who have signed up to speak in opposition. Uh, Penny Cothran, uh, William Pickens, Eric Carruthers, and James Brown. You have 10 minutes combined, um, so you can divide that um, on your own. I'm Penny Cothran. I am the owner of um, 6120 Bridgeport, which is um, right, right in the second house off of Plainfield. Um, we have been contacting Stormwater for over four years, trying to get sinkholes that are adjacent to my property and on the back side of my property, severe sinkholes um, fixed. Up until um, the Charlotte Observer had had a um, an article in the paper, they were not responsible. But then they researched it some more and found out they are responsible. Um, I do have pictures here of what I'm talking about, and they said it was going to take about a year and a half, from a year to a year and a half, to um, fix. Um, the issues, this is, is, if this petition goes through, this will compound severely what's going on. Um, I have not spoken to Mr. Arunde. Um He has asked to speak to the Neighborhood Association president. That he said that he wanted to talk to the community. He is not sent out a second community request. He wanted to talk to her personally and, and has not contacted anybody in the community other than her to resolve any issues. Um, I personally am against this petition, not only because of the stormwater issues, but because of the connectivity. They are only coming through our community. They should be coming through the other side to where it, I mean, if you look at 26 homes, you're looking at mainly two car homes. That's 54 cars, 54 more people coming down that one street and out toward Plaza through Bridgeport. That is a lot of traffic when you have kids in the community. My daughter has to walk 
three blocks to get to the school bus. I mean, it's just a lot on the community. I'll turn it over to you, Mr. Pickens. Members of City Council, uh, I'm Bill Pickens. I've lived in the Hampshire Hills community for 48 years. Uh, Charlotte, we have a problem. And the problem is water. Uh, if you look at your staff, um, you got these? Yeah. Look at the property. There's a stream in the middle of the property. Let me give you a little information about what needs to be required before you move the first ounce of dirt. You need a delineation. You need to contact the Corps of Engineers and the EPA. The recently passed and approved uh, Clean Water Act, Section 404, I will refer you to that, read it. This impacts clean water. It also impacts our community in terms of flooding. Let me show you what flows into that. What's shown as a, is shown as a, an outlet. Can you see it? This is an eight foot pipe that receives all of the water from the Hampshire Hills uh, shopping center and from the Fair Market Plaza uh, housing project as well as an additional pipe, which I don't know what it is, I couldn't identify, but it's on the site plan, their site plan. This stream is jurisdictional, meaning that you need permission from the U.S. Corps of Engineers and the state to do anything in terms of, of altering that stream, capping it, filling it in, doing anything. If you do that, the penalty is you pay a fine, and you're required to restore that stream to its original uh, 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 condition. Now, if you think I'm, 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 I'm just saying things that are off the top, read these, read these. This one says, is this a wetland jurisdictional? And it says, before you do anything, there's a thing to do. I have here instructions for preparing a permit for application, which they probably haven't done. They have not, not done a jurisdictional study. No, th this is a wetland. If you look at the pictures on your staff's um, handout on Plainfield Drive, you'll see huge oak trees that get plenty of water. You'll see vegetation that is aquatic. I suggest to you that there's an aquifer on the site because, it's, because of the stream. There is a documented well on the site. Now, that's in terms of the water. What Penn is talking about is there's been a blowout of the pipe further down the line. It has blown the pipe out and it has destroyed two properties. That water flows from that site all the way to Briar Creek. And if you look at that, Look at that drawing that your staff gave you. You'll see how far that water runs. I got four more minutes. Okay. Well, I will. I will say to you, at least require a a a uh, a study to show. And I got an application here in case they want it. An application to to, to get uh, to to prove that it is or is not a wetland. This property has been before city council on three different occasions, and it has been turned down two times. Uh, the reason they can't go, come off of their, their address, their address is 6001, the plaza. They can't get through there. So they're coming in off of Plainfield. Plainfield is a very short street, no longer than this, than this the distance of this, this room. And now you're talking about putting in alleyways, how is sanitation going to get in there with those trucks? There are a lot of problems with this property and with this plan. So I would urge you to, to either defer or to kill it. Thank you.
Mayor Pro Tem and members of the council, thank you for listening. Um, so I actually live on Plainfield. I'm two doors down from where, the, where this thing is going to be. Um, I understand it, uh, it, in terms of traffic, it, it doesn't seem like a big deal, but I can assure you it will be for me. Um, in terms, and I've seen what happens when we have, uh, when we have plaza shut down. Um, it just becomes uh, <laughs> just a blockage. It's, it's almost impossible because uh, Plainfield is so short. Um, when we go by Bridgeport, so uh, there's that's one thing. I, I will note that this is inconsistent. It's pointed out in the, at the beginning of the the staff's statement that it's inconsistent with their 2040 policy. Um, I'm I'm interested in what's going to happen with the connecting sidewalks because I don't see anything in the plan that deals with the rest of the street, right? So you've got sidewalks on the in, on the inside, but uh, what happens? I, I really don't I really don't know what's going to happen there. Um, he's absolutely right about permeability concerns. Um, this flooding happens pretty consistently. And, uh, and lastly, I will, I will point out that the, uh, the leaking groundwater contamination site, all right, so the environmental agency did recommend that there is additional study. And uh, I want to make sure you guys caught that in the, in the, in the environmental recommendations. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Ms. Ogarundi. Mr. Langston, you have two minutes for rebuttal. Thank you. I, I will speak to a couple of things and Matt can address the engineering uh, questions. Uh, as it relates to the blown pipe, um, I'm sure they made it clear that that's really not our fault. Uh, it's just something that's happening in the community and uh, um, we're going to design our site to make sure that we don't make it worse. Uh, we have underground detention and all of that. Um, in terms of setting up meetings with the neighborhood, we made attempts, several attempts, to actually set up a meeting. Actually, I called Mr. Pickens's uh, number, and I just nobody calls me back. And I try to go through the neighborhood president to help set up a meeting with. I think she had even suggested having a meeting with council uh, member, uh, council rep, and then the community and go on a tour. Never heard back. Uh, wetlands determination letter. We we do have that. And that's how we identified that the, the, the challenges that we're designing around that. And we will engineer around and making sure that uh, we protect the, the site and the community. Um, I had a conversation with city engineering last week and they advised us of the downstream uh, stormwater issue. We understand that there's a uh, repair project in design. And as Chris mentioned, you know, we're not allowed to increase the peak flow over what's coming off the site now. Uh, we'll be looking at additional opportunities to provide additional storm detention on our site beyond what, um, what we're required to provide. Uh, finally, I think if I may, uh, the one question I always have is, what would the community like to see beyond, besides just not doing anything? And we haven't had anybody to kind of tell us that. Uh, so I would like to learn more about that. Thank you very much. Um, Ms. Molina? You want me to go first? You might oh, want you to go, go last. Go first. Right. Yeah. Ms. Johnson. Yeah. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. Is there anyone from City Water here today? Water, like water, Charlotte Water, Water Sewer? Or? What, someone that can address the concerns? Uh, we do have uh, stormwater staff here with okay. us this evening. If we have specific questions for them, uh, we do have a representative from that group here with us. Okay. Thank you. I wanted to ask. A, I wanted to ask them to address the concern about the single pipe, and maybe elaborate uh, what the petitioner said. It's the, the, what I understood them to say. The problem's not their fault. So it seems that it's our fault or our problem. So I want to. And this is what I've been saying about infrastructure capacity. Um, 
since I've been on council. So this is why the neighbors are, many neighbors are opposed to uh, development because there are outstanding issues that need to be addressed. So I wanted to, if you could elaborate on what's going on over there. So uh, good evening, I'm Robbie Zink. I'm with, uh, I'm the city stormwater's uh, regulatory division manager. Um, as they mentioned, the site is currently under evaluation uh, by city stormwater staff for uh, possible future projects. Um, I think they did meet with them last week. Um, I'm mainly here to talk about the uh, actual development part and what those requirements are. Uh, if you want me to talk about how they could handle that and what that actually does. Uh, as Matt uh, alluded to, I did talk to him last week. Um, I would say the current site, it's possible to develop by right uh, and actually probably not trigger any post-construction stormwater or detention requirements. They could do it at a low density, uh, you know, re remove trees, build a couple small houses, they would probably be able to do that. Um, in regards to this development, it does trigger the post-construction stormwater ordinance, which would require, you know, detention and water quality on the site. So, um, I would I'd also say, you know, this is a two acre parcel, uh, as the resident uh, mentioned, that it, it drains the shopping center, and it drains the apartment complex to the north. In total, that's about 40, drink, uh, sorry, 40 acres draining to the site. Um, this is about two, so this is about a 5% of the overall property, overall drainage area that's, uh, this is impacting. So the impacts from this will be extremely minimal and uh, really in our opinion. You said there's a current project underway? It's currently being evaluated. We have our engineering staff within Stormwater has been in contact with them last week. Okay, and can you address the, the single pipe that, uh, that, that the resident showed, the single pipe, and they talked about the Clean Water EPA. Is there anything that we should know uh, regarding this area? The single pipe, I'm assuming, is draining the shopping center. Uh, so that they show the channel, channel that's draining through the site there. Um, I'm assuming that's probably where it drains through. It also picks up water from the north from the property complex, for the apartment complex, um, which drains through the site. Uh, so they will have to take that into account in their design of their, you know, their uh, driveway going over that creek. As they mentioned, I think they've already been in contact with the core of the state regarding stream disturbance permits. Uh, so those are things that are all required as a part of the development process and will be um, ensured that, you know, those are any requirements they have as a part of that will be complied with. Okay. And I understand requirements, but uh, is there something that, that, that could be done um, to improve the impact on, on the area that if it's done by the city or or the developer, and maybe we can talk offline because, you know, we, we keep hearing, I keep hearing, you know, it's not our problem and this is what the city requires. However, it's the neighbors that are left holding the bag for the, of the impact, which is why it was so important earlier when, I, when we had a petitioner in, in, in District 4 that, that brought schools and parks and, all, and traffic improvements. So we need developers to do more than what's required. So we, we can talk off, offline. As Matt alluded to, they are, are interested in looking at doing some extra things to uh, make sure this is not an issue. Good. Okay. Thank you. I have, um, there's a couple other people oh, you want to go last? No, or? no, no. Yeah. You let me go last. Um, I have uh, one question um, about Plainfield Drive. Um, and I know that there's a shopping center um, on the opposite end uh, of, of it. Would this be, that street be a, a stub or something like that? So if there is future development or redevelopment, it might be able to connect so that there is a connection made towards the plaza? That's correct. All right. Thank you. Um, Mr. Graham? Thank you, uh, um, Mayor Pro Tem. Um, I want to thank the, the residents and Chris for being with us today. Chris, you said by right you could develop um, that property without coming to the city? I was just saying density wise, half about half of this site is zone B one. Okay. 
uh, B1, you could do 22 units to the acre. We have 0.88 acres, and that's 19 units. R4, four units to the acre. We have about one point some odd acres and six units. So at both, we have 25 units. We're proposing 26. I'm just saying that we're not doing much more than what we can do right now. Now, the fact that we have two zoning makes it challenging to do that. So, uh, but we're not uh, increasing density by what we can actually do right now. I, I know, um, and I would strongly encourage um, communication right. on, mm -hmm. on both parties' side to sit down and really tr try to have a conversation. I know Council Member Molino mm -hmm. will, will strongly encourage that as well. Right. Um, I want to make sure that no matter the outcome, um, that uh, the developer, um, Mr. Ronge, um, has the opportunity to um, present his case fairly to the neighborhoods and for him to hear their concerns directly um, so that there won't be anything um, uh, lost in the message in terms of what can be done um, uh, and what should be done uh, and that um, no one feel that they're being taken advantage of. And um, I'm almost certain uh, that the district rep is going to ensure that happens. Um, I'll just pause to hear her comments and then I'll, I'll, I, I will have offline conversations um, with both parties um, before um, the, um, the next meeting and we'll follow uh, the lead of the, um, the district rep in terms of the work that she'll do within the next 30 days. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Molina. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor Pro Tem. Um, first of all, I want to I want to say thank you for the community coming out today. I am proud of y'all, um, and they're pretty accessible. I've talked to them so many times. Mr. Pickens, especially. I mean, I've Mr. Pickens. We had a a meeting with Econ uh, when last month. He walked right up to me. He had handouts. He had pictures. He was extremely verbal about his opposition to this particular project. And uh, as far as the members in the room, it was the same exact thing. So um, I actually, I just met with them when? Last week? I just talked to them. Yeah. Uh, last week as well. They're extremely accessible. Um, what, what bothers me every time I sit in this seat and we have a zoning conversation is when someone says, by right. Because what that says to the community that surrounds that project is that we could do whatever we want to and you can't do anything about it. And that's not being a good neighbor. And I know we're talking about rules and I know we're talking about what's, uh, what we've designed as far as a rule is concerned, but I, I think it's in, in good measure that business and community work together. And when the district rep, I tried to contact all these people um, and, and they won't answer me. And that, you know, they, 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 I heard they like five times, I think I counted. Um, and, and I would like to see, you know, if at all, not to discourage development because that's not the objective. I think the objective is, you know, from our perspective, we represent the people and we are, we, we are housed in a city building. So we are a conduit. The goal, if at all possible, is to come to an agreement where the community and the development community can have a happy medium, if that's possible, with and notwithstanding the rules that are currently in place. So I would strongly emphasize, as you know, my, my colleague has said, you know, we need some additional conversations in, to come to an agreement. Um, most concerning to me is the um, concerns that this neighborhood has raised. We're talking about a community that from the sentiment of what I've heard from them personally is a community that's feel that, and, and it's not your fault, this part, this is our fault. This is my fault as the, well, I wouldn't say fault, but this is my ownership as the district rep to make sure that we raise up the concerns that the community has brought forward. So what you're finding right now is that you're walking into a situation where you would like to build adjacent to a community that has felt traditionally ignored, that they've made, you know, um, 
their voices heard about water issues, about clean water, about a, a number of different items that I've, you know, gotten in contact with the community president. I've surrounded them with, you know, um, our staff that is going to help them through some of those, you know, areas of opportunity so that we can deal with our part of this issue. Um, but then also to know that as we develop through this process and this plan, that we also are bringing to them, you know, um, opportunities that are going to build growth and not make that that line between you know feeling included or being included in what you know growth looks like in this city and not right so um i, I challenge you and, I, and i'm extremely open to having a conversation with you and the community to see if there is possibly a middle ground to where you know it, it, it you know and again a lot of that falls in our responsibility area as you know city you know staff and leadership to say you know they they listed a number of different things you know concerns about water wetlands clean water you know backups i mean we have so many issues that would be something that we're going to have to have a conversation about and i know um david you and your team i I, I want to really understand because there was a lot brought up and I don't want to try to pretend to do your job here in saying um, um, what's existing and what's not, but can you give me a little insight about where we are with water at all? Could either one of you tell me what's going on over there with water? Like why are there so many concerns around water in Hampshire Hills? And I do recall there being, you know, a write up about this particular community where we actually had, you know, free media come out and, you know, surround their concerns and elevate them and lift them up. Are we not aware of what those were? From the stormwater perspective? Yes. Yes. Um, Another group within stormwater is or hasn't been investigating, have been uh, studying this area. Um, there, I think some work may have done been done a long time ago, but not on all the parcels. So there is a study to be done to hopefully evaluate and see about potential future projects, if um, possible, to help alleviate the issues here. Okay, because I, I would like to know more about that, you know, as we continue forward. I would like to know what, what, no matter what the outcome is with this particular project, I would like to see this community enveloped in a way that, you know, these types of concerns are actually taken serious, that we're saying to Hampshire Hills that we see you, that we hear you, that we are going to, you know, um, Dis, you know, dispatch our resources to make sure that you feel safe and, and healthy and, and heard in your community. I think that's really important here. And I think that's what, you know, even, you know, adjacent to this petition is, is what I'm continuing to hear from the community members that have taken the time to drive down here and show up or saying. Okay, we can do that. Um, and, you know, um, did, he, did he say your name was Chris? Chris. Chris. Uh, you know, District 5 overall, East Charlotte, um, one would argue, would say is not where we get a ton of development, right? I sit here most of the time and we don't get as much yet. I, I know that's going to change. Um, but, you know, in the interim, I, I just, like I said, I, I would love to encourage you to please reach out to me. I'll make sure that you have my contact information. I would like to talk to you. I would like to better understand where you're coming from, you know, because there, you know, if our rules are stating that you will have, you know, by right access, then I still inevitably have to be a conduit to what you can do by right, even if you do or don't do that with the help of the council in extending that and making sure that, you know, we can try to come to some sort of agreement in how we get there and how um, we facilitate a happy medium there. So I, I would like the opportunity to be able to do that with you. And if the community so chooses, I would like to incorporate them in that, you know, conversation so that, you know, we can discuss what's needed so that, you know, both parties, if possible, can come to an agreement. Sounds great. If I may just address what you said earlier. And when I said by right, not to sound arrogant about it, I was just pointing out the fact that the density it's going to be comparable to what can be done today versus what we're proposing to do, not to out of disrespect to council members or the community. So I just wanted to clear that. 
I, I appreciate that. And, you know, it's not just you. I mean, it's, it's really just, I, mean, I wasn't a member of the council when the 2040 plan and the UDO was approved, but it's something that I'm becoming adept at, you know, as time persists. And density is an inevitable truth of what Charlotte will be. Yeah. Um, and so that's not much that we're going to be able to do. Now it's our job as a governing body to monitor and control that as best as we can. Um, but I, I almost revert back to what my colleague, Mr. You know, Bakari said. It's, it's what I know. <laughs> um, it, it's really one of those things that's kind of going to hit us like thunder in, in just a few months where, you know, a lot of our community members are going to see things that they didn't realize was a reality with the approval of the 2040 and the UDO. So, um, like I said, I, I would, for the people who hired me to sit here, I would like to, you know, try to make that a comfortable transition and make sure also that they get what they need. Absolutely. Motion to close public hearing. Second. Any discussion on that motion? Hearing none, all in favor, please raise your hand. Thank you. That is uh, unanimous. Thank you. Uh, we'll move on to item number 38. Rezoning petition 2022-160 by Pendler Development LLC uh, for approximately 24.13 acres located along the south side of Mount Holly Road and the east side of Creston Circle, west of Interstate 485 in the ETJ. Um, it's in uh, County Commission District 2, Ms. Leake's District, is closest to City Council um, District 2, Mr. Graham's District. The current zoning is I-1, Light Industrial, Lake Wiley Protected Area, Lake Wiley Critical Area, B-2, General Business, Lake Wiley protect, Protected Area, Lake Wiley Critical Area, R3, um, uh, Single Family Residential, Lake Wiley Protected Area, Lake Wiley Critical Area. The proposed zoning is R12 MF, uh, Multifamily Residential Conditional, Lake Wiley Protected Area, Lake Wiley Critical Area. Staff does not recommend approval of this petition in its current form, so that means after staff's presentation, petitioner uh, will have 10 minutes. Mr. Pat. All right, and thank you. 2022-160. Uh, That's 24.13 acres on Mount Holly Road, um, just uh, at the intersection. <clears throat> excuse me, with Creston Circle. It is currently zoned I-1 and B-2, uh, as well as I think some R-3, uh, all with uh, Lake Wiley protected area uh, as an overlay on that. The proposed zoning is for R-12 multifamily conditional, uh, which would also then uh, maintain that Lake Wiley protected area as well. Uh, the policy map does recommend both <clears throat> neighborhood one and manufacturing and logistics back on that uh, far corner of the site. The proposal is for up to 288 multifamily residential dwelling units at a building height of 48 feet. Uh, it does commit to construct uh, multifamily structures to meet green building standard bronze specifications. Established as a 30 foot building and parking setback from the future right away of Mount Holly Road and the existing right away of Crescent Circle would contribute uh, up to $125,000 to the City of Charlotte Affordable Housing Trust Fund prior to the issuance of the last certificate of occupancy. Um, also would dedicate a significant portion of the site along Long Creek to Mecklenburg County for future greenway development. You can see that there on plan right in that green hatched area. Uh, would provide for a 50-foot Class C buffer when adjacent to single-family zoning. Would also commit to install an ADA-compliant CATS bus waiting pad on Mount Holly Road would also provide a minimum of 8,000 square feet of improved open space, and then propose a number of transportation improvements, including several turn lanes, as well as a 12-foot multi-use path along Mount Holly Road, uh, along the frontage of their site, uh, and also the improvement of Creston Circle uh, to enhance that with pedestrian infrastructure. As mentioned, staff does not recommend approval of this petition in its current form. Uh, we would like to, uh, the petitioner to consider a reduction in unit count and development outcomes that better align with the neighborhood one place type, so some different building forms perhaps with uh, duplexes, triplexes, perhaps even quadruplexes in some areas. I uh, feel like that would at least get us a little bit uh, closer to that neighborhood one place type while maybe allowing some moderate density, uh, but just a, a straight multifamily project in this area was something that staff didn't find a, a context or policy support for, uh, and that's why we have our, our concerns and our recommendation as is. Uh, it is inconsistent with the policy map recommendation for the neighborhood one and the manufacturing logistics place type. Um, we'll be happy to take any questions following uh, the petitioner's presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. McVeigh. You have 10 minutes. 
Uh, good evening, Mayor Pro Tem, members of council, members of the Zoning Committee, Keith McVeigh with Morvan Allen. Uh, we're assisting the petitioner Pendler Development with this request. With me tonight, representing the petitioner is Will McGuire and Brian Metzler. Uh, they're available to answer questions, as well as Thomas Hapapura with Design Resource Group, our, our the civil engineer for the site. Uh, also with us tonight, uh, we have some of the neighbors from Creston Circle in Brenton. Uh, we had, uh, with their help, we had an additional meeting with the residents on uh, adjacent to this site, uh, met, uh, met on the site, discussed the petition, and they're here to speak for the petition. Just a little bit about Pendler. Uh, Pendler is a full-service real estate company based in Atlanta, providing services in acquisition, development, and asset management. As Dave mentioned, this is just slightly under 24 acres located on Mount Holly, uh, on Mount Holly Road between Mount Holly Huntersville Road and I-45 in very close proximity to an existing retail shopping center, good access to Cat's Bus Route Number 18, which then provides uh, transit service to employment centers near the area, both the Corning headquarters on Highway 16, uh, transit service to employment uses on Mount Holly, Brookshire, as well as downtown. Uh, there is, uh, as Dave mentioned, one of the things we looked at here the, in terms of existing zone, we do have a combination of industrial here and here. There's MX3 that was part of the original Whitewater rezoning and was contemplated and is actually zoned for additional non-residential development. And then there's existing B2 along the site's frontage on Mount Holly. We are inconsistent with the 2040 policy map. Uh, and this is, we think, a unique location where N2 place policy map or N2 place type could be considered. Uh, a lot of, and to some degree, what the policy map does not recognize is that there is existing non-residential surrounding us both on Mount Holly and behind us that stays in place. We'll transition to ML1 and commercial, general commercial zoning district. Uh, our request also has the following benefits in terms of a housing trust fund contribution, uh, a, a bronze building standard in terms of building, uh, building commitment to design to a, a green building commitment, EV parking, uh, enhanced EV parking <coughs> standards, as well as, dedi as dedication over eight acres to the county, which is about 36% of the site. Uh, there's a number of goals of the 2040 plan this site meets, mainly because of its proximity to both the existing shopping center, access to transit, access to the future greenway, the commitment to a, a large component of open space, uh, and the housing trust fund contribution, the contribution to the county for a green, for like I mentioned, the greenway, a multi-use path along, along Mount Holly as well. One thing I'd like to point out, I, I know we're inconsistent with the 2040 plan, but if you look back at the small area plan that was done for this site and approved in 2010, it specifically looked at the unique circumstances that occurred in this particular area along Mount Holly, between Mount Holly Huntersville and the railroad track and, and the I-45. It recommended that if parcels could be assembled, and in this case, up to eight parcels are being assembled, that up residential density is up to 12 units to the acre. So prior to the adoption of the 2040 plan, this request would have been consistent with the area plans for the site. And the 20, our, our point here is the Catawba area plan, because it focused on a smaller geography, could focus on the unique circumstances in this area and make a more nuanced recommendation in terms of land use where a slightly higher density could be appropriate. As Dave mentioned, our height is limited to 48 feet. That's consistent with N1 place type. It's a residential use, and there are additional properties around us that can also make a transition to a lower density as those develop. Proposed site plan has a new network street that connects Mount Holly to, Mount, to Creston. will improve Creston with a wider roadway, sidewalks, planting strips, multi-use path, as I mentioned, along Mount Holly a large donation to the park for the Long Creek Greenway. Long Creek Greenway, when it's built out, will provide this site access to the, to the river and Whitewater Center, as well as all the way back to North Lake Mall through the, through the Greenway system. There are a, 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 a good number of roadway improvements, two left turn lanes, one for the site and one to existing Creston to help the other property owners uh, within the area to access their, their, their homes. Uh, as well as right turn lane multi and a multi-use path, as well as a 
left turn lane to access the property on the other side of the of, of Mount Holly Road. Mm -hmm. uh, some pictures of, of or some images of what we believe will, will actually occur here in terms of buildings, some developments in other parts of the southeast that Fenler has done. The quality here would be similar to these to these developments. And that's where I am in terms of our presentation. We're happy to answer questions. Thank you very much. Um, any, oh, you have anybody else from you? Yeah, you still have about four minutes and 45 seconds if you want to use it. Oh, take your time. Take your time. Thank you. Yes. Good evening, and thank you for allowing me to be here to speak in front of you, Mayor Pro Tem and the Council. I thank you again for letting us be here as the community. My name is Sheila Clark, and my husband is Keenan Clark, and he's sitting up there. And uh, thank you again for allowing me to come to speak to this beautiful, on this beautiful Carolina day. I am a government center pioneer. I was here when this building opened. I worked for Department of Transportation. I worked for um, Bill Finger. So um, I still have my little commemorative, commemorative coffee mug that they gave us. And it's nice to be back in this beautiful building again. I was a traffic surveyor for Bill Finger for the planning division for Charlotte's Department of Transportation. For about 10 years, I gathered traffic information so that this small town city could grow into this beautiful large city that we now live in. Then I went to barber school and I became a barber and I worked that for 25 years. My husband retired from the city of Charlotte from the Charlotte Mecklenburg Utility Department where he worked under Barry Gullett at the Catawba River Pumping Station on Mount Lanao Lake for 30 years. He also retired from the North Carolina Army National Guard after 23 years in the service battery. He was born at Presbyterian, Maine downtown 66 years ago. He attended Harding High School. We have been married for almost 42 years, or as he would say, <laughs> That's 294 years in dog years. <laughs> <laughs> so, we live on Creston Circle, at 419 Creston Circle, and we're adjacent to the property up for rezoning. We've always lived in Mecklenburg County. We lived over by the Whitewater Center, and then we sold our home of 35 years, and we moved to Creston Circle for the obvious reason. <laughs> we all have watched Charlotte grow from a very small town, city, with all the banking and the airport expansion, with Amazon and the Panther Stadium, the Whitewater Center, and 485. And now with the Greenway coming about, we all knew this was coming one day. Some were happy and some were not. But in the name of progress and in neighborhood enhancement, our little secret has been found. As we welcomed all the many neighbors for over the past 20 plus years, our little neck of the woods is up to bat now. We welcome all of the new neighbors. So with that, we are here in support of this rezoning process. I truly hope you all will consider passing this petition and thank you again the residents of Overhill Acres. Thank y'all again. Thank you uh, very much. Um, 
Council, is there any questions or comments? Mr. Graham. Uh, I just want to thank Ms. Clark and her husband for uh, being here tonight and representing the adjoining uh, neighborhood um, and uh, the petitioner for uh, laying it out. Um, I certainly will take it under advisement and um, see you next month. Thank you, sir. Yes, thank you. Second. We have a motion to close that's been properly second. Any comments or questions about the motion? Seeing none, all in favor, please raise your hand. Congratulations on 42 years. Thank you. The opposed, uh, that's unanimous. The, the hearing is closed. We'll move on to item number 39, um, uh, uh, rezone of petition 2022-089 by Taylor Morrison, located on approximately 43.72 acres um, on the south side of Mount Holly, Hunterville Road, um, and no the north side of Interstate 485 west of Oakdale Road in the ETJ in the County Commission 1, Ms. Powell's District, and closest to City Council District 4, Ms. Johnson's District. The current zoning is R3, single family residential Lake Wiley protected area, and the proposed zoning is mixed use innovative Lake Wiley protected area. Staff recommends approval of this petition upon resolution of outstanding issues related to transportation. We have no speakers in opposition, so uh, the petition We'll have three minutes once the staff's presentation is done. Uh, thank you. 2022-089, uh, it's just over 43 and a half acres uh, off Mount Holly Huntersville Road in Oakdale, uh, just there off of East uh, I-485. The zoning is R3. Uh, the proposed zoning is for MX2 Innovative. Both maintain the Lake Wiley protected area overlay. Uh, it is currently recommended for neighborhood one. You can see some neighborhood two, uh, really just somewhat adjacent, just a, a parcel removed. That driveway for the uh, utility substation separates that, and you do have some neighborhood two uh, to the south on the other side of the highway, and then also to the west, uh, just off of Oakdale Road, where we have a petition uh, for up for consideration later this evening. Uh, this proposal for 2022-089 uh, would allow up to 313 single-family detached. Uh, essentially, duplexes and triplexes uh, are the units that are being proposed. So uh, building form-wise, uh, they, they do match up with neighborhood one. Design-wise, uh, it's more akin to a planned multifamily project because uh, the units are not on their own individual lots uh, or on, uh, they don't all front a public street uh, as well. So uh, neighborhood one in, in building form, but neighborhood two in site design. So that's where we'll talk a little bit about that inconsistency uh, as we get to to the next slide, but continuing on this one, uh, we do have an eight-foot planning strip and 12-foot sidewalk being proposed along Mount Holly Huntersville Road. Uh, would provide an amenity corridor, which would include three things, uh, such as covered pavilions or benches, picnic tables, uh, fitness facility, gathering room, pool, uh, garden, dog park, etc. Uh, does provide walkways, which would connect all residential entrances to sidewalks along public and private streets. It provides an easement over the amenity corridor for public access. That would be coordinated with Mecklenburg County Park and Rec. Uh, also would provide architectural standards to include building materials. Innovative standards are all uh, programmed into the project to allow this type of uh, product. Uh, so that would be things like not not having, uh, or excuse me, internal private streets would have public access easements. There'd be no minimum lot size or width. Individual units would not be required to have frontage on a public or private street, but would comply with uh, the 400 foot rule, reduction of setback from 14 feet uh, at back of curb. All yards and setbacks would be provided for the overall parcel and not provided uh, or applied to each individual unit. And also building separation internal to the site would be a minimum of 10 feet. Uh, as we discussed, staff does recommend approval of this petition. We do have some outstanding issues related to transportation. Uh, we do have that inconsistency with the neighborhood one place type. Again, building form of duplexes and triplexes are uh, found within the neighborhood one place type, uh, but they are rec required to be on their own individual lots. Uh, this is essentially one large lot for the project area with all the units uh, functioning on, on that large parent lot uh, and not on their own individual ones. So that's really what makes some of those differentiations to more of a neighborhood too and, and generate some of that inconsistency. So uh, with that, I'll turn it over to the petitioner team and we'll take any questions you may have following their presentation. Thank you. Mr. Brown, you have three minutes. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem, Colin Brown on behalf of the petitioner, Taylor Morrison. Uh, the Taylor Morrison team has been in front of you several times this year, um, working on some projects, bringing this new kind of missing middle housing to the market um, and uh, are, are doing their best uh, to adapt their product to what our ordinances is, are calling for. So on this site uh, on Oakdale, as Dave mentioned, um, again, great access, 485 here, here's the interstate. We've got a Duke substation uh, at, that that, at this location. Um, 
what, what I think is important is the neighborhood one uh, zoning district uh, calls for single family, duplex, and triplex units. So uh, Taylor Morrison has been trying to adapt their plan to do that. Uh, this plan now has only single family, duplex, and triplex units. Um, what is a little bit different is again, kind of the design and layout of that. Um, these are for rent products. And what Taylor Morrison is trying to do, they're not trying to commit, com um, compete with single family. Uh, rather, this is to give folks that would otherwise be in an apartment community kind of a different living style, one level living, uh, having a yard, having open space, having those amenities. Uh, so we very much tried to tailor it into what would be in the surrounding uh, N1 with, this, there you can see the percentages, uh, almost 20% single family homes, 37% uh, duplexes, and then 45% triplexes. And all, of course, all the triplexes uh, to the interior of the site with the single family and duplexes around the edges. So I think they've been pretty innovative in their design. This is just a concept to show you how this kind of hugs up on 485. There's the Duke substation. Um, and again, great access to 485. Um, I think you've probably seen these in prior hearings. This is how the product type works. Um, so that there are, again, this is for folks that are, are not home buyers, but don't want to be in a traditional apartment. They want to have an outdoor area. They may have pets. Um, they may be families. So it gives them a little more room. Um, happy to take any questions you have. Pleased to have staff support. Uh, we wish we were completely consistent within one, uh, as we think we're, we're meeting the spirit with a du uh, single family duplex and triplex product. Thank you very much. Any questions or comments from the council? Move to close. Second. I hear a motion that's been made and probably second. Any discussion on that? All in favor, close the public hearing. Please raise your hand. Any opposed? Hearing none. That is unanimous. No. No, I'm sorry. Uh, you have to sign up before. I'm signed up to speak on another position, but this is a whole You can. You have to sign up um, per, uh, per for each petition, but you can certainly um, send questions into the clerk, and those can get to um, the council at a different time. I'll right, move on to item number 40, rezoning petition 2022-090 by Harrison Rocky LLC, located on approximately 4.2 acres on the east side of WT West WT Harris Boulevard, north of Interstate 485 and south of Mount Holly Huntersville Road in Council District 4, Ms. Johnson's District. The current zoning is R17, multifamily residential conditional, and the proposed zoning is R22, multifamily residential conditional. Staff recommends approval of this petition upon resolution of outstanding issues related to transportation and site and building design. Um, there are no speakers against this, so after the staff's presentation, Mr. Ferguson, you'll have three minutes. All right, thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. 2022 4.2 acres on Harris Boulevard, just off I-485. Uh, existing zoning is R17MF, conditional. Proposed zoning is R22MF, uh, also a conditional district. Adopted place type on the policy map does recommend neighborhood two, so this petition would be consistent uh, with that. The proposal is for up to 92 multifamily residential units uh, that would be together with any accessory uses allowed in the R22MF zoning district. Building height is limited to 50 feet. A 28-foot Class C buffer along the north and east property lines has been proposed. Uh, it also illustrates an amenity, common open space area. Uh, open space would be improved with landscaping, seating, hardscape elements, and shade structures. Uh, design standards related to primary building material. Uh, facade orientations, blank wall limitations, uh, architectural base features and parking lot placement standards have been incorporated into the project. It uh, does provide right in, right, out, right in, right out access from uh, West WT Harris Boulevard and also provides a right turn lane at the entrance with 100 feet of storage. does commit to a 12-foot multi-use path and 8-foot planning strip along West WT Harris Boulevard. Just to uh, touch on this last slide very quickly, and the petitioner will allude to this as well. This petition, or this property had already uh, been through the rezoning process, uh, I believe about two years ago, if that, uh, for a project to, that went to that R17 district. That was primarily focused on senior living, uh, and that project, from what I understand, is, is not valid at this point, so the petitioner is coming back with this proposal, uh, which would add some units, um, nothing significantly substantial, but it does take it up to that uh, R22 category, uh, but I'm sure they'll get a little bit more background, but just wanted to give you a little bit of a high-level overview from from staff on, on this one, if it looks familiar to, to some of y'all that may have been on when this was uh, through the process once before. Uh, as mentioned, staff does recommend approval of this petition to have outstanding issues related to transportation and site and building design to work through. It is consistent with the 2040 policy map recommendation, and we will take any questions you may have for staff uh, following the petitioner's presentation. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Mr. Ferguson. You have three minutes. Thank you. Uh, good evening, Mayor Pro Tem, Council, Zoning Committee. Uh, I think Dave highlighted a lot of uh, what I was going to go through here, so I'll try, I'll try to be quick as soon as we get in there. Um, so this is a slight increase in the density of this project. It was already zoned for multifamily in 2020, and I think you guys, the question is, well, why come back to rezoning it? That was a prior petitioner that was working with a tax credit-based uh, age-restricted housing program. The underwriting and the requirements underneath that program changed to not allow that development to happen in this close proximity to 485, so they weren't able to move forward. That's my understanding of it from, from the brokers and, and the property owner. Uh, so my clients uh, have, have come here with this petition to seek a slight increase in the density, but tried to keep the spirit of that rezoning alive with a buffer. Um, it's a little bit of the location there. As Dave mentioned, it's cross street from business properties from a QT, and it's right up against the off ramp from I-45 on WT Harris. Um, as an overview, uh, or address that, 21 additional units, keeping the same height, same mass. Uh, some of what changes is internal because of the size of hallways and bathrooms in an age-restricted unit, so it's similar in scope to what that is. Retains a 30-foot uh, undisturbed tree buffer around the outside of this between single family and this project. Uh, that was already there. We have a 12-foot uh, multimodal path, a large sidewalk across the front, improving the streetscape, taking it all the way down to the corner across from the QT, and it's also, as for this size of a project, substantial road work to add a deceleration lane, a right turn, right only with a very deep median. Um, and I'm gonna come back to that in a second, but the, uh, it, it meets the policy guidelines of the city. It matches the 2040 plan for, for neighborhood two here. Uh, we worked with planning staff prior to submitting this to try to find the right fit, uh, to find something that would be appropriate. We have uh, reached out to the neighbors and had our community meetings. And we, did, uh, we didn't make a significant change after meeting with the neighbors. Uh, one more point, there's that triangle up to the north is, is a food line, so it's about 0.2 miles from a grocery store, uh, it's target down to the south of 45, so in both directions, and North Lake's over there. Uh, this is what the current entitlement is. Uh, it was a 2019, it got approved at the end of 2020 um, unanimously and, and had a lot of support for it. What we did was keep the similar mass of the building, uh, but after talking to the neighbors and talking to NCDOT and CDOT, we changed the orientation to bring the building forward. Um, Everybody likes it. I think it's great for a lot of great reasons because it brings the building forward to the street. It interfaces better with the street. It brings the building further away from the adjacent single family. We're still able to keep all of the buffers, the uh, undisturbed tree buffers. And, th and these are these are big trees out there. I think in the last position, they had a, a lateral view of it showing the height of those trees in relation to the building, which at that point was much closer to the single family. And we've had some contact with neighbors on both sides of the street. Um, thank you. I'll, Take your Thank you very questions. much. Um, any questions or comments from the council? Move close. Second. There's a motion to uh, close public hearing. That's been properly second. Any comments? Hearing none, all in favor of that motion, please raise your hand. Any opposed? That uh, is unanimous. Close public hearing. We'll move on to item number 41, rezoning petition 2022-126 by Tribute Companies Incorporated, located on approximately 48.09 acres on the south on south of North Tryon Street and east of Tre Trevi Village Boulevard and north of University City Boulevard in Council District 4, Ms. Johnson's District. The current zoning is R3 single family residential and the proposed zoning is R8 multifamily residential conditional. Staff recommends approval of this petition upon resolution of outstanding issues related to transportation and site and building design. There are no speakers in opposition, so after staff's presentation, Ms. Brown, you will have three minutes to organize your speakers. All right, thank you. 2022-126, just over 48 acres. Uh, it is off of North Tryon Street, east of Trevi Village Boulevard, north of University City Boulevard. Uh, this next slide here gives you a little bit more context. It's uh, just there, like I said, off of uh, 29, uh, just really at the Cabarrus County line. Uh, just this petition is zoned, excuse me, R3. To propose zoning is for R8 multifamily conditional. Uh, the adopted place type does call for neighborhood one in this area. You do have some commercial uh, just there off Trevi Village Boulevard, which is a larger mixed use project with office, retail, residential. <clears throat> uh, this proposal is uh, up to 285 single family attached townhome units. 
uh, does have an existing 93 foot wide overhead power transmission uh, across the portion of the rezoning site. You can see that just along the bottom, uh, right, at, right just about where the neighborhood park label is. Uh, does propose architectural standards for the buildings as well as a 50 foot Class C buffer uh, along a portion of the north property line and along east, south, and west property lines, essentially all that area ringed in green. Uh, does illustrate a 100 foot stream buffer and possible tree save areas. Uh, would illustrate an approximate six and a half acre neighborhood park in the lower portion of the site that would be dedicated and conveyed to Mecklenburg County Park and Rec. Uh, illustrates a 12 foot multi-use path running along the southern portion of the site connecting sidewalk along opposite sides of proposed public street C. Uh, also prior to permitting, coordination will be made with the city of Charlotte and Mecklenburg County uh, to accommodate a future segment of the Cross Charlotte Trail so through the southern portion of the property as needed. Uh, also, uh, following transportation improvements have been proposed. Ingress and egress would be connection to a proposed street uh, that would match up with uh, just a, a project just to the north of this that was recently rezoned, I believe back in 2021, is petition 2021-150. Uh, so where you see that top red arrow, that connects through a project that was already approved and is in permitting. Uh, that would connect the street network all the way back up to uh, 29. Uh, and that project was for uh, all multifamily apartments, so this would essentially be a phase two at a lower density uh, from that project that was already approved. So providing some of that transition back from the multifamily that's under construction back to uh, some lower density townhomes at this portion of the site. Uh, does propose an internal network of public streets uh, as well as uh, pr uh, proposed road stubs for future connections. You can see those in the two arrows pointing uh, left and right on each side of the plan. Uh, and also proposes to complete improvements as outlined uh, in the improved traffic study uh, through coordination with CDOT and NCDOT at the intersection of North Tryon and Moorhead Road and at the intersection of North Tryon and the site's access. So staff does recommend approval of this petition. <clears throat> Excuse me, we do have some outstanding issues uh, with transportation and site building design that need to be worked through. Uh, while it is inconsistent with that policy map recommendation, as we talked about earlier, do feel like it provides a, a reasonable transition from the multifamily that was approved uh, back through 2021-150. Uh, really doesn't have a lot of uh, single family adjacencies. Uh, I believe this may also be part of some projects that straddle both uh, Mecklenburg and Cabarrus counties, uh, but petitioner can certainly allude to some of that. So we'll be happy to take any questions uh, following their presentation. Thank you. Hey, Mr. Brown. Thank yep. you, Mayor Pro Tem, Colin Brown on behalf of the petitioner. Uh, the Tribute Companies, the Tribute Companies, uh, Mark Maynard is here with me. Uh, there's also uh, the group doing the 180 acre petition that we talked about first tonight. Uh, so familiar with some of the issues in the area. Um, as Dave mentioned, this is literally on the Cabarrus County line. So this will be maybe one instance where Mecklenburg County is providing some bedroom communities for folks that are actually going to Concord for employment rather than vice versa as we usually see. Uh, there we are, county line. And as Dave mentioned, uh, Tribute uh, Rezoned is in the process of developing this parcel right off 29. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I'll right there. So this, uh, as Dave mentioned, would be kind of a phase two. Of course, in Tribute's first petition tonight, we talked about a school site, parks, transportation. Uh, the site does not include a school, uh, but it does include a significant park dedication, uh, provisions for the Cross Charlotte Trail, and transportation improvements. Um, this is a look at, this is kind of phase one, and it would connect to kind of the phase two here, as Dave mentioned, uh, townhome products, commitment to a six and a half acre neighborhood park, and then a 12 foot multi-use path to accommodate the segment of the Cross Charlotte Trail, um, as well as these transportation improvements, which Dave highlighted. Here's a color rendering of the site, so you can see what a significant portion of the site remains undisturbed. You can see the park area and then the kind of rendered out trail network. Uh, we did not have attendees at the community meeting. Councilmember Johnson has connected us with the folks in the settlement neighborhood who we've been in communication with. Uh, we were, have been, they've had some trouble scheduling, but we expect that we will meet with them between now and the approval. Uh, that's all I have. Happy to take questions. Thank you very much, Ms. Johnson. Um, yes, this is one where I do want to continue to be engaged and, and find out what the residents, you know, the feedback from the residents. Okay. But right now I appreciate all of the amenities that um, the, develop, the developers. And, and we tried to meet with them before, yeah, but they had, yeah, okay. Yeah. So, so we will continue. Okay. Um, have you met with university city partners on this one? We, this is beyond the scope for them. We, we kind of show them everything we've gotten literally on the edge of, of Cabarrus County. So we, we've showed it to them. They had no comments as it's so far afield. 
Motion to close then. Second. Second. Um, any uh, comments on the motion has been made? Probably second. Hearing none, all in favor, please raise your hand. Any opposition? Seeing none. Uh, uh, that motion, that uh, petition is closed. We will move on to item number 42. Uh, rezoning petition 2022-130 by Thomas Elrod on approximately 1.04 acres at the northwest intersection of Karma Road and Little Avenue north of Pineville Matthews Road and east of Johnston Road in Council District 6, Mr. Bakari's District. The current zoning is general business conditional, B1, and the proposed zoning is 01 office conditional. Staff recommends approval of this petition upon resolution of outstanding issues and technical religion, uh, revisions related to site and building design and transportation. There are no speakers um, in opposition, so after staff's presentation, Mr. Carmichael, you have three minutes. All right, thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. 2022-130, just over an acre at Carmel Road uh, in Little Avenue. It's currently zoned B1 conditional. Proposed zoning is for O1 conditional. Uh, it is in a community activity center place type, so the petition request would be uh, generally consistent with that. Uh, does propose up to uh, 17,200 17, square foot building with a maximum height uh, that would be built to ordinance standards. Uh, however, uh, they did limit uh, the building height to two stories uh, and 22 feet. Uh, would allow all uses in the 01 zoning district, which does, inc does include offices, uh, does remove the existing driveways on Little Ave and Carmel Road, and does install one new driveway on Carmel. Uh, so that would just uh, reduce those points of ingress and egress down to one. Would construct an eight foot planting strip and 12 foot multi use path along the frontage. You can see that in that bold uh, maroon stripe there along the frontage. Uh, provides architectural standards related to building placement and design such that buildings will be presented uh, to be placed to present a front or side to all streets uh, and also notes that sidewalk along Carmel may meander uh, to preserve some of the existing trees that are out there on the site. Uh, we do recommend approval of this petition. It has some outstanding issues and technical revisions to clean up. Uh, it is consistent with the policy map recommendation uh, for Community Activity Center. We'll be happy to take any questions following the petitioner's presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Carmichael. You have uh, three minutes. Thank you, Mr. Mayor Pro Tem, members of council and the zoning committee. I'm John Carmichael here on behalf of the applicant, Thomas Elrod. Uh, Thomas is with me tonight, as, as is uh, Jennifer McAdams with American Engineering. And Mr. Petten did a good job going through the proposal. I'll be really brief. Uh, the site's on Carmel Road at Little Avenue, contains a little over an acre. Um, it's zoned B1CD, the conditional rezoning plan. Uh, limits the size of the building to 3,500 square feet, and I, and I believe to a, a restaurant use, but the, the site is surrounded by office zoning, except you've got some mud oak to the south. And the request, as Mr. Petten stated, is to rezone the site to O1CD to allow uh, a two-story office building on the site that will contain up to 17,200 square feet of gross floor area. The site plan has changed a little bit, and, and once again, it is consistent with the community activity center place type. Um, the office building's changed a little bit. This is the new plan that will turn in on Thursday. Uh, but other than that, it's, it's, it's just the shape of the building's changed. It's not linear along Little Avenue anymore, but still two stories, 17,200 square feet, access point on Carmel Road, a multi-use path along Carmel. Um, happy to answer any questions that you may have. Move to close. Second. Second. Motion Thank you. Made and properly second to close the public hearing. Any comment? Hearing none. All in favor of closing the public hearing, please raise your hand. Any opposed? Seeing none, that um, hearing is closed. We'll move on to item number 43 uh, rezoning petition 2022 147 by South Park Towers Prop Co. LLC on approximately 9.94 acres bound by the south side of Fairview Road, east on the east side of Piedmont Road Drive South and North and west side of Barclay Downs Drive in Council District 6, Mr. Picard's District. The current, current zoning is 03 office and the proposed zoning is Mud O Mixed Use Development District optional. Staff recommends approval of this petition upon resolution of outstanding issues related to transportation and site and building design and technical re revisions related to site and building design. Uh, there are no speakers in opposition, so after staff's presentation, Mr. Brown, you have three minutes. Okay, thank you. 2022-147, it's just under 10 acres on Fairview and Piedmont Road Drive. Also, uh, sites uh, split by Liberty Road Drive and, and bounded by Barclay Downs Drive to the south. Uh, it is currently zoned 03. 
and it is proposed to go to Mud O. You can see we've got quite a bit of O3 and O2 and O1 in the area, then uh, a lot of fruit stripe gum with Mud O uh, surrounding the rest of that. Uh, and then the policy map does recommend this all for regional activity center, so we do have consistency uh, with the request uh, and the place type. Uh, the proposal contains up to 535,000 square feet of existing office uses and 13,000 square feet of existing EDE uses to remain. That would be in area A and B where the existing office towers are. Those are, uh, again, proposed to, to remain as is. Uh, then the proposal would be for up to 112,000 square feet of medical office or 224 hotel rooms subject to conversions in area A, uh, 300 multifamily dwelling units in area C and or D, and then 25,000 square feet of retail EDE personal service or other commercial uses in areas A, B, C, and D as well. Uh, conversion of unused medical space could go towards uh, lodging or retail uses. It uh, does prohibit things like car washes, gas stations, EDEs with drive-throughs and uh, climate controlled self-storage. Uh, also commits to off-site transportation improvements uh, per the traffic study findings, which include things like a signal and crossing modifications at Fairview Road and Tyvola Road and Park Road intersection and also signal modifications and loop branded crosswalks at Fairview Road and Park South Drive intersection. Uh, does propose to install South Park Loop uh, along the site's Piedmont Road Drive frontage. Also, in two benches and bike rack are proposed to be installed at Piedmont Road Drive and Fairview Road. A 12-foot multi-use path and 8-foot planting strip along the Fairview Road frontage, and then a minimum of 8-foot planting strip and 5-foot sidewalks along Barclay Downs Drive. Uh, upgrades to ramps and crosswalks on Fairview and Piedmont Road Drive have been included in the conditions as well, along with construction of new ADA compliance CATS bus pad at the current bus stop location. Uh, design guidelines for new constructions related to allow building materials, uh, activated facades, screen parking, and internal and screen dumpster locations are incorporated into the project. Uh, petitioner will also make effort to design and construct buildings following green building guidelines and commit to installing EV charging and new parking decks at a ratio of 2% of spaces provided, as well as provision for future start charging stations at a ratio of 5% of the total spaces provided. Uh, would also provide two times the amount of open space required for new buildings over 50,000 square feet. Uh, that may be phased with the completion of each new building over 50,000 square feet and also requests optional provisions to increase height to 220 feet and allow existing parking and maneuvering in area A. Staff does recommend approval of this petition. We do have some outstanding issues, as mentioned, with transportation, site and building design, as well as some technical revisions to take care of. Uh, petition is consistent with the 2040 policy map recommendation for Regional Activity Center, and we will take any questions following the petitioner's presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Brown. You have three minutes. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. Colin Brown on behalf of the, uh, of the petitioner. Uh, very quickly, uh, this is uh, Crest Light uh, is the lead developer on the project. They're working fairly closely with Lincoln Harris. Uh, at this point in the process, uh, Land Design, LS3P, and DRG are all involved. This is just the type of development we need to see. Uh, these are the tallest uh, office towers um, in South Park. They've got some age on them. They need to be refreshed. Uh, so that is what Crest Light is doing. Happy that uh, we don't have opposition tonight. I think there's some reasons for that. Really, you, you've got this tower. You've got everything that South Park trying to do for the loot, make it urban, and on the corner, the main future corner, you've got a large surface parking lot. So this is taking that out, bringing in um, mixed uses. Let me find the, the pretty picture. That was that parking lot I showed you. So new building going in that area, new retail building on the other side, providing the type of activity we like along the frontage. Also, the ability to add a new building on this location. Uh, you heard uh, 220 feet of height. Uh, I think that's not scary because there's that much height uh, on, the, on the site already. Um, so pleased to have staff support, uh, pleased to have uh, no opposition from the neighborhood. We have received a letter from SPAN uh, with a list of requests related to pedestrian improvements. Uh, we think we have generally provided significant ones already, uh, but we expect that we'll respond to those um, and address as many of those as we can in our recent middle this week. Mr. Bukhari. Yeah, appreciate you making that last comment. I saw the items, particularly around the pedestrian stuff. Uh, I'll, we'll get together and kind of coordinate that through in the next couple weeks. Otherwise, move to close. Second. Motion has been made and properly second to close the public hearing. Any comment um, here and none? All in favor of closing the public hearing, please raise your hand. Any opposed? Seeing none, the um, item is closed. We'll move on to item number four, uh, 44, rezoning petition 2022-149. Uh, uh, 
uh, by Flywheel Group and Tony Kuhn uh, on approximately 5.91 acres on the north side of North Tryon Street and the east side of Atondo Avenue, west of West Craighead Road, Council District 1, Ms. Anderson's District. The current zoning is I-1 Light Industrial and I-2 General Industrial. The proposed zoning is TODUC Transit Oriented Development Urban Center and TOD NC Transit Oriented Development Neighborhood Center. Staff recommends approval of this petition um, we have no speakers uh, for it against, so um, after um, Mr. Uh, Petten's presentation, we'll deal with it. All right, thank you. 2022-149 is 5.9 acres at North Tryon and Atondo Avenue, uh, just to the east of uh, East 36th Street and west of Craig, or excuse me, west of West Craighead Road. Uh, it is currently zoned I-1 and I-2, and the proposed zoning is for TODUC. That would be the piece uh, that's on the front end along North Tryon Street, and then TODNC is the smaller piece that's uh, along the backside uh, of the project rezoning boundary. Uh, the policy map does call for manufacturing logistics, picking up uh, a lot of the existing industrial uh, zoning in that area. You can see we do have Community Activity Center uh, on both sides of this project to the to the west and to the south. Uh, we're about a quarter mile from the 36th Street station, so really not very far uh, from that transit station stop. Uh, and staff does recommend approval of this petition. It is inconsistent with that manufacturing logistics place type, but it is uh, generally consistent with the pattern of development and, and redevelopment investment we've seen in the North Tryon Quarter, particularly around uh, some of these light rail stops uh, in the North Davidson area. Uh, so again, staff does uh, support and, and recommend approval of this petition. We'll be happy to take any questions you may have. Motion to close public hearing. Second. Second. Um, any comment, questions? Hearing none, all in favor of closing public hearing, please raise your hand. Any opposed? Um, that is unanimous um, for it. Um, we'll move on to item number 45, rezoning petition 2022-163 by Carolina Holdings 5 LLC on approximately 0.55 acres on the north side of Hart Road on the east side of Susanna Drive west of Roswell's Ferry Road in Council District 2, uh, Mr. Graham's district. Uh, the current zoning is R3, single family residential Lake Wiley protected area, and a proposed zoning is R6, single family residential Lake Wiley protected area. Staff recommends approval of this petition. We do have um, a speaker uh, against this, so after staff's presentation, Mr. Ferguson uh, and, and Ms. Poteet, you'll have 10 minutes. All right, thank you. 2022-163, <clears throat> as mentioned, it's just uh, over a half acre on Hart Road and Susanna Drive, currently zoned R3. Uh, proposed zoning is R6. Uh, the Lake Wiley protected area uh, is in, uh, active on the site and will remain should the rezoning be approved. Adopted place type is for neighborhood one. Uh, that R6 zoning designation uh, would be consistent uh, with uh, the neighborhood one place type. I believe that translates out to uh, a neighborhood 1D. So that would be consistent again with that neighborhood one place type that's recommended. Uh, this is a conventional petition, so no uh, site plan, no outstanding issues to talk through. Again, it is consistent with the policy map recommendation and staff does recommend approval. We'll be happy to take any questions following uh, petitioners and public presentation. Thank you very much, Ms. Uh, Ferguson, you have 10 minutes. Uh, Mayor Pro Tem Council Committee, uh, hopefully I'll get out of here before using 10 minutes, but um, uh, I want to thank you for your time. Thank staff for working with us. Again, we reached out uh, early in stages at the pre-sub to try to make sure we got the right fit for this area. It's a vacant property, uh, currently zoned R3, um, and I think it, it makes a lot of sense and it follows the policies of the 2040 plan, the city initiatives. Uh, it's an opportunity to bring uh, a few more uh, residential units to the city of Charlotte. This is within the city of Charlotte and it's a quarter lot. Uh, and it's, you know, a really reasonable place to go. Uh, I think if you look around, uh, this level of density is not out of place. It's not a new precedent in this area. Um, and if you look to the north, you can see some min max zoning to the south immediately across that electrical easement, this dud lines, same thing, has a density similar to what, what we're asking for. Um, and allowing it to be within the code and go, go through uh, the regular conventional process makes sense for a site this size. Um, man, I made these too small. So um, what you can see is a little distance to where you have even uh, attached single family dwellings in the area. Uh, you also have within about a mile and a half, mile and a quarter, uh, multiple retail hubs with grocery stores, restaurants, retail, uh, the types of things that support uh, in one areas. Uh, this is close to those. And again, this is, this is vacant land in the city of Charlotte. Uh, 
And I uh, welcome your questions, comments. Actually, I guess we have an opposition speaker. Thank you very much. Um, uh, Shirley Benai. So, um, actually, it was a mistake. I'm in opposition to the next one. Okay. We do have you on the next one as well. Okay. Well, then, we have no opposition on this one. Um, uh, any comments or questions from council? Motion to close. Second. Motion has been made and properly second. Any discussion on that motion? Hearing none. All in favor, please raise your hand. Any opposed? Seeing none, that is unanimous to close the public hearing. We will move on to item number uh, 46, rezoning petition 2022-164 by Carolina Holdings 3 LLC on approximately 10.18 acres located along the north side of Hart Road, east of Susanna Drive and west of Roswell's Ferry Road, Council District 2, Mr. Graham's District. The current zoning is R3, single-family residential, Lake Wiley protected area, and, and the proposed zoning is R6, single-family residential, Lake Wiley protected area. Staff recommends approval of this petition. We do have speaker, a speaker in opposition, so um, um, Mr. Ferguson, you'll have 10 minutes after staff's presentation. Zoom I think he thought he had a moment. Uh, staff. Well, uh, I, Miss Craig, do, do we have? Please stand by while we. Okay, and he didn't expect me to talk so quickly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> been, been right any other night. Take a break. Take a break. Recess for five minutes till we find staff. All right. <laughs> or can we just go to the next one? Because it's already nine ten, and we have a lot to get through. I mean, we're gonna need the same person. Yeah, we still need staff. <laughs> So, that yes. This is cut short, so okay. we're back on the record. Um, we'll give Mr. Fetton like a few seconds while we okay. reintroduce item number 46, rezoning petition 2022-164 by Carolina Holdings 3 LLC. Um, current zoning R3 single family residential, Lake Wiley protected area. Proposed zoning R6 single family residential, Lake Wiley protected area. Staff recommends approval. We do have speakers um, opposed. Um, so I have to miss Patton. All right. We'll Thank you. Apologies for that. Uh, 2022-164, 10.18 acres, Hart Road, uh, just off of Susanna Drive, just a little bit further from the petition we considered uh, in the last hearing. Uh, the zoning, similar, R3, uh, request is for R6, uh, so essentially a, a mirror petition. Lake Wiley protected area remains intact. Mm -hmm. Neighborhood one is the place type recommendation. Uh, and again, this is a conventional petition, so no site plan, no conditions, outstanding issues uh, to speak of. Um, again, it's consistent with the policy map recommendation. We do recommend approval. We'll take any questions you may have, and I will stay right here just in case. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Ferguson, you have 10 minutes. Uh, good evening, Mayor Pro Tem, Council, uh, Zoning Committee, Russell Ferguson, on behalf of the petitioner. Uh, as, as Dave just mentioned, um, this is very similar to the other petition, uh, and it came from the same discussion of what is appropriate for this area. Uh, it's, again, in line with the 2040 plan and the city policies. Um, I guess I would sort of summarize and say it's a reasonable step in the right direction, R3 to R6. It allows a little bit more density. Um, it's a larger lot, but again, it's entirely vacant. Uh, and so this is adding housing stock without taking it away. Um, again, I, I can go through the picture again. It's literally the same presentation here. Um, again, with the proximity, it's not a new precedent. This is right in line with what's happening out there. Again, this is, is well within the city limits of Charlotte, and it um, certainly has some capacity to add housing, uh, which is something significant out here. Um, so uh, thank you very much, and I'll just uh, pop back up here in a minute and give away the rest of my time. Thank you very much. Um, Shirley Bonet, Bonet um, you have uh, 10 minutes. All right, good evening. Uh, thank you for your 
time. I know it's late, so I appreciate your presence. Um, I'm here to object to the rezoning proposal in our street in Hart Road. Um, I'm here representing myself and 15 of my neighbors uh, in an effort to protect our quality of life. And my apologies for raising my hand earlier, but my jaw dropped because we're talking major increase in traffic in this entire area. Uh, Hart Road eventually connects to Mount Holly, and we're talking immense amount of traffic leading into Mount Holly. Uh, and with this particular um, proposal as well into ours, into our street, and that to me is just appalling. Um, both of those petitions, 164 and 163, um, are proposing uh, changing the um, zoning from R3 to R6. And specifically with petition 164, it has the potential of quadrupling, so not doubling, not tripling, but quadrupling the amount of people who would live across from our 15 family homes uh, on Hart Road. Uh, this proposal would allow the construction of roughly 60 units. And um, apologies, I'm not a lawyer or whoever is representing um, the construction companies here tonight, but I'm a person and <laughs> I have no understanding of what does that mean uh, in terms of designation changes. The little research that I was able to figure out was changing from 30 units to 60 units, but potentially also uh, apartment complexes, which would even triple the amount of uh, units available for residential, um, and that's just going to kill us. Our street, Hart Road, is a quiet road. It can barely handle the current traffic uh, that's coming right now from the adjacent neighborhoods to it, uh, and proposing to add potentially, at best, 100 cars potentially 200 or depending on how big this thing is going to be at 10 acres is pretty big for our street um, it would really really physically hurt us the road there's no infrastructure to support it um, when I look at it it's literally it's across from my house so I'm envisioning just traffic and getting caught in car accidents the road is narrow it's one way in each direction and it's kind of along the lines of what we're seeing here today throughout the entire petitions that I've seen. It's like overpopulating areas that really shouldn't be. You're really hurting quality of life and the integrity of the community. And I really urge you to consider uh, before approving such proposals, specifically mine, but I'm saying at large as well. Um, another um, issue that's bothering me specifically, our street already suffered some devastating loss of vegetation in the tree canopy. Um, when I moved in across from my house, there was this beautiful jungle. It's gone now. There are three ugly houses across from it, uh, sitting in a watershed hole, literally. They're in a hole. The, it's a kind of like a, a hole. There's no other way to describe it. They built three houses in a hole. Um, I actually called the city I want to say two weeks ago because we had really bad rain and there was a river there and it needs to be managed. I don't know how the city approved building there. It's dangerous. Um, that's a whole different story. But again, we're suffering from canopy loss. This area right now is filled with vegetation. If it's going to get completely deforested, we're all going to suffer. We're heavy traffic from the airport. We're getting the airplanes pass us by all the time. Loss of vegetation is going to hurt both air quality and it's going to hurt um, the uh, audio. We're going to get more of a sound and it's just more pollution, more pollution, more pollution. And that's just really going to hurt our quality of life. Um, the little 163 area next to us is not going to hurt us as much as this one, but again, it's going to it is a green area right now. We walk there in, in, in Susanna Drive. Um, and again, that's a concern. Um, and again, the watershed management in that entire area need to be looked at. Um, uh, one of the things that bother me the most is the way that this whole issue is being introduced to the neighborhood. Um, my neighbors are not here. They're not available to come. Um, again, I'm not a lawyer. We didn't have time to research this. I don't know what the implications are. We're basically, I feel like I'm being attacked and I have no tools to deal with this. I have no 
money or resources to offer a lawyer to fight this. Um, we definitely don't want a huge development in such a tiny area across from us. We will suffer greatly. Um, I moved here nine years ago from Southern California. I know what gridlock is. There's a reason why I moved to Charlotte. It's to avoid that lack of quality of life. Charlotte does have quality of life. What you guys are doing by approving all those massive proposals is taking it away. And you're going to end up driving us, the good citizens that live here, and bringing in money, good money, and paying taxes. You're going to drive us away. And you really need to consider that. There's really good quality of life at the mo quality of life at the moment here, but the proposed changes are gef definitely going to hurt us. I have a little girl; she's almost six. I'm trying to give her good life. Again, that's why I escaped Southern California, and I think I chose well by coming to Charlotte. But now I'm turning to you guys to keep this up and not ruin it for us, because you're going to end up losing this beautiful migration that came into Charlotte. So um, I definitely urge you, I'm a single mom, and I work hard to, I bought, I bought my house, I'm, I'm very proud of it. I, I moved a lot uh, in my history. Uh, I'm not even originally from here, I was born and raised uh, in Israel. And it's my pride and joy that my daughter was born here, she's being raised in, as an American, and I want her to have this house on Hart Road for the rest of her life. But I want to make sure that it's a quality life and not something dangerous and not something that's not sustainable. And another 100 units or 60 units with additional 120 cars is definitely going to hurt our quality of life. And again, the loss of greenery and vegetation. This entire stretch of street is leading up to uh, the river, and it's beautiful. And building and developing that area is going to kill it, completely kill it. So I'm urging you, please, to consider it and reject the proposal and help us protect our homes and maintain good quality of life here in Charlotte. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Ferguson, you have two minutes for a rebuttal. I'll say on behalf of the petitioner, we, we will reach out to have some communications and better explain uh, what is in process here. The um, uh, just to discuss the points here regarding traffic and, and the change from this petition to what is is currently available is the difference uh, per seat out about 300 trips to 440 trips uh, per day. It's not on the traffic study level. Uh, we are talking about a sort of a maximum on the 60 unit side, but. Obviously, it's never more than that. Uh, there's going to be a lot to work out. This would go through uh, subdivision planning and would be required to follow the Charlotte policies for tree save, for buffers, for setbacks. Uh, and, and this would likely include um, development of public or private roads within it internally. Um, all of those policies, along with the idea that this is appropriate to have R6 rezoning, are all in line with Charlotte policy. 2040 plan puts that here. Um, to the greater picture, I think, of, of, of where we talk about quality of life is sometimes as a society, you have to look at that as a whole. And, and, and this is 10 acres of vacant land inside the city of Charlotte city limits that could be reasonably developed at an in one level to provide more housing units for future citizens of our city. Thank you very much and uh, appreciate your time. Thank you very much. Um, before I recognize any of my colleagues, Ms. Bonai, I just say, um, that you uh, might know a little bit more about um, the process and, and coming down and representing for yourself and um, your neighbors than uh, you may know. Um, I, I will also say um, uh, it, it, the, the rezoning land use process can be quite, is quite confusing, um, but um, our planning department, our planning resources or your planning resources on top of Mr. Graham's here uh, as your as your uh, district rep, and um, we're all here as well um, to help folks like you better understand um, and, to, and to gain the tools. And, and you, Mr. Ferguson, um, as as uh, representing uh, the petitioner, um, I always encourage neighbors, new neighbors, to be good neighbors. So um, um, reach out to us um, to continue to learn about it, because um, I think you did a pretty good job. Um, as you're figuring it out. 
Any other um, questions or comments from council members? Ms. Johnson and, and Ms. Oh, Ms. Johnson. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. I have a, I'd also like to say to, uh, to the resident, thank you for coming out and we appreciate your sharing your, your passion and your, your story and your advocacy uh, for, your, for your neighborhood. So thank you. This change is hard. You're absolutely right. This, the city is changing. We know that. So thank you. I have a question for the petitioner. I just wanted to know why they are filed separately. Why are the two petitions filed separately? It's the same. But they're, they're separated by a, like a half block, a block or so. A half a block. Yeah. Okay. okay. So it just. Um, okay. It just looks like it says it's the same description. So I just, it looks like it's in the same location. Okay. Thank you. That's all my questions. Questions? Any further questions? Comments? Motion to close the public hearing. Second. Any thank discussion you. of the motion? I, I am. Oh, oh. Ms. Ashmera. Yes, and thank you. Um, <laughs> Ms. Benai um, had us had me thinking a lot. I mean, there were a lot of concerns that you had raised around traffic, preserving our tree canopy, addressing stone water issues, uh, addressing a quality of life, our clean air, clean water. All of those are valid concerns. That's really part of the policy discussion that we take into account. Uh, that's not just specifically for this rezoning, but just as a whole, I think, Council um, Council has been very intentional about making decisions that you all can be proud of, uh, especially as developments, uh, as, as we are growing as, at such a fast pace. Uh, but like my colleagues said, we really appreciate you coming out here and advocating for you, your family, and your community. Uh, we need more residents to continue to stay engaged in this process. While I understand this process can be con convoluted, convoluted, it can be very challenging to navigate through this, and that's where um, you can reach out to any one of us or even your district rep. But uh, some of the things you uh, shared really resonated with me, and I just wanted you to know uh, I really very much appreciate uh, so that's all I have. Thank you. So motion has been made and probably second to close the public hearing. All in favor, please raise your hand. Any opposed? Seeing none, that is uh, unanimous. We will move on uh, to item number 47, rezoning petition 2022-166 by Boulevard Real Estate Advisors, LLC, located on approximately 0.23 acres on the south side of West Peterson Drive, west of South Tryon Street, and east of Interstate 77 in Council District 3, Ms. Watlington's district. The current zoning is R5, single-family residential, and the proposed zoning is TOD, Transit-Oriented Development Neighborhood Center. Uh, staff recommends approval of this petition. We do not have any speakers opposed. So after staff's presentation, Mr. Carmichael and Mr. Branch, who will have three minutes. Thank you, 2022-166. Uh, it's about a quarter acre on uh, West Peterson, just off of South Tryon. Uh, it is currently zoned R5, re um, and the rezoning request is for TODNC. You can see a good uh, bit of the surrounding area has been rezoned to TODNC uh, through some previously approved petitions. Uh, <clears throat> this project, uh, or excuse me, policy map does call for neighborhood one. Uh, at this site, you can see neighborhood center where the TODNC districts uh, are located really along West Peterson and South Tryon. Uh, from staff's understanding, this petition would incorporate this one uh, parcel into the larger uh, TODNC holdings that are just adjacent there uh, on South Tryon Street to, to continue to create a little bit more of a comprehensive uh, development pattern, development outcome in this area. Uh, and I know they had hoped to incorporate this into the initial rezoning, uh, just the timing uh, didn't come together for that one, so that's why we're seeing this as a bit of a, a one-off piece, but it is uh, intended to be a part of the larger 
uh, project that uh, is, is proposed for the TODNC that's existing, like I said, just adjacent to this. So staff does recommend approval of this petition. It is inconsistent with that neighborhood one place type. Uh, we are within a mile walk of Scaly Bark, and we do have that TODNC adjacent, uh, and, and a lot of this will be uh, incorporated into uh, that larger project to just, again, continue to kind of create a, a little bit of a cleaner edge uh, for that neighborhood center uh, place type. So with that, we'll turn it over to the petitioner and take any questions that you may have following their presentation thank you thank you very much Ms. Carmichael you have three thank you Mr. Mayor Pro Tem members of council and the zoning committee I'm John Carmichael here on behalf of the petitioner with me tonight is Chris Branch and Chris is available to answer any questions you may have uh, as Mr. Petten stated the site contains about just over two tenths of acre located on the west excuse me the south side of West Peterson Drive just to the west of South Trine Street uh, these are a series of aerial photographs of the site this is Tron Street here. This is Peterson here. Uh, the site is about six-tenths of a mile walking distance from the Scaly Bark Transit Station. Uh, the site's currently zoned R5. You've got Todd NC zoning to the north, east, and south of the site. You've got R5 and UR2 CD zoning to the west. And this is uh, a slide. There you go. Sorry about that. This is a slide that zooms out a little bit and shows you the, the site here and then the, some Todd zoning that uh, is around the site, adjacent to the site and in close proximity to the site. Uh, the request, once again, is to rezone the site from R5 to Todd NC uh, to allow uses uh, that are permitted in the Todd NC zoning district on the site. As Mr. Pett stated, the site would be incorporated into the development of the adjacent parcels. Um, we're happy to answer any questions that you may have. As I mentioned, Mr. Branch is here as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any questions or comments from uh, the council? Move to close. Second. There's been motion made to, and properly second to close the public hearing. Any discussion of that motion? To hear none. All in favor, please raise your hand. Any opposed? Thank you. Any none. That is unanimous. We will move on to item number 48. Rezoning petition 2022-169 by Kennedy Properties LLC on approximately 1.89 acres located on the east side of Lambeth Drive, north of North Tryon Street and west of West, west Eastway Drive in Council District 1, Miss Anderson's District. The current zoning is B2 General Business Conditional and the proposed zoning is TODNC Transit Oriented Development Neighborhood Center. Staff recommends approval of this petition. Uh, we do have um, um, a, a speaker against. Uh, so after staff's presentation. He's no longer against. Oh, Miss. Yeah, I, we changed that too. So he's, he's Okay, he's yes, you're right. For, yeah. for uh, okay, so I have Tom Wilson. Are you Tom Wilson? Mm -hmm. And you're not against. That's okay, right. so we're four. So Thank after you, staff's presentation, um, Mr. Wilson and Mr. <laughs> Weiner, you will have three minutes. That's great. All right, thank you. Uh, so 2022-169, acres off Lambeth Drive, uh, which is just off of North Tryon Street, uh, and really in um, some close proximity to uh, a light rail station. I believe it's Old Concord Road. Yeah, it's Old Concord Road Station. Uh, so we are within that, that distance for a TOD district. Uh, the current zoning is <clears throat> B2 conditional. And the proposed zoning is for TOD NC. So we go to the place type map. You can see there's some neighborhood center all around this. Uh, and uh, this would continue that uh, neighborhood center development pattern, that platform way that you see uh, just off to uh, the, the side there. That would be a road that would also continue through uh, this project. That's a subdivision required road. So that would punch through and, and provide connectivity over to Lambeth. Uh, again, this is within uh, a mile of the old Concord uh, Road station, so TODNC is applicable. Uh, staff does recommend approval of this petition as a conventional petition, uh, so there's no site plan, there's no conditions at, at this time, no outstanding issues. Uh, while it is inconsistent, uh, we do feel it would continue that neighborhood center uh, place type, which would be appropriate within that uh, area within uh, the old Concord Road station. Uh, it's actually within a half mile walk, uh, excuse me, of that, uh, that station there. Uh, at Old Concord. So with that, we'll turn it over to the petitioner. We'll take any questions you may have following their presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Weiner. You have three minutes. Okay, great. And I'd like to save a minute for Tom, at least, as he's been here graciously enough for five hours and would like to do that. So my name is Eric Weiner. My day job is I work for an in-tech group, uh, architecture firm in uh, 
Charlotte here, and actually I'm representing Kenny Properties as one of three equal partners in that property. Um, we're a diverse group that uh, came together really because we had a lot of discussions a couple years ago about what was happening with what we saw with development with livability and upward mobility and also just not taking advantage of transit development and pedestrian mobility development in 10 minutes communities. We really saw things kind of weren't coming together how we'd like to do from some of the national developers, some of the people doing bigger developments and we wanted to do our own, find our own little white piece, not just talking to people, but actually find a site to do that. We really identified this site. It was just this unique opportunity to bring platform way through, create more connection, do what the na this neighborhood has been talking about to people, but maybe doesn't have the same loud voice as like some of the other neighborhoods in Charlotte have yet, because development hadn't got there. The big money hadn't got there. So we saw an opportunity as just local, diverse. Uh, we got a business owner, um, like I said, I do architecture, and we got someone that works for one of the large healthcare organizations in management. We all just kind of saw this need and bring a unique voice. And the common thread is we all on the side, you know, have some housing and stuff that uh, we see. So we, we, we think this is consistent and we'll do great things. Tom? Yes, we do have a voice. And I'm Tom Wilson. I'm the Vice President of North End Partners. And we support what they're doing. And I'm a live-in resident of Hidden Valley. And it's an amazing thing that's going on out there. They're going to help it. I want to piggyback off that and say, You've built a $40 million recreation center in Eastway. The third largest community in North Carolina, Hidden Valley, doesn't have access to it. The kids can't get across the street. The seniors can't get across the street. Please do something about it. That's it. Rick. Thank you very much. Um, um, Ms. Ashmira. Thank you, um, Mayor Pro Tem. Um, Mr. Wilson, thank you for shedding light on that issue, especially access to the Recreation Center. Uh, Eastway Recreation Center is a great facility that really uh, addresses the void in that area. Uh, I will certainly relay that to our county commissioners who are in charge of our parks and recreation. And I believe Commissioner Mark Jurel is representative for that area. And I'll certainly relay that, but I also in encourage you to reach out to them directly and speak at one of their public forums. Thank you. Ms. Sanders. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. Uh, and thank you, Mr. Wilson. Uh, Mr. Wilson I'm, has probably already spoken to Mr. Jarrell because he's everywhere uh, <laughs> doing great work and being a voice of the community. So thank you for that. I also want to thank you, um, Eric, for being thoughtful about this neighborhood, this community, and how you can bring something um, to the neighborhood that's complimentary um, and also aspirational for the neighborhood. So I know a lot of work has been done over the last year in working on this and um, getting input from the community and working with individuals like Mr. Wilson to come up with um, ultimately a better solution. So thank you for having an open mind and um, having an active listening ear and working with everyone to create something even better on that corridor. Thank you, Mayor Pratem. Okay. May I say thank you to a wonderful city council. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, motion to close up. So oh, move. Ms. Molina, sorry. <laughs> I, you know what, I, and I, I don't even like to speak after the district rep. I, I'd like to let the district rep have that last word because she's the one who's really been communicating with you guys. But I actually, I can't let this go by without saying I'm, I'm really happy to see somebody who was in a position, and I don't even know why you were against, 
uh, but for you to come, this is this is what makes our job. This is the best part when we actually get to see the community and the petitioner come to a favorable agreement where both, you know, hearts and minds are at ease, and and you know the ultimate um, solution is is something that we can agree on. So I'd like to commend you both um, for having those conversations with your district representative. You know. Present, um, thank you for the wonderful compliment. You know that we don't get to hear that often. You know, <laughs> very often what we hear is often different at times. So, um, you know, thank you for believing in us, and we definitely believe in y'all. And this is what makes, you know, our job. This is an exclamation point on on what we get to do. Uh, Second, there's been a motion to close the public hearing. It's been made a properly second. No, right. Uh, we, look, she said we don't want to close this we one. We don't want to close this one. <laughs> <laughs> we want to keep this one. Uh, um, Thank you. Right, all in favor of closing the public hearing, please raise your hand. Any opposed? Seeing none, um, we'll move on to item number 49. Thank you both. Um, um, item number 49 is rezone the petition 2022-170 by Canvas Residential LLC located on approximately 11.23 acres at the southeast intersection of Oakdale Road and Mount Holly Huntersville Road, north of Interstate 485 in the ETJ in County Commission District 1, Ms. Powell's District, and closest to City Council District 4, Ms. Johnson's District. The current zoning is R3, single-family residential in a FEMA floodplain, and the pr proposed zoning is R8MF, multi-family residential conditional in the FEMA floodplain. Staff recommends approval of this petition upon resolution of outstanding issues related to site and building design and transportation. There are no speakers against, so after this presentation, Ms. Grant, you will have, excuse me, three minutes. Thank you. 2022-170, just one point of clarification. We'll get to that on the zoning slide. I'll, I'll get to that in one second. Uh, it's 11.23 acres on Oakdale Road in Mount Holly, Huntersville. Again, we just had a petition just uh, to the west of this. Uh, this petition is for R3. Uh, it's in the Lake Wiley protected area. Not sure how that got translated in, in the mapping process to FEMA floodplain. I don't see any FEMA delineations on our GIS side, so that may have just been a, a typo from the uh, Lake Wiley protected area. I'm, again, I'm not sure I'll work with our mapping staff on that one, uh, but it's R3. Uh, the proposed zoning is for R8 multifamily conditional with the Lake Wiley protected area as well. Uh, the policy map does call for neighborhood two, which uh, the R8 MFCD would be consistent with. Uh, the proposal is up, for 80, is up to 88 single family attached units and 21 buildings. Uh, no more than five per building would provide architectural standards uh, for the project. Uh, amenity areas would be included for thing, and would also include things like hardscape, seating, uh, gathering areas, uh, would provide an ordinance required buffer along I-485. Uh, vehicular access would be from a new private street uh, that would connect from Oakdale Road to a connection with the adjacent development, which is there on uh, Bluedale Road. Uh, units are located along private street and along the network of internal alleys. Uh, would install an eight-foot planting strip and 12-foot multi-use path along both Oakdale and Mount Holly Huntersville Road, uh, as well as construct a six-foot sidewalk and eight-foot planting strip along both sides of private street A and provide sidewalks along one side of each alley with connections to the multi-use path on Oakdale at Private Street A and then one pedestrian connection to the multi-use path along Mount Holly Huntersville Road at the northeast corner of the site. Uh, this is similar to earlier proposal we had where this is uh, somewhat of a, another phase of the project there just to the east there off Bluedale Road in Glen Teague. Uh, again, the staff does recommend approval of this petition. There are some outstanding issues that we need to work through. Uh, it is consistent with the 2040 policy map recommendation for neighborhood two, and we'll take any questions following the petitioner's presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Grant. You have three minutes. Good evening, Mayor Pro Tem, members of council, members of the zoning committee, Bridget Grant, land use and development consultant with Moore and Van Allen. Pleased to be here on behalf of the petitioner. Um, Dave did a great job on the presentation. We're pleased to say that we're consistent with the adopted 2040 plan. And as he mentioned, this is really a second phase to the initial phase that was approved back in 2021. So I've pulled up the colored rendering and I'm happy to answer any questions. Move to close. Second. Uh, Motion has been made and properly second. I would just like to confirm about that floodplain. I've never seen that before. So. Um, yeah, again, I, I don't see anything on uh, on our uh, Charlotte Explorer map. The floodplain is actually on the south side of I-485. So again, not sure where that uh, would have come from, but we'll get it looked at and get it cleaned up. Thank you so Apologize. much. Ms. Johnson. I do have a question. I'm sorry. 
Um, thank you, Bridget. Have you met with the community? Has there been any? Uh, we had a required community meeting, and we did not have any attendees. I saw that. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. There's a, been a motion that's been made and properly second to close the public hearing. Any further comment? All in favor of closing the public hearing, please raise your hand. Any opposed? Seeing none, that is unanimous. We'll move on to item number 50, rezoning position 2022-171 by Providence Group Capital on approximately 1.26 acres on the east side of South Tryon Street, north of Remount Road and south of Donovan Street in Council District 3, Miss Watlington's District. The current zoning is TODNC, Transit Oriented Development Neighborhood Center, and the proposed zoning is TODUC, Transit Oriented Development Urban Center. Staff recommends approval of this petition. There are no speakers uh, in, uh, in opposition, so after staff's presentation, Mr. McVeigh, you will have three minutes. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. 2022-171, 1.26 acres on South Tryon, uh, just uh, south of Donovan Street, north of Remount Road. Uh, it is currently zoned TODNC, uh, and they propose zoning, as mentioned, as TODUC. You can see we've got uh, quite a bit of TODUC, some remaining TODNC on the uh, other side there on Distribution Street. Uh, I'll say this is consistent with the changes we've seen from NC to UC once the uh, Rampart Station, uh, which is uh, just the one between uh, New Bern Station and I believe East West uh, would be constructed uh, just in this general area. So uh, that distance shrunk a little bit from what would be applicable for NC to UC. I think we're down to about less than a half mile to where that new station would, would come online. Uh, so the place type does recognize this as a neighborhood center. You can see we have regional activity center uh, surrounding most of this, that's to recognize some of that transition that we've seen to TODUC uh, surrounding these, and this is, again, consistent with that pattern. Staff does recommend approval of the petition. Uh, I will take it from Neighborhood Center to a uh, regional activity center, but again, that's consistent with what we've seen and within that proximity to uh, that proposed rampart station. So we'll be happy to take any questions uh, following the petitioner's presentation. Thank you. Mr. McVeigh, you have three minutes. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem, members of council, members of the Zoning Committee, Keith McVeigh, representing Providence Group Capital. We're happy to answer questions. I think Dave has summarized the petitions uh, succinctly. It's, it's a rezoning from TODNC to UC for parcels in close proximity to, to the proposed Rampart Station and in, as well as the existing New Bern Station. We're happy to answer questions. Thank you very much. Any questions, comments from the council? Move to close. Second. Second. The motion has been made and properly seconded to close the public hearing. Any comments on the motion? Hearing none, all in favor, please raise your hand. Any opposed? Seeing none, uh, that public hearing is closed. And we'll move on to agenda item number 51, rezoning petition 2022-174 by Anderson Pearson, located on approximately 0.34 acres at the southwest intersection of Siegel Avenue and Belmont Avenue, north of Harrell Street in Council District 1, Miss Anderson's District. The current zoning is B1 Neighborhood Business, and the proposed zoning is MUD-O, mixed-use development optional with three-year vested rights. Staff recommends approval of this petition upon resolution of outstanding issues related to transportation, environment, and site and building design. There are no speakers in opposition, so after staff's presentation, Mr. Lynch and Mr. Pearson, you'll have three minutes. All right, thank you. 2024 is in, uh, at Belmont and Siegel Avenue. It is currently zoned B1, and the proposed zoning is for Mudo. Uh, they are requesting an additional year <clears throat> of vesting beyond the, the standard two. We'll get into that in just a moment. Uh, the adopted place type uh, does call for a neighborhood center in this location. Uh, you can see that's uh, the predominant recommendation uh, just on these corners. And then we have some neighborhood two and neighborhood one interspersed around as well. Uh, this proposal uh, calls for up to 9,000 square foot building with a 50 foot maximum building height. You can see its orientation there uh, facing that corner, which is an important corner in the community, uh, would allow for the following uses. Uh, uh, different uses under MUD, so buildings for uh, musical, cultural activities, bike sharing stations, small scale learning, businesses such as a culinary school, piano school, yoga, fitness classes, etc. cetera. Uh, EDE type one and two would be a permitted use. Uh, so lots of the uh, uses that are found in MUD are, are incorporated uh, mainly to those that are kind of akin to the B1 zoning district. Uh, so there are uh, a good variety of uses that could go in this building. Again, most of them are community uh, and neighborhood serving types of uses uh, that would uh, serve the Belmont community. Uh, we do have a restriction on hours of operation uh, for outdoor seating uh, and no food or beverages or outdoor entertainment allowed between the hours of 11 p.m. and 8 a.m. Uh, would prohibit things like a gas station, oil change 
storage facility, dry cleaning, car wash, uh, adult establishments, and accessory drive-in windows. Uh, it does provide architectural design standards uh, so the building can fit in better context with the community. Optional provisions uh, do include requests for uh, existing tree canopy modifications for uh, site triangles, driver location. There are some existing trees that the petitioner is trying to, to work around a bit uh, to try to preserve some of those. Also to facilitate ground floor commercial uses, they do request a 14 foot setback, uh, which really in some of the other buildings on, on some of the corners, just on the other end here of Belmont and Harrell, uh, does kind of mimic uh, what those buildings are, are already that are in place. Uh, and also a maximum building height of, of 50 feet. Uh, that wouldn't necessarily be an optional provision, so that would just be a condition of the approval. Uh, the petition is also, as I mentioned, requesting an extra year of vesting. Uh, this is, I believe, a brownfield site that's going to need some uh, environmental remediation to be cleaned up so the project can continue to move forward. So an additional year uh, to us seems to make some sense just to make sure that that process can be worked through accordingly uh, and they can get the, the outcome uh, to move forward with the project itself. Uh, staff does recommend approval of the petition. We do have some outstanding issues uh, to work through related to transportation, site and building design. Uh, it is consistent with the policy map recommendation for neighborhood center, and we will take any questions following the petitioner's presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Lynch and Mr. Pearson. You have three minutes. Okay, thank you. Uh, my name is Anderson Pearson. Uh, I'm a local architect and the managing member of uh, the developing entity, uh, L uh, 1030 Siegel LLC. Uh, my mom, sister, and I combined nest eggs to purchase this property a year ago as a long-term family investment. Uh, next slide. I've had the pleasure of working with the Belmont neighbors uh, and a couple are actually here with me tonight. They uh, stuck it out uh, discussing development possibilities for our property and how it might be a better contributor to the neighborhood. Next slide. Uh, the resulting vision celebrates Belmont, Belmont's uh, unique character by combining its Mill Village history and its modern day artistic vibe. Uh, next slide. In a uh, new walkable mixed use corner shop concept. Next slide. Uh, the hope will be to secure a, bode a bodega uh, or urban market as a ground floor tenant with a neighborhood restaurant above. It will be a place for all of Belmont to gather, uh, providing additional amenities, job opportunities, and economic growth for the community. Next slide. Uh, Belmont is full of inspiration. Uh, just two blocks away at, at uh, Envision Charlotte's Innovation Barn, uh, I'm researching how locally recycled materials can be integrated back into the community. Uh, the plastics lab, spring clean, and resource floor have shared their ideas uh, that include turning food containers into siding for our bike shelter, uh, weaving discarded clothing into acoustical panels for the restaurant, and recycling glass bottles into aggregate for concrete for the bodega. Uh, next slide. One challenge uh, is the property has been on NCDEQ's list of contaminated sites since 1996. Uh, we've been accepted into the Brownfields program and are working toward an agreement which will protect soil and groundwater in perpetuity. Uh, this is a time consuming and costly endeavor, but we believe it is the right thing to do. Next slide. An additional challenge is the location of two 10-foot high retaining walls offset approximately 12 feet from the property line. These walls hold back neighboring trees and reduce the buildable area of the site from one-third to one-quarter of an acre, minimizing available space for the building footprint, parking, and amenities. As a re result, we are seeking optional provisions to allow six-foot six sidewalks to remain and that trees on the southwest property line be allowed to count toward tree save requirements. We are in conversations with staff on these items. Um, Thank you very much. If you have additional comments, uh, you can provide them to the uh, clerk and uh, they will be distributed to uh, council. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Anderson. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. Uh, thank you, Mr. Pearson, uh, for your engagement with the community. I know the Belmont Neighborhood Association is very much engaged 
in um, all of the new development that occurs in a neighborhood and your design and your thoughtfulness around a closed loop environment from um, a recycling perspective and mimicking some of the um, activities at the Innovation Barn, including it in your design, is uh, right in line with the mindset of Belmont association members. So thank you guys for staying late. I know you had some uh, other individuals who were uh, on a list to speak in support of this, but um, I just wanted to voice my thanks for you with the engagement and um, I'm very active with that association. So I know that they've had their thumbprint on this. Thank you. Um, I, I just have one question or comment. Um, would love to uh, I just heard the the keeping of the six foot sidewalks um, at the corner and I understand about the, the concerns around the buildable area. I'm wondering, um, this is really I guess a question for Mr. Petten, um, is, and you don't necessarily have to answer it now, I don't think you can answer it now, but if that is to occur, is there an opportunity to do something creative with that corner? from a, a traffic calming perspective or something that might kind of extend a safe pedestrian area while also kind of, I don't know, calming, mm -hmm. calming that intersection um, so that, you know, we're not necessarily losing um, place, safe places of, of refuge for people that might be walking. Yeah, certainly. I think that's something um, we can work. I'll, I'll have to probably follow up with CDOT and have some conversations then about what some of the options may be and what's being proposed to work with the petitioner and make sure that we can kind of bring all that together and keep that in mind as we're, we're going through it. So certainly we can explore that and, and give you some follow up on it. And if, and if we need to talk a little bit more about that. Sure. Um, there are some amenity spaces that I didn't point out that are actually adjacent to the sidewalk that are on the property side that are being offered. So some tree amenity spaces, uh, a fountain for people and pets, uh, patio space. So there are some amenities that are being offered as a trade. I'd like to, I'd like to maybe, you know, maybe we can sit down and talk offline. Yeah. About some yep. things. Ms. Johnson. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. Um, and to piggyback off what you were saying, is there an opportunity, um, Mr. Petten, for the city to assist the, the small business with the environmental cleanup? I don't, you know, I, I heard what you said about it being uh, the requirements there. Is that something from a um, environmental or ED? Uh, yeah, that's a that's a good question. I don't know the answer to that. I have to follow up with our ED staff and see if there's any kinds of programs or environmental staff. It may not be at the city level. They're, I'm sure they've explored some of the state and federal options for some of that as well. But I'll check to see if there's any local uh, opportunities for for any kind of cost sharing or, or uh, you know offset of some of those costs. I, I'm yeah, I'm just not sure off the top of my head if they exist or not. But we'll certainly follow up and ask. Yeah, I mean, if that's something you're, I don't know if that's something you'd be interested in. Yes, actually, there, um, there is a grant program that we've applied to and been accepted to, so right. that's yes. great. If there's more money, we'll certainly <laughs> <laughs> entertain that too. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, it's, a, it's an improvement to the community, and it uh, just seems like an opportunity for, you know, win, win, win situation. So I'll take a look at There is Thank a you. state grant uh, for uh, some of the difficult sites to develop. So is that the grant that you applied for? Uh, yes, it's the, the Brownfields. Yeah, uh, the, yeah, that's it. Brownfield. Yeah, that's through the state. Yeah, but if there's something, because this is cleaning up an area in the city, yeah. yeah, yeah. So it's there. an important corner in this community, so yeah, we'll certainly take a look and see if there's options. So. Thank you. Motion to close. Second. This motion has been made and probably second to close the public hearing. Any comment on it? Hearing none. All in favor, please raise your hand. Any opposed, raise your hand. Seeing none, that's unanimous to close the public hearing. We'll move on to item number 52, rezoning petition 2022-178 by Dickelson Almonte Abreu, 
um, located on approximately 1.39 acres on the northeast side of Brookshire Boulevard, west of Old Plank Road in Council District 2, Mr. Graham's District. The current zoning is I-1 Light Industrial and the proposed zoning is I-2 General Industrial Conditional. Staff recommends approval of this petition upon resolution of outstanding issues related to transportation. We do not have any speakers in opposition, so after staff's presentation, um, Mr. Tosco, you will have three minutes. Great. Uh, so this is 2022-178, acres off Brookshire Boulevard, just off Oakdale Road. Uh, it is currently zoned I-1. Proposed zoning is for I-2 conditional. Uh, the adopted place type is for manufacturing logistics, so that uh, zoning request would be consistent with the policy map. Uh, this is a, a conditional plan that's really just site conditions, so no site plan, just commitments to uh, restrict some uses and uh, have a, a commitment to the driveway access being located on the adjacent parcel, which I believe is under the same ownership. Uh, Mr. Tosco can, can confirm that. Uh, but it does state that the conditions that the site would be used for automotive sales, repair, parking, storage, storage and warehousing uh, for tractor uh, trucks and accompanying trailers. Uh, additionally, petitioner reserves the right to use the site for uh, uses allowed or permitted by right together with accessory uses in the I-2 zoning district. It would prohibit things like abattoirs, adult care centers, agricultural industries, adult establishments, airports, animal crematoriums, cemeteries, etc. cetera. Uh, so a lot of those I-2 uses that we consider uh, to be a little bit more on the, the concerning side have been uh, prohibited through the conditions proposed for this petition. So not a site plan, but again, just conditions that uh, would be applied to the site in regard to uses and access. Staff does recommend approval of this petition. We do have just some transportation items to, to work through and clean up. It is consistent with manufacturing, manufacturing and logistics place type. Um, with that, we'll uh, take any questions following uh, Mr. Tosco's presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Tosco. You have uh, three minutes. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem, members of the council, Nick Tosco with Pointer Sproul, and I do represent Mr. Dickelson and Amante Abreu. I think this is the first time I've spoken after 10 o'clock, so I'm going to be very brief uh, for you all. I just, I did want to share a little bit of background. Uh, Mr. Amante Abreu is an immigrant from uh, Dominican Republic. He came here in 2012 as a small business owner and uh, as a truck driver, and he purchased his property uh, to try to develop it and for the sole purpose of renting it out for um, trucks uh, to park and, and semi-trucks and tractor trailers. Um, the I-1 zoning that it's currently zoned for uh, allows for the truck repairs, but not for the truck parking. And so um, he is seeking the I-2 CD rezoning to allow for that. Um, we are aware of the outstanding, it's just one outstanding issue, um, and that is related to constructing a bus pad on the property, and we've agreed to, to uh, assist in that process. So all the outstanding issues are handled. There's been no opposition or any major concerns and it is consistent with the 2040 policy map and the 2040 comp plan. So um, we think this is a, a good uh, way to boost a small business owner and somebody that's uh, looking to uh, develop this parcel consistent with the rest of the corridor. So we're happy to answer any questions. Mr. Amante Abreu is here as well. Um, so thank you for your time and consideration. Mr. Graham. Well, th thank you for the presentation and um, it's helping us solve a problem. Uh, that were that's impacting our community. So, um, um, uh, yeah, I think this is a good proposal. Thank you. Any other questions, comments from council? Moved to close. Second. Second. And a motion to uh, made and properly second to close the public hearing. Any discussion of that motion? Seeing none. Hearing none. Uh, all in favor, please raise your hand. Any opposed? Seeing none. That is uh, unanimous. We will move on. Turn the meeting. Nope. We will have item number. <laughs> 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 no, they've been waiting all night. David almost ran away. Move on. Sign her up, 1005. <laughs> Item number 53, petition, rezoning petition 2022-194 by RC Ventures LLC, located on approximately 0.512 acres. I don't know how you get more approximate than that, 0.512 <laughs> acres. Um, located at the northeast intersection of Beatty's Ford Road and Gilbert Street, west of Newland Road and south of Interstate 85 in Council District 2, Mr. Graham's District. The current zoning is B1 Neighborhood Business. The proposed zoning is TODNC, Transit Oriented Development Neighborhood Center. Staff recommends approval of this petition. Um, we do not have any speakers in opposition, so after staff's presentation, um, Mr. Lindsay, you will have three minutes. 
All right, thank you. Our last petition this evening. Thank you for everybody for sticking with us. 2022-194.512 acres approximately uh, on Beatty's Ford Road and Gilbert Street. Uh, it is currently zoned B1. The proposed zoning is for TOD Neighborhood Center. Uh, the adopted place type on the policy map, you can see this uh, north of Gilbert Street. You, you have Neighborhood 2 south of that, uh, as well as on the other side of Beatty's Ford, you see a lot of the Neighborhood Center. The, the TOD NC District would be consistent with that Neighborhood Center place type. So really what we're looking at is a, an extension of that neighborhood center just a little bit north uh, on Gilbert Street along this portion here right in, along the Beatty's Ford Road frontage. Uh, this is in an area where you do have uh, future gold line and there is a stop I believe at Montana Drive that would literally be a stone's throw uh, from that intersection from this site. Uh, this petition, this site was part of a, a previous petition which was on the docket and withdrawn earlier this evening at 2019-007. Uh, that was, I believe, uh, for a, an EDE with a drive-through which uh, had uh, lots of concern from the community and, and I believe at, at the district rep at the time. So that petition has been formally withdrawn and we are now looking at a petition to, again, rezone this conventionally to TODNC. Uh, it is in consistent with that neighborhood two place type, but staff does feel the TODNC district, uh, given the neighborhood center around it and that uh, future uh, potential investment in the gold line would make some sense in this location, allow for some uh, redevelopment uh, on this parcel. So with that, we will turn it over to uh, the petitioner and we'll happy, be happy to answer any questions you may have following uh, anything they'd like to share this evening. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Lindsay. You have good to see you. You have three minutes. Thank you very much, uh, Mayor Pro Tem and uh, council members, uh, zoning committee members. Uh, my name is Anthony Lindsay. I represent uh, Steel Skin Realty. I'm the head of community development services for uh, a real estate firm. I have with me tonight the petitioners and the owners and investors in that property, um, RC Ventures, uh, Roger and Claudette Parham, who are making a major investment in the Beatty's Fort Road corridor, not only with this project, but also in other properties along the corridor. So we're excited to make sure that there's not gonna be a fast food restaurant on this site. Um, we're looking to bring uh, a project that will provide essential services to the community, hopefully create some jobs, and provide for small business expansion and growth. So we're looking forward to doing something that's going to be iconic to represent the former historic Dale Brook Center, which was in 1963, one of the first projects that was done on Beatty's Fort Road to provide access for commercial professionals to be able to provide services to the community. So we want to do something that's iconic that continues that legacy and represents the community. And so far, we've had very positive response from the community. We had a meeting on Saturday um, to uh, give them an opportunity to express their thoughts about what we're doing and what we're proposing. So we're being very positively received and we're working closely with the neighborhood to make sure that it's a success. So we would appreciate your support and uh, happy to answer any questions you might have. I have a series of questions. <laughs> no, a very good project, um, very good stakeholders for the Bayes Fort Road corridor. Uh, helps with the parking situation for lots that really need uh, development as well as parking. So I'm, I'm very excited to support this and willing to learn more. Thank you for spending the evening with us. We sure did. <laughs> yeah. We've got some cold pizza in the back of you. If you want some, but, uh, yeah, very good project. So are, are, we invi are we invited to the dining grand opening? Absolutely. Uh. <laughs> Absolutely. Motion closed the public hearing. So moved. Any uh, motions remain probably second. Any discussion here? None. All in favor, please raise your hand. Uh, any opposed? Yeah. Unanimous. There's been a motion to adjourn. Yeah, All favor. I want to stay. Uh, before we adjourn, I, I recognize Ms. Johnson. Okay, so I had a town hall scheduled this Saturday, and I just want anyone who was planning to come to know that it's postponed. So. Thank you, Ms. Johnson's Thank you. town hall is postponed. All in favor of adjourning the meeting, please raise your hand. Aye. Any opposed? It's unanimous. Yes. I'm opposed. Opposed. On the record. <laughs> I lose again. Thank <laughs> you.